Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cast of Characters Narrator Read by Irie Man 1, Station Master, Tailor, Peasant, and Guard Read by Algy Pug Chancellor Read by Beth Thomas Crowd, Chorus, and Woman Two, read by Elizabeth Clett. Bruno and Urchin, read by Francis Brown and Cheyenne Donnell. Man Two, Footman, Sentinel, and Father, read by Peter Tucker. Subwarden, Vice Warden, read by Andrew Coleman. Man in Livery, Baron, and Dog King. Read by Alan Wayman. Warden, Beggar, read by Brian Lawney. Sylvie and Lame Child, read by Amanda Friday. The Professor, read by Ernst Patanama and Bart. Arthur Forrester, read by Ben Lindsay Clark. Lady Muriel Orme, read by Melanie Smith. Subwarden's Wife and Woman One, Read by Capricia Page. Agag, Daxon, Girl One and Dolly. Read by Lucy Perry. Gardener. Read by Leonard Wilson. Crowd, Music Master, Head Growler, Chorus and Frogs. Read by Phil Benson. Earl. Read by Peter Yearsley. The Other Professor. Read by Lash Rolander. Voice One, Young Lady, and Girl Two, read by Libby Stevenson. Crowd, Chorus, and Woman Three, read by Christine G. Crowd, Servant, Girl Three, Housekeeper, and Mother, read by Ethel Boss. Eric Linden, read by Jesse Yun. End of Cast of Characters Preface one little picture in this book, The Magic Locket, at page 77, was drawn by Miss Alice Havers. I did not state this on the title page, since it seemed only due to the artist of all these, to my mind, wonderful pictures, that his name should stand there alone. The descriptions at pages 386 and 387 of Sunday, as spent by children of the last generation, are quoted verbatim from a speech made to me by a child friend, and a letter written to me by a lady friend. The chapters headed Fairy Sylvie and Bruno's Revenge are a reprint with a few alterations of a little fairy tale which I wrote in the year 1867 at the request of the late Mrs. Gatty for Aunt Judy's magazine, which she was then editing. It was in 1874, I believe, that the idea first occurred to me of making it the nucleus of a longer story. As the years went on, I jotted down at odd moments all sorts of odd ideas and fragments of dialogue that occurred to me, who knows how, with a transitory suddenness that left me no choice but either to record them then and there, or to abandon them to oblivion. Sometimes one could trace to their source these random flashes of thought, as being suggested by the book one was reading, or struck out from the flint of one's own mind by the steel of a friend's chance remark, but they had also a way of their own, of occurring, apropos of nothing, specimens of that hopelessly illogical phenomenon, an effect without a cause. Such, for example, was the last line of The Hunting of the Snark, which came into my head, as I have already related in the theatre for April 1887, quite suddenly, during a solitary walk. And such again have been passages which occurred in dreams, and which I cannot trace to any antecedent cause whatever. There are at least two instances of such dream suggestions in this book. One, my lady's remark, it often runs in families, just as a love for pastry does, at page 88, the other, Eric Linden's badinage about having been in domestic service, at page 332. 
and thus it came to pass that i found myself at last in possession of a huge unwieldy mass of literature if the reader will kindly excuse the spelling which only needed stringing together upon the thread of a consecutive story to constitute the book i hoped to write only the task at first seemed absolutely hopeless and gave me a far clearer idea than i ever had before of the meaning of the word chaos and i think it must have been ten years or more before i had succeeded in classifying these odds and ends sufficiently to see what sort of a story they indicated for the story had to grow out of the incidents not the incidents out of the story i am telling all this in no spirit of egoism but because i really believe that some of my readers will be interested in these details of the genesis of a book which looks so simple and straightforward a matter when completed that they might suppose it to have been written straight off page by page as one would write a letter beginning at the beginning and ending at the end it is no doubt possible to write a story in that way and if it be not vanity to say so i believe that i could myself if i were in the unfortunate position for i do hold it to be a real misfortune of being obliged to produce a given amount of fiction in a given time that i could fulfil my task and produce my tale of bricks as other slaves have done one thing at any rate i could guarantee as to the story so produced that it should be utterly commonplace should contain no new ideas whatever and should be very very weary reading this species of literature has received the very appropriate name of padding which might fitly be defined as that which all can write and none can read that the present volume contains no such writing i dare not avow sometimes in order to bring a picture into its proper place it has been necessary to eke out a page with two or three extra lines but i can honestly say i have put in no more than i was absolutely compelled to do my readers may perhaps like to amuse themselves by trying to detect in a given passage the one piece of padding it contains while arranging the slips into pages i found that the passage which now extends from the top of page thirty five to the middle of page thirty eight was three lines too short i supplied the deficiency not by interpolating a word here and a word there but by writing in three consecutive lines now can my readers guess which they are a harder puzzle if a harder be desired would be to determine as to the gardener's song in which cases if any the stanza was adapted to the surrounding text and in which if any the text was adapted to the stanza perhaps the hardest thing in all literature at least i have found it so by no voluntary effort can i accomplish it i have to take it as it comes is to write anything original and perhaps the easiest is when once an original line has been struck out to follow it up and to write any amount more to the same tune i did not know if alice in wonderland was an original story i was at least no conscious imitator in writing it but i do know that since it came out something like a dozen story-books have appeared on identically the same pattern the path i timidly explored believing myself to be the first ever that burst into that silent sea is now a beaten high road all the wayside flowers have long ago been trampled into the dust and it would be courting disaster for me to attempt that style again hence it is that in sylvie and bruno i have striven with i know not what success to strike out yet another new path be it bad or good it is the best i can do it is written not for money and not for fame but in the hope of supplying for the children whom i love some thoughts that may suit those hours of innocent merriment which are the very life of childhood and also in the hope of suggesting to them and to others some thoughts that may prove i would fain hope not wholly out of harmony with the graver cadences of life if i have not already exhausted the patience of my readers i would like to seize this opportunity perhaps the last i shall have of addressing so many friends at once of putting on record some ideas that have occurred to me 
as to books desirable to be written, which I should much like to attempt, but may not ever have the time or power to carry through, in the hope that if I should fail, and the years are gliding away very fast, to finish the task I have set myself, other hands may take it up. First, a child's Bible. The only real essentials of this would be carefully selected passages suitable for a child's reading and pictures. One principle of selection which I would adopt would be that religion should be put before a child as a revelation of love, no need to pain and puzzle the young mind with the history of crime and punishment. On such a principle I should, for example, omit the history of the flood. The supplying of the pictures would involve no great difficulty, no new ones would be needed, hundreds of excellent pictures already exist, the copyright of which has long ago expired, and which simply need photozincography or some similar process for their successful reproduction. The book should be handy in size, with a pretty attractive-looking cover, in a clear legible type, and above all with abundance of pictures, pictures, pictures. Secondly, a book of pieces selected from the Bible, not single texts, but passages of from ten to twenty verses each, to be committed to memory. Such passages would be found useful to repeat to oneself and to ponder over on many occasions when reading is difficult if not impossible. For instance, when lying awake at night, on a railway journey, when taking a solitary walk in old age, when eyesight is failing or wholly lost, and best of all when illness, while incapacitating us for reading or any other occupation, condemns us to lie awake through many weary silent hours. At such a time how keenly one may realize the truth of David's rapturous cry, O oh, how sweet are thy words unto my throat, yea, sweeter than honey unto my mouth. I have said passages rather than single texts, because we have no means of recalling single texts. Memory needs links, and here are none. One may have a hundred texts stored in the memory, and not be able to recall at will more than half a dozen, and those by mere chance. Whereas once get hold of any portion of a chapter that has been committed to memory, and the whole can be recovered, all hangs together." Thirdly, a collection of passages, both prose and verse, from books other than the Bible. There is not, perhaps, much in what is called uninspired literature. A misnomer I hold, if Shakespeare was not inspired, one may well doubt if any man ever was. That will bear the process of being pondered over a hundred times. Still, there are such passages enough, I think, to make a goodly store for the memory— these two books of sacred and secular passages for memory will serve other good purposes besides merely occupying vacant hours. They will help to keep at bay many anxious thoughts, worrying thoughts, uncharitable thoughts, unholy thoughts. Let me say this in better words than my own. By copying a passage from that most interesting book, Robertson's Lectures on the Epistles to the Corinthians, Lecture 49. If a man finds himself haunted by evil desires and unholy images, which will generally be at periodical hours, let him commit to memory passages of scripture, or passages from the best writers in verse or prose. Let him store his mind with these, as safeguards to repeat when he lies awake in some restless night, or when despairing imaginations or gloomy suicidal thoughts beset him. Let these be to him the sword, turning everywhere to keep the way of the garden of life from the intrusion of profaner footsteps. Fourthly, a Shakespeare for girls, that is, an edition in which everything not suitable for the perusal of girls of, say, from ten to seventeen should be omitted. Few children under ten would be likely to understand or enjoy the greatest of poets, and those who have passed out of girlhood may safely be left to read Shakespeare in any edition, expurgated or not, that they may prefer, but it seems a pity that so many children in the intermediate stage should be debarred from a great pleasure for want of an edition suitable to them. Neither Bowdler's, Chambers's, Brandrum's, nor Cundell's boudoir Shakespeare seems to me to meet the want. They are not sufficiently expurgated. 
Bowdler's is the most extraordinary of all. Looking through it, I am filled with a deep sense of wonder, considering what he has left in, that he should have cut anything out. Besides relentlessly erasing all that is unsuitable on the score of reverency or decency, I should be inclined to omit also all that seems too difficult or not likely to interest young readers. The resulting book might be slightly fragmentary, but it would be a real treasure to all British maidens who have any taste for poetry. If it be needful to apologize to any one for the new departure I have taken in this story, by introducing, along with what will, I hope, prove to be acceptable nonsense for children, some of the graver thoughts of human life, it must be to one who has learned the art of keeping such thoughts wholly at a distance, in hours of mirth and careless ease. To him such a mixture will seem no doubt ill-judged and repulsive. And that such an art exists I do not dispute. With youth, good health, and sufficient money, it seems quite possible to lead for years together a life of unmixed gaiety, with the exception of one solemn fact with which we are liable to be confronted at any moment, even in the midst of the most brilliant company or the most sparkling entertainment. A man may fix his own times for admitting serious thought, for attending public worship, for prayer, for reading the Bible— all such matters he can defer to that convenient season, which is so apt never to occur at all. But he cannot defer for one single moment the necessity of attending to a message which may come before he has finished reading this page. This night shalt thy soul be required of thee. The ever-present sense of this grim possibility has been in all ages. Note. At the moment when I had written these words there was a knock at the door, and a telegram was brought me announcing the sudden death of a dear friend, an incubus that men have striven to shake off. Few more interesting subjects of inquiry could be found by a student of history than the various weapons that have been used against this shadowy foe. Saddest of all must have been the thoughts of those who saw indeed an existence beyond the grave, but an existence far more terrible than annihilation, an existence as filmy, impalpable, all but invisible spectres drifting about through endless ages in a world of shadows, with nothing to do, nothing to hope for, nothing to love. In the midst of the gay verses of that genial bon vivant Horace, there stands one dreary word whose utter sadness goes to one's heart. It is the word exilium in the well-known passage. Omnes eodem cogimur omnium, versatur unura sirius ocius, sors exitura et nos in aeternum, exilium impositura simbei. Yes, to him, this present life, spite of all its weariness and all its sorrow, was the only life worth having, all else was exile. Does it not seem almost incredible that one holding such a creed should ever have smiled? And many in this day, I fear, even though believing in an existence beyond the grave, far more real than Horace ever dreamed of, yet regard it as a sort of exile from all the joys of life, and so adopt Horace's theory and say, Let us eat and drink, for to-morrow we die. We go to entertainments such as the theatre. I say we, for I also go to the play whenever I get a chance of seeing a really good one, and keep at arm's length, if possible, the thought that we may not return alive. Yet how do you know, dear friend, whose patience has carried you through this garrulous preface, that it may not be your lot, when mirth is fastest and most furious, to feel the sharp pang or the deadly faintness which heralds the final crisis? to see with vague wonder anxious friends bending over you, to hear their troubled whispers perhaps yourself to shape the question with trembling lips, is it serious, and to be told, yes, the end is near, and oh, how different all life will look when those words are said. How do you know, I say, that all this may not happen to you this night? And dare you, knowing this, say to yourself, well, perhaps it is an immoral play. Perhaps the situations are a little too risky, the dialogue a little too strong, 
the business a little too suggestive. I don't say that conscience is quite easy, but the piece is so clever. I must see it this once. I'll begin a stricter life tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Who sins in hope, who sinning says, sorrow for sin God's judgment stays. Against God's spirit he lies, quite stops mercy with insult, dares and drops like a scorched fly that spins in vain upon the access of its pain, then takes its doom to limp and crawl, blind and forgot, from fall to fall. Let me pause for a moment to say that I believe this thought, of the possibility of death, if calmly realized and steadily faced, would be one of the best possible tests as to our going to any scene of amusement being right or wrong. If the thought of sudden death acquires for you a special horror when imagined as happening in a theatre, then be very sure the theatre is harmful for you, however harmless it may be for others, and that you are incurring a deadly peril in going. Be sure the safest rule is that we should not dare to live in any scene in which we dare not die. But once realize what the true object is in life, that it is not pleasure, not knowledge, not even fame itself, that last infirmity of noble minds, but that it is the development of character, the rising to a higher, nobler, purer standard, the building up of the perfect man, and then, so long as we feel that this is going on, and will, we trust, go on for evermore, death has for us no terror. It is not a shadow, but a light, not an end, but a beginning." One other matter may perhaps seem to call for apology, that I should have treated with such entire want of sympathy the British passion for sport, which no doubt has been in bygone days, and is still in some forms of it, an excellent school for hardihood and for coolness in moments of danger. But I am not entirely without sympathy for genuine sport. I can heartily admire the courage of the man who, with severe bodily toil and at the risk of his life, hunts down some man-eating tiger, and I can heartily sympathize with him when he exults in the glorious excitement of the chase and the hand-to-hand -hand struggle with the monster brought to bay. But I can but look with deep wonder and sorrow on the hunter who, at his ease and in safety, can find pleasure in what involves for some defenceless creature wild terror and a death of agony. Deeper, if the hunter be one who has pledged himself to preach to men the religion of universal love, deepest of all, if it be one of those tender and delicate beings whose very name serves as a symbol of love, thy love to me was wonderful passing the love of women whose mission here is surely to help and comfort all that are in pain or sorrow farewell farewell but this i tell to thee thou wedding guest he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast he prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small for the dear god who loveth us he made and loveth all End of Preface Chapter One of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One Less Bread, More Taxes. And then all the people cheered again, and one man, who was more excited than the rest, flung his hat high into the air, and shouted, as well as I could make out, Hurrah for the sub-warden! Everybody roared, but whether it was for the sub-warden or not, did not clearly appear. Some were shouting bread, and some taxes, but no one seemed to know what it was they really wanted. All this I saw from the open window of the warden's breakfast saloon, looking across the shoulder of the Lord Chancellor, who had sprung to his feet the moment the shouting began, almost as if he had been expecting it, and had rushed to the window which commanded the best view of the marketplace. "'What can it all mean?' he kept repeating to himself, as, with his hands clasped behind him, and his gown floating in the air, he paced rapidly up and down the room. "'I never heard such shouting before. 
and at this time of the morning too, and with such unanimity. Doesn't it strike you as very remarkable? I represented modestly that to my ears it appeared that they were shouting for different things, but the Chancellor would not listen to my suggestion for a moment. They all shout the same words, I assure you, he said. Then, leaning well out of the window, he whispered to a man who was standing close underneath. Keep them together, can't you? The warden will be here directly. Give him the signal for the march-up. All this was evidently not meant for my ears, but I could scarcely help hearing it, considering that my chin was almost on the Chancellor's shoulder. The march-up was a very curious sight. A straggling procession of men, marching two and two, began from the other side of the marketplace, and advanced in an irregular zigzag fashion toward the palace, wildly tacking from side to side like a sailing vessel making way against an unfavorable wind, so that the head of the procession was often farther from us at the end of one tack than it had been at the end of the previous one. Yet it was evident that all was being done under orders— for I noticed that all eyes were fixed on the man who stood just under the window, and to whom the Chancellor was continually whispering. This man held his hat in one hand, and a little green flag in the other. Whenever he waved the flag, the procession advanced a little nearer. When he dipped it, they sidled a little farther off. And whenever he waved his hat, they all raised a hoarse cheer. "'Hurrah!' They cried, carefully keeping time with the hat as it bobbed up and down. Hurrah! New constitution! Less bread! More taxes! That'll do, that'll do, the Chancellor whispered. Let him rest a bit till I give you the word. He's not here yet. But at this moment the great folding doors of the saloon were flung open, and he turned with a guilty start to receive his High Excellency— However, it was only Bruno, and the Chancellor gave a little gasp of relieved anxiety. "'Morning,' said the little fellow, addressing the remark in a general sort of way to the Chancellor and the waiters. "'Does you know where Sylvie is? Always looking for Sylvie.' "'She's with the warden, I believe, Your Aunt's. the Chancellor replied with a low bow. There was, no doubt, a certain amount of absurdity in applying this title— which, as of course you see without my telling you, was nothing but your royal highness condensed into one syllable, to a small creature whose father was merely the warden of Outland. Still, a large excuse must be made for a man who had passed several years at the court of Fairyland, and had there acquired the almost impossible art of pronouncing five syllables as one. But the bow was lost upon Bruno, who had run out of the room even while the great feat of the unpronounceable monosyllable was being triumphantly performed. Just then a single voice in the distance was understood to shout, A speech from the Chancellor. Certainly, my friends, the Chancellor replied with extraordinary promptitude. You shall have a speech. Here one of the waiters, who had been for some minutes busy making a queer-looking mixture of egg and sherry, respectfully presented it on a large silver salver. The Chancellor took it haughtily, drank it off thoughtfully, smiled benevolently on the happy waiter as he set down the empty glass, and began. To the best of my recollection, this is what he said. Ahem, ahem, fellow sufferers, or rather suffering fellows, "'Don't call em names,' muttered the man under the window. "'I didn't say felons,' the Chancellor explained. "'You may be sure that I always simper—' "'Ear, ear!' shouted the crowd so loudly as quite to drown the orator's thin, squeaky voice. "'That I always simper,' he repeated. "'Don't simper quite so much,' said the man under the window. "'It makes you look like a idiot.' And all this time ear, ear. went rumbling round the marketplace like a peal of thunder. That I always sympathize, yelled the Chancellor the first moment there was silence. But your true friend is the sub warden. Day and night he is brooding on your wrongs, I should say your rights. That is to say your wrongs. No, I mean your rights. Don't talk no more, growled the man under the window. You're making a mess of it. At this moment the sub warden entered the saloon. He was a thin man with a mean and crafty face and a greenish-yellow complexion, and he crossed the room very slowly, looking suspiciously about him, as if he thought there might be a savage dog hidden somewhere. 
bravo he cried patting the chancellor on the back you did that speech very well indeed why you're a born orator man oh that's nothing the chancellor replied modestly with downcast eyes most orators are born you know the sub-warden thoughtfully rubbed his chin why so they are he admitted i never considered it in that light still you did it very well a word in your ear the rest of their conversation was all in whispers so as i could hear no more i thought i would go and find bruno i found the little fellow standing in the passage and being addressed by one of the men in livery who stood before him nearly bent double from extreme respectfulness with his hands hanging in front of him like the fins of a fish his high excellency this respectful man was saying is in his study you ain't he didn't pronounce this quite so well as the chancellor thither bruno trotted and i thought it well to follow him the warden a tall dignified man with a grave but very pleasant face was seated before a writing-table which was covered with papers and holding on his knee one of the sweetest and loveliest little maidens it has ever been my lot to see she looked four or five years older than bruno but she had the same rosy cheeks and sparkling eyes and the same wealth of curly brown hair her eager smiling face was turned upward toward her father's and it was a pretty sight to see the mutual love with which the two faces one in the spring of life the other in its late autumn were gazing on each other no you've never seen him the old man was saying you couldn't you know he's been away so long travelling from land to land and seeking for health more years than you've been alive little sylvie here bruno climbed upon his other knee and a good deal of kissing on a rather complicated system was the result he only came back last night said the warden when the kissing was over he's been travelling post haste for the last thousand miles or so in order to be here on sylvie's birthday but he's a very early riser and i dare say he's in the library already come with me and see him he's always kind to children you'll be sure to like him has the other professor come too bruno asked in an awe-struck voice yes they arrived together the other professor is well you won't like him quite so much perhaps he's a little more dreamy you know i wish sylvie was a little more dreamy said bruno what do you mean bruno said sylvie bruno went on addressing his father she says she can't you know but i think it isn't can't it's won't says she can't dream the puzzled warden repeated she do say it bruno persisted when i says to her let's stop lessons she says oh i can't dream of letting you stop yet he always wants to stop lessons sylvie explained five minutes after we begin five minutes lessons a day said the warden you won't learn much at that rate little man that's just what sylvie says bruno rejoined she says i won't learn my lessons and noise tell her over and over i can't learn em and what does you think she says she says it isn't can't it won't let's go see the professor the warden said wisely avoiding further discussion the children got down off his knees each secured a hand and the happy trio set off for the library followed by me i had come to the conclusion by this time that none of the party except for a few moments the lord chancellor was in the least able to see me what's the matter with him sylvie asked walking with a little extra sedateness by way of example to bruno at the other side who never ceased jumping up and down what was the matter but i hope it's all right now was it lumbago and rheumatism and that kind of thing he's been curing himself you know he's a very learned doctor why he's actually invented three new diseases besides a new way of breaking your collarbone is it a nice way said bruno well not very the warden said as we entered the library and here is the professor good morning professor hope you're quite rested after your journey a jolly-looking fat little man in a flowery dressing-gown with a large book under each arm came trotting in at the other end of the room and was going straight across without taking any notice of the children i'm looking for volume three he said do you happen to have seen it you don't see my children professor the warden exclaimed taking him by the shoulders and turning him round to face them 
the professor laughed violently then he gazed at them through his great spectacles for a minute or two without speaking at last he addressed bruno i hope you have had a good night my child bruno looked puzzled always had the same night you've had he replied there's only been one night since yesterday it was the professor's turn to look puzzled now he took off his spectacles and rubbed them with his handkerchief then he gazed at them again then he turned to the warden are they bound he inquired no we aren't said bruno who thought himself quite able to answer this question the professor shook his head sadly not even half bound why should we be half bound said bruno we are not prisoners but the professor had forgotten all about them by this time and was speaking to the warden again you'll be glad to hear he was saying that the barometer's beginning to move well which way said the warden adding to the children not that i care you know only he thinks it affects the weather he's a wonderfully clever man you know sometimes he says things that only the other professor can understand sometimes he says things that nobody can understand which way is it professor up or down neither said the professor gently clapping his hands it's going sideways if i may so express myself and what kind of weather does that produce said the warden listen children now you'll hear something worth knowing horizontal weather said the professor and made straight for the door very nearly trampling on bruno who had only just time to get out of his way isn't he learned the warden said looking after him with admiring eyes positively he runs over with learning but he needn't run over me said bruno the professor was back in a moment he had changed his dressing-gown for a frock coat and had put on a pair of very strange-looking boots the tops of which were open umbrellas i thought you'd like to see them he said these are the boots for horizontal weather but what's the use of wearing umbrellas round one's knees in ordinary rain the professor admitted they would not be of much use but if ever it rained horizontally you know they would be invaluable simply invaluable take the professor to the breakfast saloon children said the warden and tell them not to wait for me i've had breakfast early as i've some business to attend to the children seized the professor's hands as familiarly as if they had known him for years and hurried him away i followed respectfully behind end of chapter one chapter two of sylvie and bruno by lewis carroll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter two l'ami inconnu as we entered the breakfast saloon the professor was saying and he had breakfast by himself early so he begged you wouldn't wait for him my lady this way my lady he added this way and then with as it seemed to me most superfluous politeness he flung open the door of my compartment and ushered in a young and lovely lady i muttered to myself with some bitterness and this is of course the opening scenes of volume one she is the heroine and i am one of those subordinate characters that only turn up when needed for the development of her destiny and whose final appearance is outside the church waiting to greet the happy pair yes my lady change it feefield were the next words i heard oh that too obsequious guard next station but one and the door closed and the lady settled down into her corner and the monotonous throb of the engine making one feel as if the train were some gigantic monster whose very circulation we could feel proclaimed that we were once more speeding on our way the lady had a perfectly formed nose i caught myself saying to myself hazel eyes and lips and here it occurred to me that to see for myself what the lady was really like would be more satisfactory than much speculation 
I looked round cautiously, and was entirely disappointed of my hope. The veil which shrouded her whole face was too thick for me to see more than the glitter of bright eyes and the hazy outline of what might be a lovely oval face, but might also, unfortunately, be an equally unlovely one. I closed my eyes again, saying to myself, "'Couldn't have a better chance for an experiment in telepathy. I'll think out her face, and afterwards test the portrait with the original.' At first no result at all crowned my efforts, though I divided my swift mind, now hither, now thither, in a way that I felt sure would have made Aeneas green with envy. But the dimly seen oval remained as provokingly blank as ever, a mere ellipse as if in some mathematical diagram, without even the foci that might be made to do duty as a nose and a mouth." Gradually, however, the conviction came upon me that I could, by a certain concentration of thought, think the veil away, and so get a glimpse of the mysterious face, as to which the two questions, is she pretty, and is she plain, still hung suspended in my mind, in beautiful equipoise. Success was partial and fitful, still there was a result. Ever and anon the veil seemed to vanish, in a sudden flash of light. But before I could fully realize the face, all was dark again. In each such glimpse the face seemed to grow more childish and more innocent, and when I had at last thought the veil entirely away, it was unmistakably the sweet face of little Sylvie. So, either I've been dreaming about Sylvie, I said to myself, and this is the reality, or else I've really been with Sylvie, and this is a dream. Is life itself a dream, I wonder? To occupy the time, I got out the letter which had caused me to take this sudden railway journey from my London home down to a strange fishing town on the north coast, and read it over again. Dear old friend, I'm sure it will be as great a pleasure to me as it can possibly be to you, to meet once more after so many years— and of course I shall be ready to give you all the benefit of such medical skill as I have. Only, you know, one mustn't violate professional etiquette. And you are already in the hands of a first-rate London doctor with whom it would be utter affectation for me to pretend to compete. I make no doubt he is right in saying the heart is affected. All your symptoms point that way. One thing at any rate... I have already done in my doctorial capacity secured you a bedroom on the ground floor so that you will not need to ascend the stairs at all. I shall expect you by last train on Friday, in accordance with your letter, and till then I shall say, in the words of the old song, Oh, for Friday nicht, Friday's lang a come in. Yours always, Arthur Forrester. P.S. Do you believe in fate? This postscript puzzled me sorely. He is far too sensible a man, I thought, to have become a fatalist, and yet what else can he mean by it? And as I folded up the letter and put it away, I inadvertently repeated the words aloud, Do you believe in fate? The fair incognita turned her head quickly at the sudden question. No, I don't, she said with a smile. Do you? I, I didn't mean to ask the question. I stammered, a little taken aback at having begun a conversation in so unconventional a fashion. The lady's smile became a laugh, not a mocking laugh, but the laugh of a happy child who was perfectly at her ease. Didn't you? she said. Then it was a case of what you doctors call unconscious cerebration. I am no doctor, I replied. Do I look like one, or what makes you think it? She pointed to the book I had been reading, which was so lying that its title, Diseases of the Heart, was plainly visible. "'One needn't be a doctor,' I said, "'to take an interest in medical books. There's another class of readers who are yet more deeply interested.' "'You mean the patients?' she interrupted, while a look of tender pity gave new sweetness to her face. "'But—' With an evident wish to avoid a possibly painful topic— one needn't be either to take an interest in books of science which contain the greatest amount of science do you think the books 
or the mines rather a profound question for a lady i said to myself holding with the conceit so natural to man that woman's intellect is essentially shallow and i considered a minute before replying if you mean living minds i don't think it's possible to decide there is so much written science that no living person has ever read and there is so much thought-out science that hasn't yet been written but if you mean the whole human race then i think the minds have it everything recorded in books must have once been in some mind you know isn't that rather like one of the rules in algebra my lady inquired algebra too i thought with increasing wonder i mean if we consider thoughts as factors may we not say that the least common multiple of all the minds contains that of all the books but not the other way certainly we may i replied delighted with the illustration and what a grand thing it would be i went on dreamily thinking aloud rather than talking if we could only apply that rule to books you know in finding the least common multiple we strike out a quantity wherever it occurs except in the term where it is raised to its highest power so we should have to erase every recorded thought except in the sentence where it is expressed with the greatest intensity my lady laughed merrily <laughs> some books would be reduced to blank paper i'm afraid she said they would most libraries would be terribly diminished in bulk but just think what they would gain in quality when will it be done she eagerly asked if there's any chance of it in my time i think i'll leave off reading and wait for it well perhaps in another thousand years or so then there's no use in waiting said my lady let's sit down ugog my pet come and sit by me anywhere but by me growled the sub-warden the little wretch always manages to upset his coffee i guessed at once as perhaps the reader will also have guessed if like myself he is very clever at drawing conclusions that my lady was the sub-warden's wife and that ugug a hideously fat boy about the same age as sylvie with the expression of a prize pig was their son sylvie and bruno with the lord chancellor made up a party of seven and you actually got a plunge bath every morning said the sub-warden seemingly in continuation of a conversation with the professor even at the little roadside inns oh certainly certainly the professor replied with a smile on his jolly face allow me to explain it is in fact a very simple problem in hydrodynamics that means a combination of water and strength if we take a plunge bath and a man of great strength such as myself about to plunge into it we have a perfect example of this science i am bound to admit the professor continued in a lower tone and with downcast eyes that we need a man of remarkable strength he must be able to spring from the floor to about twice his own height gradually turning over as he rises so as to come down again head first why you need a flea not a man exclaimed the sub-warden pardon me said the professor this a particular kind of bath is not adapted for a flea let us suppose he continued folding his table napkin into a graceful festoon that this represents what is perhaps the necessity of this age the active tourist's portable bath you may describe it briefly if you like looking at the chancellor by the letters a t p b the chancellor much disconcerted at finding everybody looking at him could only murmur in a shy whisper precisely so one great advantage of this plunge bath continued the professor is that it requires only half a gallon of water i don't call it a plunge bath his sub excellency remarked unless your active tourist goes right under but he does go right under the old man gently replied the a t hangs up the p b on a nail thus he then empties the water jug into it places the empty jug below the bag leaps into the air descends head first into the bag the water rises round him to the top of the bag and there you are he triumphantly concluded 
the A.T. is as much under water as if he'd gone a mile or two down into the Atlantic. And he's drowned, let us say, in about four minutes. By no means, the professor answered with a proud smile. After about a minute, he quietly turns the tap at the lower end of the P.B. All the water runs back into the jug, and there you are again. But how in the world is he to get out of the bag again? That, I take it, said the professor, is the most beautiful part of the whole invention. All the way up the P.B., inside, are loops for the thumbs. So it's something like going upstairs, only perhaps less comfortable. And by the time the A.T. has risen out of the bag, all but his head, he's sure to topple over one way or the other. The law of gravity secures that. And there he is on the floor again. A little bruised, perhaps. Oh, well, yes, a little bruised. But having had this plunge bath, that's the great thing. Wonderful. It's almost beyond belief, murmured the sub-warden. The professor took it as a compliment and bowed with a gratified smile. Quite beyond belief, my lady added. Meaning, no doubt, to be more complimentary still, the professor bowed, but he didn't smile this time. I can assure you, he said earnestly, that, provided the bath was made, I used it every morning. I certainly ordered it, that I am clear about. My only doubt is whether the man ever finished making it. It's difficult to remember after so many years. At this moment the door, very slowly and creakingly, began to open, and Sylvie and Bruno jumped up and ran to meet the well-known footstep. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 Birthday Presents it's my brother, the sub-warden exclaimed in a warning whisper. Speak out and be quick about it. The appeal was evidently addressed to the Lord Chancellor, who instantly replied in a shrill monotone, like a little boy repeating the alphabet. As I was remarking, your sub-excellency, this portentous movement— You began too soon, the other interrupted, scarcely able to restrain himself to a whisper, so great was his excitement. He couldn't have heard you. Begin again. As I was remarking, chanted the obedient Lord Chancellor, this portentous movement has already assumed the dimensions of a revolution. And what are the dimensions of a revolution? The voice was genial and mellow, and the face of the tall, dignified old man who had just entered the room, leading Sylvie by the hand, and with Bruno riding triumphantly on his shoulder, was too noble and gentle to have scared a less guilty man. But the Lord Chancellor turned pale instantly, and could hardly articulate the words, The dimensions, your, your High Excellency? I, I scarcely comprehend. Well, the length, breadth, and thickness, if you like it better. And the old man smiled half contemptuously. The Lord Chancellor recovered himself with a great effort, and pointed to the open window. If your High Excellency will listen for a moment to the shouts of the exasperated populace, of the exasperated populace, the sub-warden repeated in a louder tone, as the Lord Chancellor, being in a state of abject terror, had dropped almost into a whisper. You will understand what it is they want. And at that moment there surged into the room a hoarse, confused cry, in which the only clearly audible words were, Less bread, more taxes! The old man laughed heartily. What in the world? He was beginning, but the Chancellor heard him not. Some mistake. He muttered, hurrying to the window, from which he shortly returned with an air of relief. Now listen. He exclaimed, holding up his hand impressively, and now the words came quite distinctly and with the regularity of the ticking of a clock. More bread, less taxes. More bread? The warden repeated in astonishment. Why, the new government bakery was opened only last week, and I gave orders to sell the bread at cost price during the present scarcity. What can they expect more? The bakery's closed, your eyes. The Chancellor said more loudly and clearly than he had spoken yet. He was emboldened by the consciousness that here, at least, he had evidence to produce, 
and he placed in the warden's hands a few printed notices that were lying ready with some open ledgers on a side table. Yes, yes, I see, the warden muttered, glancing carelessly through them. Order countermanded by my brother, and supposed to be my doing. Rather sharp practice. It's all right, he added in a louder tone. My name is signed to it, so I take it on myself. But what do they mean by less taxes? How can they be less? I abolished the last of them a month ago. It's been put on again, your aunts, and by your aunts' own orders. And other printed notices were submitted for inspection. The warden, whilst looking them over, glanced once or twice at the sub-warden, who had seated himself before one of the open ledgers, and was quite absorbed in adding it up, but he merely repeated, It's all right. I accept it as my doing. And they do say, the Chancellor went on sheepishly, looking much more like a convicted thief than an officer of state, that a change of government by the abolition of the sub-warden, I mean, he hastily added on seeing the warden's look of astonishment, the abolition of the office of sub-warden, and giving the present holder the right to act as vice-warden whenever the warden is absent, would appease all this seedling discontent, I mean, he added, glancing at a paper he held in his hand, all this seething discontent. For fifteen years, put in a deep but very harsh voice, my husband has been acting as sub-warden. It is too long. It is much too long. My lady was a vast creature at all times, but when she frowned and folded her arms as now, she looked more gigantic than ever and made one try to fancy what a haystack would look like if out of temper. He would distinguish himself as vice, my lady proceeded, being far too stupid to see the double meaning of her words. There has been no such vice in Outland for many a long year, as he would be. What course would you suggest, sister? The warden mildly inquired. My lady stamped, which was undignified, and snorted, which was ungraceful. This is no jesting matter, she bellowed. I will consult my brother, said the warden. Brother. And seven makes a hundred and ninety-four, which is sixteen and tuppence. The sub-warden replied. Put down two and carry sixteen. The chancellor raised his hands and eyebrows, lost in admiration. Such a man of business, he murmured. Brother, could I have a word with you in my study? The warden said in a louder tone. The sub-warden rose with alacrity, and the two left the room together. My lady turned to the professor, who had uncovered the urn and was taking its temperature with his pocket thermometer. Professor! She began so loudly and suddenly that even Ogog, who had gone to sleep in his chair, left off snoring and opened one eye. The professor pocketed his thermometer in a moment, clasped his hands, and put his head on one side with a meek smile. You were teaching my son before breakfast, I believe, my lady loftily remarked. I hope he strikes you as having talent. Oh, very much so indeed, my lady, the professor hastily replied, unconsciously rubbing his ear, while some painful recollection seemed to cross his mind. I was very forcibly struck by his magnificence, I assure you. He is a charming boy, my lady exclaimed. Even his snores are more musical than those of other boys. If that were so, the professor seemed to think, the snores of other boys must be something too awful to be endured. But he was a cautious man, and he said nothing. And he's so clever, my lady continued. No one will enjoy your lecture more, by the way. Have you fixed the time for it yet? You've never given one, you know. And it was promised years ago before you— Yes, yes, my lady, I know. Perhaps next Tuesday or Tuesday week? That will do very well, said my lady, graciously. Of course, you will let the other professor lecture as well. I think not, my lady, the professor said with some hesitation. You see, he always stands with his back to the audience. It does very well for reciting, but for lecturing— You are quite right, said my lady. And now I come to think of it, there would hardly be time for more than one lecture, and it will go off all the better, if we begin with a banquet and a fancy dress ball. It will indeed, the professor cried with enthusiasm. I shall come as a grasshopper, my lady calmly proceeded. 
The professor smiled feebly. I shall come as... as early as I can, my lady. You mustn't come in before the doors are opened, said my lady. I can't, said the professor. Excuse me a moment. As this is Lady Sylvie's birthday, I would like to... And he rushed away. Bruno began feeling in his pockets, looking more and more melancholy as he did so. Then he put his thumb in his mouth and considered for a minute. Then he quietly left the room. He had hardly done so before the professor was back again, quite out of breath. Wishing you many happy returns of the day, my dear child. He went on, addressing the smiling little girl who had run to meet him. Allow me to give you a birthday present. It's a second-hand pincushion, my dear, and it only costs fourpence halfpenny. Thank you. It's very pretty. And Sylvie rewarded the old man with a hearty kiss. And the pins they gave me for nothing. The professor added in high glee. Fifteen of them, and only one bent. I'll make the bent one into a hook, said Sylvie, to catch Bruno with when he runs away from his lessons. You can't guess what my present is said Ugug, who had taken the butter-dish from the table and was standing behind her with a wicked leer on his face. "'No, I can't guess,' Sylvie said, without looking up. She was still examining the professor's pincushion. "'Is this?' <laughs> cried the bad boy, exultingly as he emptied the dish over her, and then, with a grin of delight at his own cleverness, looked round for applause. Sylvie coloured crimson as she shook off the butter from her frock, but she kept her lips tight shut and walked away to the window where she stood looking out and trying to recover her temper. Ogog's triumph was a very short one. The sub-warden had returned just in time to be a witness of his dear child's playfulness, and in another moment a skilfully applied box on the ear had changed the grin of delight into a howl of pain. "'My darling!' cried his mother, enfolding him in her fat arms. Did they box his ears for nothing? A precious pet. It's not for nothing, growled the angry father. Are you aware, madam, that I pay the house bills out of a fixed annual sum? The loss of all that wasted butter falls on me. Do you hear, madam? Hold your tongue, sir. My lady spoke very quietly, almost in a whisper, but there was something in her look which silenced him. Don't you see it was only a joke, and a very clever one, too? He only meant that he loved nobody but her. And instead of being pleased with the compliment, the spiteful little thing has gone away in a huff. The sub-warden was a very good hand at changing a subject. He walked across to the window. My dear, he said, is that a pig that I see down below? "'Rooting about among your flower-beds?' "'A pig!' shrieked my lady, rushing madly to the window and almost pushing her husband out in her anxiety to see for herself. "'Whose pig is it? How did it get in? Where's that crazy gardener gone?' At this moment Bruno re-entered the room, and passing Ogog, who was blubbering his loudest in the hope of attracting notice, as if he was quite used to that sort of thing, he ran up to Sylvie and threw his arms around her. I went to my toy cupboard, he said with a very sorrowful face, to see if there was something fit for a present for you. And there isn't nothing. They is all broken, every one. And I haven't got no money left to buy you a birthday present. And I can't give you nothing but this. This was a very earnest hug and a kiss. Oh, thank you, darling, cried Sylvie. I like your present best of all. But if so, why did she give it back so quickly? His sub-excellency turned and patted the two children on the head with his long, lean hands. Go away, dears, he said. There's business to talk over. Sylvie and Bruno went away hand in hand, but on reaching the door, Sylvie came back again and went up to Ugug timidly. I don't mind about the butter, she said. And I, I'm sorry he hurt you and she tried to shake hands with the little ruffian, but Ugug only blubbered louder and wouldn't make friends. Sylvie left the room with a sigh. The sub-warden glared angrily at his weeping son. "'Leave the room, sirrah," he said as loud as he dared. His wife was still leaning out of the window and kept repeating, "'I can't see that pig. Where is it?' "'It's moved to the right. Now it's gone a little to the left.' 
said the sub-warden, but he had his back to the window, and was making signals to the Lord Chancellor pointing to Ogog and the door, with many a cunning nod and wink. The Chancellor caught his meaning at last, and, crossing the room, took that interesting child by the ear. The next moment he and Ogog were out of the room, and the door shut behind them, but not before one piercing yell had rung through the room and reached the ears of the fond mother. "'What is that hideous noise?' she fiercely asked, turning upon her startled husband. "'It's some hyena or other,' replied the sub-warden, looking vaguely up to the ceiling, as if that was where they usually were to be found. "'Let us to business, my dear. Here comes the warden.' And he picked up from the floor a wandering scrap of manuscript, on which I just caught the words, "'After which election duly holden, the said Sibimet and Tabakat, his wife, may at their pleasure assume imperial—' Before, with a guilty look, he crumpled it up in his hand. End of chapter 3「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4. A Cunning Conspiracy The warden entered at this moment, and close behind him came the Lord Chancellor, a little flushed and out of breath, and adjusting his wig, which appeared to have been dragged partly off his head. "'But where is my precious child?' my lady inquired, as the four took their seats at the small side-table devoted to ledgers and bundles and bills. "'He left the room a few minutes ago with the Lord Chancellor,' the sub-warden briefly explained. "'Ah!' said my lady, graciously smiling on that high official. "'Your lordship has a very taking way with children. I doubt if anyone could gain the ear of my darling Ugog so quickly as you can.' For an entirely stupid woman, my lady's remarks were curiously full of meaning, of which she herself was wholly unconscious. The Chancellor bowed, but with a very uneasy air. "'I think the warden was about to speak,' he remarked, evidently anxious to change the subject. But my lady would not be checked. "'He is a clever boy,' she continued with enthusiasm. "'But he needs a man like your lordship to draw him out.' The Chancellor bit his lip, and was silent. He evidently feared that, stupid as she looked, she understood what she said this time, and was having a joke at his expense. He might have spared himself all anxiety. Whatever accidental meaning her words might have, she herself never meant anything at all. "'It is all settled,' the Warden announced, wasting no time over preliminaries. The sub-wardenship is abolished, and my brother is appointed to act as vice-warden whenever I'm absent. So, as I'm going abroad for a while, he will enter into his new duties at once. And there will really be a vice after all? My lady inquired. I hope so. The warden smilingly replied. My lady looked much pleased and tried to clap her hands, but you might as well have knocked two feather beds together for any noise it made. When my husband is vice... She said, It will be the same as if we had a hundred vices. Hear, hear, cried the sub-warden. You seem to think it very remarkable, my lady remarked with some severity, that your wife should speak the truth. No, not remarkable at all, her husband anxiously explained. Nothing is remarkable that you say, sweet one. My lady smiled approval of the sentiment and went on. And am I not the vice-wardeness? If you choose to use that title, said the warden, but your excellency will be the proper style of address, and I trust that both his excellency and her excellency will observe the agreement I have drawn up. The provision I am most anxious about is this. He unrolled a large parchment scroll and read aloud the words, Item, that we will be kind to the poor. The chancellor worded it for me. He added, glancing at that great functionary. I suppose now that word item has some deep legal meaning. Undoubtedly, replied the Chancellor, as articulately as he could with a pen between his lips. He was nervously rolling and unrolling several other scrolls, and making room among them for the one the warden had just handed to him. These are merely the rough copies, he explained. 
and as soon as I have put in the final corrections, making a great commotion among the different parchments, a semicolon or two that I have accidentally omitted, here he darted about, pen in hand, from one part of the scroll to another, spreading sheets of blotting paper over his corrections, all will be ready for signing. Should it not be read out first? My lady inquired. No need, no need. The sub-warden and the chancellor exclaimed at the same moment with feverish eagerness. No need at all. The warden gently assented. Your husband and I have gone through together. It provides that he shall exercise the full authority of warden and shall have the disposal of the annual revenue attached to the office until my return, or, failing that, until Bruno comes of age, and that he shall then hand over to myself or to Bruno, as the case may be, the wardenship, the unspent revenue, and the contents of the treasury, which are to be preserved intact under his guardianship. All this time the sub-warden was busy, with the Chancellor's help, shifting the papers from side to side and pointing out to the warden the place where he was to sign. He then signed it himself, and my lady and the Chancellor added their names as witnesses. Short partings are best, said the warden. All is ready for my journey. My children are waiting below to see me off. He gravely kissed my lady, shook hands with his brother and the Chancellor, and left the room. The three waited in silence till the sound of wheels announced that the warden was out of hearing. Then, to my surprise, they broke into peals of uncontrollable laughter. "'What a game! Oh, what a game!' cried the Chancellor, and he and the Vice-Warden joined hands and skipped wildly about the room. My lady was too dignified to skip, but she laughed like the neighing of a horse and waved her handkerchief above her head. It was clear to her very limited understanding that something very clever had been done, but what it was she had yet to learn. "'You said I should hear all about it when the warden had gone,' she remarked, as soon as she could make herself heard. "'And so you shall, Tabby,' her husband graciously replied as he moved the blotting paper and showed the two parchments lying side by side. "'This is the one he read, but didn't sign. And this is the one he signed, but didn't read. You see, it was all covered up, except the place for signing the names. Yes, yes, my lady interrupted eagerly and began comparing the two agreements. Item, that he shall exercise the authority of the warden in the warden's absence. Why, that's been changed into, shall be absolute governor for life with the title of emperor, if elected to that office by the people. What? Are you emperor, darling? Not yet, dear, the vice-warden replied. It won't do to let this paper be seen just at present. All in good time. My lady nodded and read on. Item, that we will be kind to the poor. Why, that's omitted altogether. Course it is, said her husband. We're not going to bother about the wretches. Good said my lady with emphasis, and read on again. Item. That the contents of the treasury be preserved intact. Why, that's altered into. Shall be at the absolute disposal of the vice-warden. Well, Sibby, that was a clever trick. All the jewels. Only think. May I go and put them on directly? Well, not just yet, lovey. Her husband uneasily replied. You see, the public mind isn't quite right for it yet. We must feel our way. Of course we'll have the coach and four out at once, and I'll take the title of emperor as soon as we can safely hold an election. But they'll hardly stand our using the jewels, as long as they know the warden's alive. We must spread a report of his death. A little conspiracy. A conspiracy! cried the delighted lady, clapping her hands. Of all things I do like a conspiracy. It's so interesting. The vice-warden and the chancellor interchanged a wink or two. Let her conspire to her heart's content. The cunning chancellor whispered. It'll do no harm. And when will the conspiracy? Hist! Her husband hastily interrupted her as the door opened and Sylvie and Bruno came in with their arms twined lovingly round each other. Bruno sobbing convulsively with his face hidden on his sister's shoulder, and Sylvie more grave and quiet, but with tears streaming down her cheeks. Mustn't cry like that, 
the vice-warden said sharply, but without any effect on the weeping children. Cheer him up a bit. He hinted to my lady. Cake. My lady muttered to herself with great decision, crossing the room and opening a cupboard from which she presently returned with two slices of plum cake. Eat and don't cry were her short and simple orders, and the poor children sat down side by side, but seemed in no mood for eating. For the second time the door opened, or rather was burst open this time, as Uggug rushed violently into the room, shouting, "'That old beggar's come again!' "'He's not to have any food,' the vice-warden was beginning, but the chancellor interrupted him. "'It's all right,' he said in a low voice. The servants have their orders. He's just under here, said Ogog, who had gone to the window and was looking down into the courtyard. Where, my darling? said his fond mother, flinging her arms round the neck of the little monster. All of us, except Sylvie and Bruno, who took no notice of what was going on, followed her to the window. The old beggar looked up at us with hungry eyes. Only a crust of bread, your highness, he pleaded. He was a fine old man, but looked sadly ill and worn. A crust of bread is what I crave, he repeated. A single crust and a little water. Here's some water. Drink this, Uggug bellowed, emptying a jug of water over his head. Well done, my boy, cried the vice warden. That's the way to settle such folk. Clever boy, the wardeness chimed in. Hasn't he good spirits? "'Take a stick to him!' shouted the vice-warden as the old beggar shook the water from his ragged cloak and again gazed meekly upwards. "'Take a red-hot poker to him!' my lady again chimed in. Possibly there was no red-hot poker handy, but some sticks were forthcoming in a moment and threatening faces surrounded the poor old wanderer who waved them back with quiet dignity. "'No need to break my old bones,' he said. I'm going. Not even a crust. The poor old man! exclaimed a little voice at my side, half choked with sobs. Bruno was at the window, trying to throw out his slice of plum cake, but Sylvie held him back. He shall have my cake! Bruno cried, passionately struggling out of Sylvie's arms. Yes, yes, darling! Sylvie gently pleaded. But don't throw it out! He's gone away, don't you see? Let's go after him. And she led him out of the room, unnoticed by the rest of the party, who were wholly absorbed in watching the old beggar. The conspirators returned to their seats and continued their conversation in an undertone, so as not to be heard by Ogog, who was still standing at the window. By the way, there was something about Bruno succeeding to the wardenship, said my lady. How does that stand in the new agreement? The Chancellor chuckled. Just the same, word for word, he said. With one exception, my lady, instead of Bruno, I've taken the liberty to put in. He dropped his voice to a whisper. To put in Uggug, you know. Uggug, indeed, I exclaimed in a burst of indignation I could no longer control. To bring out even that one word seemed a gigantic effort. But the cry once uttered, all efforts ceased at once. A sudden gust swept away the whole scene, and I found myself sitting up, staring at the young lady in the opposite corner of the carriage, who had now thrown back her veil and was looking at me with an expression of amused surprise. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.》Chapter Five, A Beggar's Palace. That I had said something in the act of waking, I felt sure. The hoarse, stifled cry was still ringing in my ears, even if the startled look of my fellow traveller had not been evidence enough. But what could I possibly say by way of apology? I hope I didn't frighten you, I stammered out at last. I have no idea what I said. I was dreaming. You said, Uggug, indeed, the young lady replied with quivering lips that would curve themselves into a smile in spite of all her efforts to look grave. At least you didn't say it. You shouted it. 
"'I'm very sorry,' was all I could say, feeling very penitent and helpless. "'She has Sylvie's eyes,' I thought to myself, half doubting whether even now I were fairly awake. "'And that sweet look of innocent wonder is all Sylvie's, too. "'But Sylvie hasn't got that calm, resolute mouth, "'nor that far-away look of dreamy sadness, "'like one that has had some deep sorrow very long ago. "'And the thick-coming fancies almost prevented my hearing the lady's next words. "'If you had had a shilling dreadful in your hand,' she proceeded, "'something about ghosts or dynamite or midnight murder, "'one could understand it. Those things aren't worth the shilling, unless they give one a nightmare. But really, with only a medical treatise, you know. And she glanced with a pretty shrug of contempt at the book over which I had fallen asleep. Her friendliness and utter unreserve took me aback for a moment. Yet there was no touch of forwardness or boldness about the child, for child almost she seemed to be. I guessed her at scarcely over twenty— all was the innocent frankness of some angelic visitant, new to the ways of earth and the conventionalisms, or, if you will, the barbarisms of society. Even so, I mused, will Sylvie look and speak in another ten years? You don't care for ghosts, then, I ventured to suggest, unless they are really terrifying. Quite so, the lady assented. The regular railway ghosts. I mean, the ghosts of ordinary railway literature are very poor affairs. I feel inclined to say, with Alexander Selkirk, their tameness is shocking to me, and they never do any midnight murders. They couldn't welter in gore to save their lives. Weltering in gore is a very expressive phrase, certainly. Can it be done in any fluid, I wonder? I think not. The lady readily replied, quite as if she had thought it out long ago. It has to be something thick. For instance, you might welter in bread sauce. That, being white, would be more suitable for a ghost, supposing it wished to welter. You have a real good terrifying ghost in that book, I hinted. How could you guess? She exclaimed with the most engaging frankness, and placed the volume in my hands, I opened it eagerly, with a not unpleasant thrill, like what a good ghost story gives one, at the uncanny coincidence of my having so unexpectedly divined the subject of her studies. It was a book of domestic cookery, open at the article Bread Sauce. I returned the book looking, I suppose, a little blank, as the lady laughed merrily at my discomfiture. It's far more exciting than some of the modern ghosts, I assure you. Now there was a ghost last month. I don't mean a real ghost in supernature, but in a magazine. It was a perfectly flavorless ghost. It wouldn't have frightened a mouse. It wasn't a ghost that one would even offer a chair to. Three score years and ten, boldness and spectacles have their advantages after all, I said to myself. Instead of a bashful youth and maiden gasping out monosyllables at awful intervals, here we have an old man and a child quite at their ease, talking as if they had known each other for years. Then you think, I continued aloud, that we ought sometimes to ask a ghost to sit down, but have we any authority for it? In Shakespeare, for instance, there are plenty of ghosts there. Does Shakespeare ever give the stage direction— hands chair to ghost the lady looked puzzled and thoughtful for a moment then she almost clapped her hands yes yes he does she cried he makes hamlet say rest rest perturbed spirit and that i suppose means an easy chair an american rocking chair i think fie for your junction my lady change for ilveston the guard announced, flinging open the door of the carriage, and we soon found ourselves, with all our portable property around us, on the platform. The accommodation provided for passengers waiting at this junction was distinctly inadequate. A single wooden bench, apparently intended for three sitters only, 
and even this was already partially occupied by a very old man in a smock-frock who sat with rounded shoulders and drooping head and with hands clasped on the top of his stick so as to make a sort of pillow for that wrinkled face with its look of patient weariness come you be off the station-master roughly accosted the poor old man you will be off and make way for your betters this way my lady he added in a perfectly different tone if your ladyship will take a seat the train will be up in a few minutes the cringing servility of his manner was due no doubt to the address legible on the pile of luggage which announced their owner to be lady muriel orme passenger to elveston via fayfield junction as i watched the old man slowly rise to his feet and hobble a few paces down the platform the lines came to my lips from sackcloth couch the monk arose with toil his stiffened limbs he reared a hundred years had flung their snows on his thin locks and floating beard but the lady scarcely noticed the little incident after one glance at the banished man who stood tremulously leaning on his stick she turned to me this is not an american rocking-chair by any means yet may i say slightly changing her place so as to make room for me beside her may i say in hamlet's words rest rest <laughs> she broke off with a silvery laugh perturbed spirit i finished the sentence for her yes that describes a railway traveller exactly and here is an instance of it i added as the tiny local train drew up alongside the platform and the porters bustled about opening carriage doors one of them helping the poor old man to hoist himself into a third-class carriage while another of them obsequiously conducted the lady and myself into a first class she paused before following him to watch the progress of the other passenger poor old man she said how weak and ill he looks it was a shame to let him be turned away like that i'm very sorry at this moment it dawned on me that these words were not addressed to me but that she was unconsciously thinking aloud i moved away a few steps and waited to follow her into the carriage where i resumed the conversation shakespeare must have travelled by rail if only in a dream perturbed spirit is such a happy phrase perturbed referring no doubt she rejoined to the sensational booklets peculiar to the rail if steam has done nothing else it has at least added a whole new species to english literature no doubt of it i echoed the true origin of all our medical books and all our cookery books no no she broke in merrily i didn't mean our literature we are quite abnormal but the booklets the little thrilling romances where the murder comes at page fifteen and the wedding at page forty surely they are due to steam and when we travel by electricity if i may venture to develop your theory we shall have leaflets instead of booklets and the murder and the wedding will come on the same page a development worthy of darwin the lady exclaimed enthusiastically only you reverse his theory instead of developing a mouse into an elephant you would develop an elephant into a mouse but here we plunged into a tunnel and i leaned back and closed my eyes for a moment trying to recall a few of the incidents of my recent dream i thought i saw i murmured sleepily and then the phrase insisted on conjugating itself and ran into you thought you saw he thought he saw and then it suddenly went off into a song he thought he saw an elephant that practised on a fife he looked again and found it was a letter from his wife at length i realized he said the bitterness of life and what a wild being it was who sang these wild words a gardener he seemed to be yet surely a mad one by the way he brandished his rake madder by the way he broke ever and anon into a frantic jig maddest of all by the shriek in which he brought out the last words of the stanza it was so far a description of himself that he had the feet of an elephant but the rest of him was skin and bone and the wisps of loose straw that bristled all about him suggested that he had been originally stuffed with it and that nearly all the stuffing had come out 
Sylvie and Bruno waited patiently till the end of the first verse. Then Sylvie advanced alone, Bruno having suddenly turned shy, and timidly introduced herself with the words, "'Please, I'm Sylvie.' "'And who's that other thing?' said the gardener. "'What thing?' said Sylvie, looking round. "'Oh, that's Bruno. He's my brother.' "'Was he your brother yesterday?' the gardener anxiously inquired. "'Course I were.' cried bruno who had gradually crept nearer and didn't at all like being talked about without having his share in the conversation ah oh, well the gardener said with a kind of groan things change so here whenever i look again it's sure to be something different yet i does my duty i gets up wriggle early at five if i was you said bruno i wouldn't wiggle so early it's as bad as being a worm he added in an undertone to sylvie but you shouldn't be lazy in the morning bruno said sylvie remember it's the early bird that picks up the worm um, it may if it likes bruno said with a slight yawn oh, i don't like eating worms one bit and i always stop in bed till the early bird has picked him up i wonder you've the face to tell me such fibs cried the gardener to which bruno wisely replied you don't want a face to tell fibs with only a mouth sylvie discreetly changed the subject and did you plant all these flowers she said what a lovely garden you've made do you know i like to live here always in the winter nights the gardener was beginning but i nearly forgotten what we came about sylvie interrupted would you please let us through into the road there's a poor old beggar just gone out and he's very hungry and bruno wants to give him his cake you know it's as much as my place is worth the gardener muttered taking a key from his pocket and beginning to unlock a door in the garden wall how much are it worth bruno innocently inquired but the gardener only grinned that's a secret he said my you come back quick he called after the children as they passed out into the road i had just time to follow them before he shut the door again we hurried down the road and very soon caught sight of the old beggar about a quarter of a mile ahead of us and the children at once set off running to overtake him lightly and swiftly they skimmed over the ground and i could not in the least understand how it was i kept up with them so easily but the unsolved problem did not worry me so much as at another time it might have done there were so many other things to attend to the old beggar must have been very deaf as he paid no attention whatever to bruno's eager shouting but trudged wearily on never pausing until the child got in front of him and held up the slice of cake the poor little fellow was quite out of breath and could only utter the one word cake not with the gloomy decision with which her excellency had so lately pronounced it but with a sweet childish timidity looking up into the old man's face with eyes that loved all things both great and small the old man snatched it from him and devoured it greedily as some hungry wild beast might have done but never a word of thanks did he give his little benefactor only growled more more and glared at the half-frightened children there is no more sylvie said with tears in her eyes i'd eaten mine it was a shame to let you be turned away like that i'm very sorry i lost the rest of the sentence for my mind had recurred with a great shock of surprise to lady muriel orme who had so lately uttered these very words of sylvie's yes and in sylvie's own voice and with sylvie's gentle pleading eyes follow me were the next words i heard as the old man waved his hand with a dignified grace that ill suited his ragged dress over a bush that stood by the roadside which began instantly to sink into the earth at another time i might have doubted the evidence of my eyes or at least have felt some astonishment but in this strange scene my whole being seemed absorbed in strong curiosity as to what would happen next when the bush had sunk quite out of sight marble steps were seen leading downwards into darkness the old man led the way and we eagerly followed 
The staircase was so dark at first that I could only just see the forms of the children as, hand in hand, they groped their way down after their guide. But it got lighter every moment with a strange silvery brightness that seemed to exist in the air, as there were no lamps visible. And when at last we reached a level floor, the room in which we found ourselves was almost as light as day. It was eight-sided, having in each angle a slender pillar round which silken draperies were twined. The wall between the pillars was entirely covered, to the height of six or seven feet with creepers, from which hung quantities of ripe fruit and of brilliant flowers that almost hid the leaves. In another place, perchance, I might have wondered to see fruit and flowers growing together. Here my chief wonder was that neither fruit nor flowers were such as I had ever seen before. Higher up, each wall contained a circular window of colored glass, and over all was an arched roof that seemed to be spangled all over with jewels. With hardly less wonder, I turned this way and that, trying to make out how in the world we had come in, for there was no door, and all the walls were thickly covered with the lovely creepers. "'We are safe here, my darlings,' said the old man, laying a hand on Sylvie's shoulder and bending down to kiss her. Sylvie drew back hastily, with an offended air, but in another moment, with a glad cry of, "'Why, it's father!' she had run into his arms. "'Father! Father!' Bruno repeated, and while the happy children were being hugged and kissed, I could but rub my eyes and say, "'Where, then, are the rags gone to?' For the old man was now dressed in royal robes that glittered with jewels and gold embroidery, and wore a circlet of gold around his head. End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 The Magic Locket. Where are we, father? Sylvie whispered, with her arms lovingly twined closely around the old man's neck, and with her rosy cheek lovingly pressed to his. In Elfland, darling, it's one of the provinces of Fairyland. But I thought Elfland was ever so far from Outland, and we've come such a tiny little way. You came by the royal road, sweet one. Only those of royal blood can travel along it. But you've been royal ever since I was made king of Elfland, that's nearly a month ago. They sent two ambassadors to make sure that their invitation to me to be their new king should reach me. One was a prince, so he was able to come by the royal road, and to come invisibly to all but me. The other was a baron, so he had to come by the common road, and I dare say he hasn't even arrived yet. And how far have we come? Sylvie inquired. Just a thousand miles, sweet one, since the gardener unlocked the door for you. A thousand miles? Bruno repeated. And may I eat one? Eat a mile, little rogue. No, said Bruno. I mean may I eat one of that fruit? Yes, child, said his father. And then you'll find out what pleasure is like, the pleasure we all seek so madly and enjoy so mournfully. Bruno ran eagerly to the wall and picked a fruit that was shaped something like a banana, but had the color of a strawberry. He ate it with beaming looks that became gradually more gloomy and were very blank indeed by the time he had finished. It hasn't got no taste at all, he complained. I couldn't feel nothing in my mouth. It's a... what's that hard word, Sylvie? It was a fleas. Sylvie gravely replied. Are they all like that, father? They're all like that to you, darling, because you don't belong to Elfland, yet. But to me they are real. Bruno looked puzzled. I'll try another kind of fruits, he said, and jumped down off the king's knee. There's some lovely striped ones, just like a rainbow. And off he ran. Meanwhile, the fairy king and Sylvie were talking together, but in such low tones that I could not catch the words. So I followed Bruno, who was picking and eating other kinds of fruit, in the vain hope of finding some that had a taste. I tried to pick some myself, but it was like grasping air, and I soon gave up the attempt and returned to Sylvie. Look well at it, my darling. 
the old man was saying. And tell me how you like it. It's just lovely, cried Sylvie delightedly. Bruno, come and look. And she held up, so that he might see the light through it, a heart-shaped locket, apparently cut out of a single jewel, of a rich blue color with a slender gold chain attached to it. Oh, welly pretty, Bruno more soberly remarked, and he began spelling out some words inscribed on it. Ah, uh, will, love, Shilvy. He made them out at last. And so they do's. He cried, clasping his arms round her neck. Everybody loves Sylvie. But we love our best, don't we, Bruno? Said the old king as he took possession of the locket. Now, Sylvie, look at this. And he showed her, lying on the palm of his hand, a locket of a deep crimson color, the same shape as the blue one, and like it, attached to a slender golden chain. Lovelier and lovelier! exclaimed Sylvie, clasping her hands in ecstasy. Look, Bruno. And there's some words on this one, too, said Bruno. Sylvie, will, love, all. Now you see the difference, said the old man. Different colours and different words. Choose one of them, darling. I'll give you whichever you like best. Sylvie whispered the word several times over with a thoughtful smile, and then made her decision. It's very nice to be loved, she said. But it's nicer to love other people. May I have the red one, father? The old man said nothing, but I could see his eyes fill with tears as he bent his head and pressed his lips to her forehead in a long loving kiss. Then he undid the chain and showed her how to fasten it round her neck, and to hide it away under the edge of her frock. It's for you to keep, you know, he said in a low voice. Not for other people to see. You'll remember how to use it. Yes, I'll remember, said Sylvie. And now, darlings, it's time for you to go back, or they'll be missing you, and that poor gardener will get into trouble. Once more a feeling of wonder rose in my mind as to how in the world we were to get back again, since I took it for granted that wherever the children went I was to go. But no shadow of doubt seemed to cross their minds as they hugged and kissed him, murmuring over and over again, "'Good-bye, darling father!' And then suddenly and swiftly the darkness of midnight seemed to close in upon us, and through the darkness harshly rang a strange, wild song. He thought he saw a buffalo upon the chimney-piece. He looked again and found it was his sister's husband's niece. Unless you leave this house, he said, I'll send for the police. That was me he added, looking out at us through the half-opened door as we stood waiting in the road. And that's what I'd have done, as sure as potatoes aren't radishes, if she hadn't have taken herself off. But I always loves my parents like anything. Who are who parents? said Bruno. The mass parent for me, of course, the gardener replied. You can come in now, if you like. He flung the door open as he spoke, and we got out, a little dazzled and stupefied, at least I felt so, at the sudden transition from the half-darkness of the railway carriage to the brilliantly lighted platform of Elveston Station. A footman in a handsome livery came forwards and respectfully touched his hat. The carriage is here, my lady, he said, taking from her the wraps and small articles she was carrying and Lady Muriel, after shaking hands and bidding me good-night, with a pleasant smile, followed him. It was with a somewhat blank and lonely feeling that I betook myself to the van from which the luggage was being taken out, and after giving directions to have my boxes sent after me, I made my way on foot to Arthur's lodgings, and soon lost my lonely feeling in the hearty welcome my old friend gave me, and the cosy warmth and cheerful light of the little sitting-room into which he led me. Little, as you see, but quite enough for us too. Now, take the easy chair, old fellow, and let's have another look at you. Well, you do look a bit pulled down. And he put on a solemn, professional air. I prescribe ozone, quant, suff, social dissipation, 
fiant piluli quam plirumi, to be taken feasting three times a day. But, doctor, I remonstrated, society doesn't receive three times a day. That's all you know about it, the young doctor gaily replied. At home, lawn tennis, 3 p.m. At home, kettle drum, 5 p.m. At home, music, Elveston doesn't give dinners, 8 p.m. Carriages at 10. There you are. It sounded very pleasant, I was obliged to admit. And I know some of the lady society already, I added. One of them came in the same carriage with me. What was she like? Then perhaps I can identify her. The name was Lady Muriel Orme. As to what she was like, well, I thought her very beautiful. Do you know her? Yes, I, I, I do know her. And the grave doctor coloured slightly as he added, Yes, I agree with you. She is beautiful. I quite lost my heart to her. I went on mischievously. We talked. Have some supper. Arthur interrupted with an air of relief as the maid entered with the tray, and he steadily resisted all my attempts to return to the subject of Lady Muriel until the evening had almost worn itself away. Then, as we sat gazing into the fire and conversation was lapsing into silence, he made a hurried confession. I hadn't meant to tell you anything about her, he said, naming no names as if there were only one she in the world till you had seen more of her and formed your own judgment of her but somehow you surprised it out of me and i've not breathed a word of it to anyone else but i can trust you with a secret old friend yes it's true of me what i suppose you said in jest in the merest jest believe me i said earnestly why man i'm three times her age but if she's your choice then i'm sure she's all that is good and and sweet Arthur went on. And pure and self-denying and true-hearted and... He broke off hastily, as if he could not trust himself to say more on a subject so sacred and so precious. Silence followed, and I leaned back drowsily in my easy-chair, filled with bright, beautiful imaginings of Arthur and his lady-love, and of all the peace and happiness in store for them. I pictured them to myself walking together lingeringly and lovingly under arching trees, in a sweet garden of their own, and welcomed back by their faithful gardener on their return from some brief excursion. It seemed natural enough that the gardener should be filled with exuberant delight at the return of so gracious a master and mistress, and how strangely childlike they looked. I could have taken them for Sylvie and Bruno, less natural that he should show it by such wild dances, such crazy songs. He thought he saw a rattlesnake that questioned him in Greek. He looked again and found it was the middle of next week. The one thing I regret, he said, is that it cannot speak. Least natural of all that the vice warden and my lady should be standing close beside me, discussing an open letter which had just been handed to him by the professor, who stood meekly waiting a few yards off. If it were not for those two brats, I heard him mutter, glancing savagely at Sylvie and Bruno, who were courteously listening to the gardener's song, there would be no difficulty whatever. Let's hear that bit of the letter again, said my lady, and the vice-warden read aloud, and we therefore entreat you graciously to accept the kingship, to which you have been unanimously elected by the Council of Elfland, and that you will allow your son Bruno, of whose goodness, cleverness, and beauty reports have reached us, to be regarded as heir apparent. But what's the difficulty? said my lady. Why don't you see? The ambassador that brought this is waiting in the house, and he's sure to see Sylvie and Bruno. And then, when he sees Agog, and remembers all that about goodness, cleverness, and beauty, why he's sure to— And where will you find a better boy than Ugog? My lady indignantly interrupted. Or a wittier, or a lovelier? To all of which the vice-warden simply replied, Don't you be a great blethering goose. 
Our only chance is to keep those two brats out of sight. If you can manage that, you may leave the rest to me. I'll make him believe Ugug to be a model of cleverness and all that. We must change his name to Bruno, of course, said my lady. The vice warden rubbed his chin. Humph, no, he said musingly. Wouldn't do. The boy's such an utter idiot, he'd never learn to answer to it. Idiot, indeed, cried my lady. He's no more an idiot than I am. You're right, my dear, the vice warden soothingly replied. He isn't indeed. My lady was appeased. Let's go in and receive the ambassador, she said and beckoned to the professor. Which room is he waiting in? she inquired. In the library, madam. And what did you say his name was? said the vice warden. The professor referred to a card he held in his hand. His adiposity, the Baron Doppelgeist. Why does he come with such a fancy name? said my lady. He couldn't well change it on the journey, the professor meekly replied. Because of the luggage. You go and receive him, my lady said to the vice warden. And I'll attend to the children. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 The Baron's Embassy. I was following the vice warden, but on second thoughts went after my lady, being curious to see how she would manage to keep the children out of sight. I found her holding Sylvie's hand, and with her other hand, stroking Bruno's hair in a most tender and motherly fashion. Both children were looking bewildered and half-frightened. "'My own darlings,' she was saying, "'I've been planning a little treat for you. The professor shall take you a long walk into the woods this beautiful evening, and you shall take a basket of food with you, and have a little picnic down by the river.' Bruno jumped and clapped his hands. That a nice, he cried. On it, Sylvie. Sylvie, who hadn't quite lost her surprised look, put up her mouth for a kiss. Thank you very much, she said earnestly. My lady turned her head away to conceal the broad grim of triumph that spread over her vast face like a ripple on a lake. Little simpletons, she muttered to herself as she marched up to the house. I followed her in. Quite so, your excellency, the baron was saying as we entered the library. All the infantry were under my command. He turned and was duly presented to my lady. A military hero, said my lady. The fat little man simpered. Well, yes, he replied, modestly casting down his eyes. My ancestors were all famous for military genius. My lady smiled graciously. It often runs in families, she remarked. Just as a love for pastry does. The baron looked slightly offended, and the vice warden discreetly changed the subject. Dinner will soon be ready, he said. May I have the honour of conducting your adiposity to the guest chamber? Certainly, certainly, the baron eagerly assented. It would never do to keep dinner waiting. And he almost trotted out of the room after the vice warden. He was back again so speedily that the vice warden had barely time to explain to my lady that her remark about a love for pastry was unfortunate. You might have seen with half an eye, he added that that's his line. Military genius indeed, pooh. Dinner ready yet? The baron inquired as he hurried into the room. We'll be in a few minutes, the vice warden replied. Meanwhile, let's take a turn in the garden. You were telling me, he continued as the trio left the house, something about a great battle in which you had the command of the infantry. True, said the baron. 
the enemy as i was saying far outnumbered us but i marched my men right into the middle of what's that the military hero exclaimed in agitated tones drawing back behind the vice-warden as a strange creature rushed wildly upon them brandishing a spade it's only the gardener the vice-warden replied in an encouraging tone quite harmless i assure you hark he's singing it's his favourite amusement and once more those shrill discordant tones rang out he thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from the bus he looked again and found it was a hippopotamus if there's just day to dine he said there won't be much for us throwing away the spade he broke into a frantic jig snapping his fingers and repeating again and again there won't be much for us there won't be much for us once more the baron looked slightly offended but the vice-warden hastily explained that the song had no allusion to him and in fact had no meaning at all you didn't mean anything by it now did you he appealed to the gardener who had finished his song and stood balancing himself on one leg and looking at them with his mouth open i never means nothing said the gardener and ogog luckily came up at the moment and gave the conversation a new turn allow me to present my son said the vice-warden adding in a whisper one of the best and cleverest boys that ever lived i'll contrive for you to see some of his cleverness he knows everything that other boys don't know and in archery in fishing in painting and in music his skill is but you shall judge for yourself you see that target over there he shall shoot an arrow at it dear boy he went on aloud his adiposity would like to see you shoot bring his highness's bow and arrows Ugug looked very sulky as he received the bow and arrow and prepared to shoot. Just as the arrow left the bow, the vice-warden trod heavily on the toe of the baron, who yelled with the pain. Ah! Ten thousand pardons! he exclaimed. I stepped back in my excitement. See, it is a bull's-eye! The baron gazed in astonishment. He held the bow so awkwardly it seemed impossible he muttered, but there was no room for doubt. There was the arrow right in the centre of the bull's-eye. The lake is close by, continued the vice-warden. Bring his highness's fishing-rod. And Ugug most unwillingly held the rod and dangled the fly over the water. A beetle on your arm, cried my lady, pinching the poor baron's arm worse than if ten lobsters had seized it at once. That kind is poisonous she explained but what a pity you missed seeing the fish pulled out an enormous dead codfish was lying on the bank with the hook in its mouth i had always fancied the baron faltered that cod were salt water fish not in this country said the vice-warden shall we go in ask my son some question on the way any subject you like and the sulky boy was violently shoved forwards to walk at the baron's side could your highness tell me the baron cautiously began how much seven times nine would come to turn to the left cried the vice-warden hastily stepping forwards to show the way so hastily that he ran against his unfortunate guest who fell heavily on his face so sorry my lady exclaimed as she and her husband helped him to his feet again my son was in the act of saying sixty-three as you fell the baron said nothing he was covered with dust and seemed much hurt both in body and mind however when they got him into the house and given him a good brushing matters looked a little better dinner was served in due course and every fresh dish seemed to increase the good humour of the baron but all efforts to get him to express his opinion as to ogug's cleverness were in vain until that interesting youth had left the room and was seen from the open window prowling about the lawn with a little basket which he was filling with frogs 
"'So fond of natural history as he is, dear boy,' said the doting mother. "'Now do tell us, Baron, what do you think of him?' "'To be perfectly candid,' said the cautious Baron, "'I would like a little more evidence. "'I think you mentioned his skill in... "'Music,' said the Vice-Warden. "'Why, he's simply a prodigy. "'You shall hear him play the piano.' "'And he walked to the window. "'Ugh, I, I mean my boy. "'Come in for a minute and bring the music-master with you "'to turn over the music for him.' "'He added as an explanation.' Uggug, having filled his basket with frogs, had no objection to obey, and soon appeared in the room, followed by a fierce-looking little man, who asked the vice-warden, "'What music will you have?' "'The sonata that His Highness plays so charmingly,' said the vice-warden. "'His Highness hath not—' the music-master began, but was sharply stopped by the vice-warden. "'Silence, sir. Go and turn over the music for His Highness. My dear—' to the wardeness will you show him what to do and meanwhile baron i'll just show you a most interesting map we have of outland and fairyland and that sort of thing by the time my lady had returned from explaining things to the music master the map had been hung up and the baron was already much bewildered by the vice warden's habit of pointing to one place while he shouted out the name of another my lady, joining in, pointing out other places, and shouting other names, only made matters worse, and at last the baron, in despair, took to pointing out places for himself, and feebly asked, Is that great yellow splotch fairyland? Yes, that's fairyland, said the vice-warden. And you might as well give him a hint, he muttered to my lady about going back to-morrow he eats like a shark it would hardly do for me to mention it his wife caught the idea and at once began giving hints of the most subtle and delicate kind just see what a short way it is back to fairyland why if you started to-morrow morning you'd get there in very little more than a week the baron looked incredulous it took me a full month to come he said but it's ever so much shorter going back, you know. The baron looked appealingly to the vice-warden, who chimed in readily. You can go back five times in the time it took you to come here once, if you start to-morrow morning. All this time the sonata was peeling through the room. The baron could not help admitting to himself that it was being magnificently played, but he tried in vain to get a glimpse of the youthful performer. Every time he had nearly succeeded in catching sight of him, either the vice-warden or his wife was sure to get in the way, pointing out some new place on the map and deafening him with some new name. He gave in at last, wished a hasty good-night, and left the room, while his host and hostess interchanged looks of triumph. "'Deftly done,' cried the vice-warden. "'Craftily contrived, but what means all that tramping on the stairs?' He half opened the door, looked out, and added in a tone of dismay, The baron's boxes are being carried down. And what means all that rumbling of wheels? cried my lady. She peeped through the window curtains. The baron's carriage has come round, she groaned. At this moment the door opened, a fat, furious face looked in, a voice hoarse with passion thundered out the words, my room is full of frogs i leave you and the door closed again and still the noble sonata went peeling through the room but it was arthur's masterly touch that roused the echoes and thrilled my very soul with the tender music of the immortal sonata pathetic and it was not till the last note had died away that the tired but happy traveller could bring himself to utter the words, Good night, and to seek his much-needed pillow. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8. A Ride on a Lion the next day glided away pleasantly enough partly in settling myself in my new quarters and partly in strolling round the neighbourhood under arthur's guidance and trying to form a general idea of elveston and its inhabitants when five o'clock arrived arthur proposed without any embarrassment this time to take me with him up to the hall in order that i might make acquaintance with the earl of ainsley who had taken it for the season and renew acquaintance with his daughter lady muriel my first impressions of the gentle dignified and yet genial old man were entirely favourable and the real satisfaction that showed itself on his daughter's face as she met me with the words this is indeed an unlooked-for pleasure was very soothing for whatever remains of personal vanity the failures and disappointments of many long years and much buffeting with a rough world had left in me yet i noted and was glad to note evidence of a far deeper feeling than mere friendly regard in her meeting with arthur though this was as i gathered an almost daily occurrence and the conversation between them in which the earl and i were only occasional sharers had an ease and a spontaneity rarely met with except between very old friends and as i knew that they had not known each other for a longer period than the summer which was now rounding into autumn i felt certain that love and love alone could explain the phenomenon how convenient it would be lady muriel laughingly remarked apropos of my having insisted on saving her the trouble of carrying a cup of tea across the room to the earl if cups of tea had no weight at all then perhaps ladies would sometimes be permitted to carry them for short distances one can easily imagine a situation said arthur where things would necessarily have no weight relatively to each other though each would have its usual weight looked at by itself some desperate paradox said the earl tell us how it could be we shall never guess it well suppose this house just as it is placed a few billion miles above a planet and with nothing else near enough to disturb it of course it falls to the planet hmm? the earl nodded of course though it might take some centuries to do it and is five o'clock tea to be going on all the while said lady muriel that and other things said arthur the inhabitants would live their lives grow up and die and still the house would be falling 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 but now as to the relative weight of things nothing can be heavy you know except by trying to fall and being prevented from doing so you all grant that we all granted that well now if i take this book and hold it out at arm's length of course i feel its weight it is trying to fall and i prevent it and if i let go it falls to the floor but if we were all falling together it couldn't be trying to fall any quicker you know for if i let go what more could it do than fall and as my hand would be falling too at the same rate it would never leave it for that would be to get ahead of it in the race and it could never overtake the falling floor i see it clearly said lady muriel but it makes one dizzy to think of such things how can you make us do it there is a more curious idea yet i ventured to say suppose a cord fastened to the house from below and pulled down by someone on the planet well, then of course the house goes faster than its natural rate of falling but the furniture with our noble selves would go on falling at their old pace and would therefore be left behind practically we should rise to the ceiling said the earl the inevitable result of which would be concussion of brain to avoid that said arthur let us have the furniture fixed to the floor and ourselves tied down to the furniture then the five o'clock tea could go on in peace with one little drawback lady muriel gaily interrupted we should take the cups down with us but what about the tea i had forgotten the tea arthur confessed that no doubt would rise to the ceiling unless you chose to drink it on the way which i think is quite nonsense enough for one while 
said the earl what news does this gentleman bring us from the great world of london this drew me into the conversation which now took a more conventional tone after a while arthur gave the signal for our departure and in the cool of the evening we strolled down to the beach enjoying the silence broken only by the murmur of the sea and the faraway music of some fisherman's song almost as much as our late pleasant talk we sat down among the rocks by a little pool so rich in animal vegetable and zoophytic or whatever is the right word life that i became entranced in the study of it and when arthur proposed returning to our lodgings i begged to be left there for a while to watch and muse alone the fisherman's song grew ever nearer and clearer as their boat stood in for the beach and i would have gone down to see them land their cargo of fish had not the microcosm at my feet stirred my curiosity yet more keenly one ancient crab that was for ever shuffling frantically from side to side of the pool had particularly fascinated me there was a vacancy in its stare and an aimless violence in its behaviour that irresistibly recalled the gardener who had befriended sylvie and bruno and as i gazed i caught the concluding notes of the tune of his crazy song the silence that followed was broken by the sweet voice of sylvie would you please let us out into the road what after that old beggar again the gardener yelled and began singing he thought he saw a kangaroo that worked the coffee mill he looked again and found it was a vegetable pill but i to swallow this he said i should be very ill we don't want him to swallow anything sylvie explained he's not hungry but we want to see him so will you please certainly the gardener promptly replied i always please never displeases nobody there you are and he flung the door open and let us out upon the dusty high road we soon found our way to the bush which had so mysteriously sunk into the ground and here sylvie drew the magic locket from its hiding place turned it over with a thoughtful air and at last appealed to bruno in a rather helpless way what was it we had to do with it bruno it's all gone out of my head kiss it was bruno's invariable recipe in cases of doubt and difficulty sylvie kissed it but no result followed rub it the wrong way was bruno's next suggestion which is the wrong way sylvie most reasonably inquired the obvious plan was to try both ways rubbing it from left to right had no visible effect whatever from right to left oh stop sylvie bruno cried in sudden alarm whatever's going to happen for a number of trees on the neighbouring hillside were moving slowly upwards in solemn procession while a mild little brook that had been rippling at our feet a moment before began to swell and foam and hiss and bubble in a truly alarming fashion rub it some other way cried bruno try up and down quick it was a happy thought up and down did it and the landscape which had been showing signs of mental aberration in various directions returned to its normal condition of sobriety with the exception of a small yellowish-brown mouse which continued to run wildly up and down the road lashing its tail like a little lion let's follow it said sylvie and this also turned out a happy thought the mouse at once settled down into a business-like jog-trot with which we could easily keep pace the only phenomena that gave me any uneasiness was the rapid increase in the size of the little creature we were following which became every moment more and more like a real lion soon the transformation was complete and a noble lion stood patiently waiting for us to come up with it no thought of fear seemed to occur to the children who patted and stroked it as if it had been a shetland pony help me up cried bruno and in another moment sylvie had lifted him upon the broad back of the gentle beast and seated herself behind him pillion fashion bruno took a good handful of mane in each hand and made believe to guide this new kind of steed gee up seemed quite sufficient by way of verbal direction the lion at once broke into an easy canter and we soon found ourselves in the depths of the forest 
I say we, for I am certain that I accompanied them, though how I managed to keep up with the cantering lion, I am wholly unable to explain. But I was certainly one of the party when we came upon an old beggar-man cutting sticks, at whose feet the lion made a profound obeisance. Sylvie and Bruno at the same moment dismounting, and leaping into the arms of their father. From bad to worse the old man said to himself dreamily when the children had finished their rather confused account of the ambassador's visit gathered no doubt from general report as they had not seen him themselves from bad to worse that is their destiny i see it but i cannot alter it the selfishness of a mean and crafty man the selfishness of an ambitious and silly woman the selfishness of a spiteful and loveless child all tend one way from bad to worse and you my darlings must suffer it a while i fear yet when things are at their worst you can come to me i can do but little as yet gathering up a handful of dust and scattering it into the air he slowly and solemnly pronounced some words that sounded like a charm the children looking on in awestruck silence let craft ambition spite be quenched in reason's night till weakness turn to might till what is dark be light, till what is wrong be right. The cloud of dust spread itself out through the air as if it were alive, forming curious shapes that were forever changing into others. It makes letters, it makes words, Bruno whispered as he clung half-frightened to Sylvie. Oh, why can't make them out? Read them, Sylvie. I'll try, Sylvie gravely replied. Wait a minute. If only I could see that word. I should be very ill. A discordant voice yelled in our ears. Were I to swallow this, he said, I should be very ill. <laughs> End of chapter 8「nine of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9. A Jester and a Bear Yes, we were in the garden once more, and to escape that horrid, discordant voice, we hurried indoors and found ourselves in the library. Ugug blubbering, the professor standing by with a bewildered air, and my lady with her arms clasped round her son's neck, repeating over and over again, And did they give him nasty lessons to learn, my own pretty pet? What's all this noise about? The vice warden angrily inquired as he strode into the room. And who put the hat stand here? And he hung his hat upon Bruno, who was standing in the middle of the room, too much astonished by the sudden change of scene to make any attempt at removing it though it came down to his shoulders, making him look something like a small candle with a large extinguisher over it. The professor mildly explained that his highness had been graciously pleased to say that he wouldn't do his lessons. Do your lessons this instant, you young cub, thundered the vice-warden. And take this! And a resounding box on the ear made the unfortunate professor reel across the room. Save me! faltered the poor old man as he sank half fainting at my lady's feet shave you of course i will my lady replied as she lifted him into a chair and pinned an antimacassar round his neck where's the razor the vice-warden meanwhile had got hold of ugug and was belabouring him with his umbrella who left this loose nail in the floor he shouted hammer it in i say hammer it in blow after blow fell on the writhing ugug till he dropped howling to the floor then his father turned to the shaving scene which was being enacted and roared with laughter <laughs> excuse me dear i can't help it he said as soon as he could speak you are such an utter donkey kiss me tabby and he flung his arms round the neck of the terrified professor who raised a wild shriek, but whether he received the threatened kiss or not I was unable to see, as Bruno, who had by this time released himself from his extinguisher, rushed headlong out of the room, followed by Sylvie, and I was so fearful of being left alone among all these crazy creatures that I hurried after them. 
We must go to father, Sylvie panted as they ran down the garden. I'm sure things are at their worst. I'll ask the gardener to let us out again. We can't walk all the way, Bruno whimpered. How I wish we had a coach and fall, like uncle. And shrill and wild rang through the air the familiar voice. He thought he saw a coach and four that stood beside his bed. He looked again and found it was a bear without a head. Poor thing, he said, poor silly thing, it's waiting to be fed. No, I can't let you out again, he said before the children could speak. The vice warden gave it me, he did, for letting you out last time. So be off with you. And turning away from them, he began digging frantically in the middle of a gravel walk, singing over and over again. Poor thing, he said. Poor silly thing, it's waiting to be fed. But in a more musical tone than the shrill screech in which he had begun, the music grew fuller and richer at every moment. Other manly voices joined in the refrain, and soon I heard the heavy thud that told me the boat had touched the beach, and the harsh grating of the shingle as the men dragged it up. I roused myself, and after lending them a hand in hauling up their boat, I lingered yet a while to watch them disembark a goodly assortment of the hard-won treasures of the deep. When at last I reached our lodgings, I was tired and sleepy, and glad enough to settle down again into the easy chair, while Arthur hospitably went to his cupboard to get me out some cake and wine, without which, he declared, he could not, as a doctor, permit my going to bed. And how that cupboard door did creak! It surely could not be Arthur who was opening and shutting it so often, moving so restlessly about and muttering like the soliloquy of a tragedy queen. No, it was a female voice. Also the figure half hidden by the cupboard door was a female figure, massive and in flowing robes. Could it be the landlady? The door opened, and a strange man entered the room. What is that donkey doing? He said to himself, pausing, aghast on the threshold. The lady thus rudely referred to was his wife. She had got one of the cupboards open and stood with her back to him, smoothing down a sheet of brown paper on one of the shelves, and whispering to herself so so deftly done craftily contrived her loving husband stole behind her on tiptoe and tapped her on the head boo. he playfully shouted at her ear never tell me again i can't say boo to a goose my lady wrung her hands discovered she groaned yet no he is one of us reveal it not o oh man let it bide its time. Reveal what not? Her husband testily replied, dragging out the sheet of brown paper. What are you hiding here, my lady? I insist upon knowing. My lady cast down her eyes and spoke in the littlest of little voices. Don't make fun of it, Benjamin, she pleaded. It's... it's... don't you understand? It's a dagger. And what's that for? Sneered his excellency. We've only got to make people think he's dead. We haven't got to kill him. And made of tin, too. He snarled, contemptuously bending the blade round his thumb. Now, madam, you'll be good enough to explain. First, what do you call me Benjamin for? It's part of the conspiracy, love. Only one must have an alias, you know. Oh, an alias, is it? Well, and next, what did you get this dagger for? Come, no evasions. You can't deceive me. I got it for... 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 The detected conspirator stammered, trying her best to put on the assassin expression that she had been practising at the looking-glass. For... For what, madam? Well, for eighteen pence, if you must know, dearest. That's what I got it for, on my... Now don't say your word and honour, groaned the other conspirator. Why, they aren't worth half the money put together. On my birthday, my lady concluded in a meek whisper. One must have a dagger, you know. It's part of the... Oh, don't talk of conspiracies. Her husband savagely interrupted as he tossed the dagger into the cupboard. You know about as much how to manage a conspiracy as if you were a chicken. Why, the first thing is to get a disguise. Now just look at this. 
and with pardonable pride he fitted on the cap and bells and the rest of the fool's dress and winked at her and put his tongue in his cheek is that the sort of thing now he demanded my lady's eyes flashed with all a conspirator's enthusiasm the very thing she exclaimed clapping her hands you do look oh such a perfect fool the fool smiled a doubtful smile he was not quite clear whether it was a compliment or not to express it so plainly you mean a jester yes that's what i intended and what do you think your disguise is to be and he proceeded to unfold the parcel the lady watching him in rapture oh how lovely she cried when at last the dress was unfolded what a splendid disguise an esquimo peasant woman an esquimo peasant indeed growled the other here put it on and look at yourself in the glass why it's a bear can't you use your eyes he checked himself suddenly as a harsh voice yelled through the room he looked again and found it was a bear without a head but it was only the gardener singing under the open window the vice-warden stole on tiptoe to the window and closed it noiselessly before he ventured to go on yes lovey a bear but not without a head i hope you're the bear and me the keeper and if any one knows us they'll have sharp eyes that's all i shall have to practise the steps a bit my lady said looking out through the bear's mouth one can't help being rather human just at first you know and of course you'll say come up brune won't you yes of course replied the keeper laying hold of the chain that hung from the bear's collar with one hand while with the other he cracked a little whip now go round the room in a sort of a dancing attitude very good my dear very good come up bruin come up i say he roared out the last words for the benefit of uggug who had just come into the room and was now standing with his hands spread out his eyes and mouth wide open the very picture of stupid amazement oh my was all he could gasp out the keeper pretending to be adjusting the bear's collar which gave him an opportunity of whispering unheard by uggug my fault i'm afraid quite forgot to fasten the door plot's ruined if he finds it out keep it up a minute or two longer be savage then while seeming to pull it back with all his strength he let it advance upon the scared boy my lady with admirable presence of mind kept up what she no doubt intended for a savage growl though it was more like the purring of a cat and uggug backed out of the room with such haste that he tripped over the mat and was heard to fall heavily outside an accident to which even his doting mother paid no heed in the excitement of the moment the vice-warden shut and bolted the door off with the disguises he panted there's not a moment to lose he's sure to fetch the professor and we couldn't take him in you know and in another minute the disguises were stowed away in the cupboard the door unbolted and the two conspirators seated lovingly side by side on the sofa earnestly discussing a book the vice-warden had hastily snatched off the table which proved to be the city directory of the capital of outland the door opened very slowly and cautiously and the professor peeped in uggug's stupid face being just visible behind him it is a beautiful arrangement the vice-warden was saying with enthusiasm you see my precious one that there are fifteen houses in green street before you turn into west street fifteen houses is it possible my lady replied i thought it was fourteen and so intent were they on this interesting question that neither of them even looked up till the professor leading uggug by the hand stood close before them my lady was the first to notice their approach why there's the professor she exclaimed in her blandest tones and my precious child too our lesson's over a strange thing has happened the professor began in a trembling tone his exalted fatness this was one of uggug's many titles tells me he has just seen in this very room a dancing bear and a court jester the vice-warden and his wife shook with well-acted merriment not in this room darling said the fond mother we've been sitting here this hour or more reading here she referred to the book lying on her lap reading the the city directory let me feel your pulse my boy said the anxious father now put out your tongue ah 
I thought so. He is a little feverish, Professor, and has had a bad dream. Put him to bed at once and give him a cooling draught. I ain't been dreaming, his exalted fatness remonstrated as the Professor led him away. Bad grammar, sir, his father remarked with some sternness. Kindly attend to that little matter, Professor, as soon as you have corrected the feverishness. And by the way, Professor... The professor left his distinguished pupil standing at the door and meekly returned. There is a rumour afloat that the people wish to elect an, in point of fact, an, you understand that I mean an... Not another professor. The poor old man exclaimed in horror. No, certainly not. The vice warden eagerly explained. Merely an emperor, you understand. An emperor? cried the astonished professor, holding his head between his hands as if he expected it to come to pieces with the shock. What will the warden? Why, the warden will most likely be the new emperor, my lady explained. Where could we find a better? Unless perhaps... She glanced at her husband. Where indeed? The professor fervently responded, quite failing to take the hint. The vice warden resumed the thread of his discourse. The reason I mentioned it, professor was to ask you to be so kind as to preside at the election. You see, it would make the thing respectable. No suspicion of anything underhand. I fear I can't, Your Excellency, the old man faltered. What will the warden— True, true, the vice warden interrupted. Your position as court professor makes it awkward, I admit. Well, well, then the election shall be held without you. Better so than if it were held within me, the professor murmured with a bewildered air, as if he hardly knew what he was saying. But I think your highness said, and a cooling draught? And he wandered dreamily back to where Ugog sulkily awaited him. I followed them out of the room and down the passage, the professor murmuring to himself all the time as a kind of aid to his feeble memory. C, C, C. Couch, cooling draught correct grammar till in turning a corner he met sylvie and bruno so suddenly that the startled professor let go of his fat pupil who instantly took to his heels end of chapter nine chapter ten of sylvie and bruno by lewis carroll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10. The Other Professor We were looking for you, cried Sylvie in a tone of great relief. We do want you so much you can't think. What is it, dear children? The professor asked, beaming on them with a very different look from what Ugog ever got from him. We want you to speak to the gardener for us. Sylvie said, as she and Bruno took the old man's hands and led him into the hall. He's ever so unkind, Bruno mournfully added. They is all unkind to us now that father's gone. The lion was so much nicer. But you must explain to me, please, the professor said with an anxious look. Which is the lion and to which is the gardener? It's most important not to get two such animals confused together. And one's very liable to do it in their case, both having mouths, you know. Do you always confuse us two animals together? Bruno asked. Pretty often, I'm afraid. The professor candidly confessed. Now, for instance, there's the rabbit hutch and the hall clock. The professor pointed them out. One gets a little confused with them, both having doors, you know. Now... Only yesterday, would you believe it, I put some lettuces into the clock and tried to wind up the rabbit. Did the rabbit go after he wounded it up? said Bruno. The professor clasped his hands on the top of his head and groaned. Go? I should think it did go. Why, it's gone. And wherever it's gone to, that's what I can't find out. I've done my best. I read all the article rabbit in the great dictionary. Come in. Only the tailor, sir, with your little bill, said a meek voice outside the door. Ah, well, I can soon settle his business, the professor said to the children. If you'll just wait a minute. How much is it this year, my man? The tailor had come in while he was speaking. Well, it's been a doubling so many years, you see, 
the tailor replied a little gruffly. And I think I like the money, no. It's two thousand pound, it is. Oh, that's nothing. The professor carelessly remarked, feeling in his pocket as if he always carried at least that amount about with him. But wouldn't you like to wait just another year and make it four thousand? Just think how rich you'd be. Why, you might be a king if you liked. I don't know as I care about being a king, the man said thoughtfully. But it do seem a powerful set of money. Well, I think I'll wait. Of course you will, said the professor. There's a good sense in you, I see. Good day to you, my man. Will you ever have to pay him that four thousand pounds? Sylvie asked as the door closed on the departing creditor. Never, my child, the professor replied emphatically. He'll go on doubling it till he dies. You see, it's always worth while waiting another year to get twice as much money. And now, what would you like to do, my little friends? Shall I take you to see the other professor? This would be an excellent opportunity for a visit. He said to himself, glancing at his watch. He generally takes a short rest of fourteen minutes and a half about this time. Bruno hastily went round to Sylvie, who was standing at the other side of the professor, and put his hand into hers. I think we'd like to go, he said doubtfully. Only please let's go all together. It's best to be on the safe side, you know. Why, you talk as if you were Sylvie, exclaimed the professor. I know I did, Bruno replied very humbly. I quite forgot it I wasn't, Sylvie. Only I thought you might be rather fierce. The professor laughed a jolly laugh. <laughs> Oh, he's quite tame, he said. He never bites. He's only a little, a little dreamy, you know. He took hold of Bruno's other hand and led the children down a long passage I had never noticed before. Not that there was anything remarkable in that. I was constantly coming on new rooms and passages in that mysterious palace, and very seldom succeeded in finding the old ones again. Near the end of the passage, the professor stopped. This is his home, he said, pointing to the solid wall. We can't get in through there, Bruno exclaimed. Sylvie said nothing till she had carefully examined whether the wall opened anywhere. Then she laughed merrily. You're playing us a trick, you dear old thing, she said. There's no door here. There isn't any door to the room, said the professor. We shall have to climb in at the window. So we went into the garden and soon found the window of the other professor's room. It was a ground-floor window and stood invitingly open. The professor first lifted the two children in, and then he and I climbed in after them. The other professor was seated at a table with a large book open before him on which his forehead was resting. He had clasped his arms round the book and was snoring heavily. He usually reads like that, the professor remarked. When the book's very interesting, and then sometimes it's very difficult to get him to attend. This seemed to be one of the difficult times. The professor lifted him up once or twice and shook him violently, but he always returned to his book the moment he was let go of, and showed by his heavy breathing that the book was as interesting as ever. How dreamy he is! the professor exclaimed. He must have got to a very interesting part of the book. And he rained quite a shower of thumps on the other professor's back, shouting, Hoy! Hoy! all the time. Isn't it wonderful that he should be so dreamy? he said to Bruno. If he's always asleep, he is that, Bruno remarked. Of course he's dreamy. But what are we to do? said the professor. You see, he's quite wrapped up in the book. Suppose he shuts the book. Bruno suggested. That's it, cried the delighted professor. Of course, that'll do it. And he shut up the book so quickly that he caught the other professor's nose between the leaves and gave it a severe pinch. The other professor instantly rose to his feet and carried the book away to the end of the room where he put it back in its place in the bookcase. I've been reading for eighteen hours and three quarters, he said. And now I shall rest for fourteen minutes and a half. 
Is the lecture all ready? Very nearly, the professor humbly replied. I shall ask you to give me a hint or two. There will be a few little difficulties. And banquet, I think you said? Oh, yes, the banquet comes first, of course. People never enjoy abstract science, you know, when they are ravenous with hunger. And then there's the fancy dress ball. Oh, there'll be lots of entertainment. Where will the ball come in? said the other professor. I think it had better come at the beginning of the banquet. It brings people together so nicely, you know. Yes, that's the right order. First the meeting, then the eating, then the treating. For I'm sure any lecture you give us will be a treat, said the other professor, who had been standing with his back to us all this time, occupying himself in taking the books out one by one and turning them upside down. An easel with a blackboard on it stood near him, and every time that he turned a book upside down he made a mark on the board with a piece of chalk. And as to the pigtail, which you have so kindly promised to give us, the professor went on, thoughtfully rubbing his chin, I think that had better come at the end of the banquet. Then people can listen to it quietly. Shall I sing it? The other professor asked with a smile of delight. If you can, the professor replied cautiously. Let me try, said the other professor, seating himself at the pianoforte. For the sake of argument, let us assume that it begins on A flat. And he struck the note in question. La, 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 I think that's within an octave of it. He struck the note again and appealed to Bruno, who was standing at his side. Did I sing it like that, my child? No, we did it, Bruno replied with great decision. It was more like a duck. Single notes are apt to have that effect, the other professor said with a sigh. Let me try a whole verse. There was a pig that sat alone beside a ruined pump. By day and night he made his moan. It would have stirred a heart of stone to see him wring his hoofs and groan because he could not jump. Would you call that a tune, professor? he asked when he had finished. The professor considered a little. Well, he said at last, some of the notes are the same as others and some are different, but I should hardly call it a tune. Let me try it a bit by myself, said the other professor, and he began touching the notes here and there and humming to himself like an angry bluebottle. How do you like your singing? the professor asked the children in a low voice. It isn't very beautiful, Sylvie said hesitatingly. It's very extremely ugly, Bruno said without any hesitation at all. All extremes are bad, the professor said very gravely. For instance, sobriety is a very good thing when practiced in moderation, but even sobriety, when carried to an extreme, has its disadvantages. What are its disadvantages was the question that rose in my mind, and, as usual, Bruno asked it for me. What are its lizard bandages? Well, this is one of them, said the professor. When a man's tipsy, that's one extreme, you know, he sees one thing as two. But when he is extremely sober, that's the other extreme, he sees two things as one. It's equally inconvenient, whichever happens. What does ill convenient mean? Bruno whispered to Sylvie. The difference between convenient and inconvenient is best explained by an example, said the other professor, who had overheard the question. If you'll just think over any poem that contains the two words such as... The professor put his hands over his ears with a look of dismay. If you want that to begin a poem, he said to Sylvie, he'll never leave off again. He never does. Did he ever begin a poem and not leave off again? Sylvie inquired. Three times, said the professor. Bruno raised himself on tiptoe till his lips were on a level with Sylvie's ear. What became of him three poems? He whispered. Is he saying them all now? Hush! 
said Sylvie. The other professor is speaking. I say it very quick, murmured the other professor with downcast eyes and melancholy voice, which contrasted oddly with his face as he had forgotten to leave off smiling. At least it wasn't exactly a smile, Sylvie said afterward. It looked as if his mouth was made that shape. Go on, then, said the professor. What must be, must be. Remember that, Sylvie whispered to Bruno. It's a very good rule for whenever you hurt yourself. And it's a very good rule for whenever I make a noise, said the saucy little fellow. So you remember it too, miss? Whatever do you mean? said Sylvie, trying to frown, a thing she never managed particularly well. Oftens and oftens, said Bruno. Avenue told me there mustn't be so much noise, Bruno. When I've told it you, there must. Why, there isn't no rules at all about there mustn't. But who never believes me? As if anyone could believe you, you wicked, wicked boy, said Sylvie. The words were severe enough, but I am of the opinion that when you are really anxious to impress a criminal with a sense of his guilt, you ought not to pronounce the sentence with your lips quite close to his cheek, since a kiss at the end of it, however accidental, weakens the effect terribly. End of chapter 10「Eleven of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11. Peter and Paul. As I was saying, the other professor resumed, if you'll just think over any poem that contains the words such as, uh, Peter is poor, said noble Paul, and I have always been his friend. And though my means to give are small, at least I can afford to lend. How few in this cold age of greed do good except on selfish grounds. But I can feel for Peter's need, and I will lend him fifty pounds. How great was Peter's joy to find his friend in such a genial vein. How cheerfully the bond he signed to pay the money back again we can't said paul be too precise tis best to fix the very day so by a learned friend's advice i made it noon the fourth of may but this is april peter said the first of april as i think five little weeks will soon be fled one scarcely will have time to wink Give me a year to speculate, to buy and sell, to drive a trade, said Paul. I cannot change the date. On May the 4th it must be paid. Well, well, said Peter with a sigh. Hand me the cash and I will go. I'll form a joint stock company and turn an honest pound or so. I'm grieved, said Paul, to see mankind. The money shall, of course, be lent, but for a week or two, I find, it will not be convenient. So week by week poor Peter came, and turned in heaviness away, for still the answer was the same, I cannot manage it today. And now the April showers were dry, the five short weeks were nearly spent, yet still he got the old reply it is not quite convenient the fourth arrived and punctual paul came with his legal friend at noon i thought it best said he to call one cannot settle things too soon poor peter shuddered in despair his flowing locks he wildly tore and very soon his yellow hair was lying all about the floor the legal friend was standing by with sudden pity half unmanned the tear-drops trembled in his eye the signed agreement in his hand but when at length the legal soul resumed its customary force 
the law he said we can't control pay or the law must take its course said paul how bitterly i rue that fatal morning when i called consider peter what you do you won't be richer when you're bald think you by rending curls away to make your difficulties less forbear this violence i pray you do but add to my distress not willingly would i inflict said peter on that noble heart one needless pang yet why so strict is this to act the friendly part however legal it may be to pay what never has been lent this style of business seems to me extremely inconvenient no nobleness of soul have i like some that in this age are found paul blushed in sheer humility and cast his eyes upon the ground this step will simply swallow all and make my life a life of woe nay 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 peter answered paul you must not rail on fortune so you have enough to eat and drink you are respected in the world and at the barber's as i think you often get your whiskers curled though nobleness you can't attain to any very great extent the path of honesty is plain however inconvenient tis true said peter i am alive i keep my station in the world once in the week i just contrive to get my whiskers oiled and curled but my assets are very low my little income's overspent to trench on capital you know is always inconvenient but pay your debts cried honest paul my gentle peter pay your debts what matter if it swallows all that you describe as your assets already you're an hour behind yet generosity is best it pinches me but never mind i will not charge you interest how good how great poor peter cried yet i must sell my sunday wig the scarf pin that has been my pride my grand piano and my pig full soon his property took wings and daily as each treasure went he sighed to find the state of things grow less and less convenient weeks grew to months and months to years peter was worn to skin and bone and once he even said with tears remember paul that promised loan said paul i lend you when i can all the spare money i have got ah peter you're a happy man yours is an enviable lot i'm getting stout as you may see it is but seldom i am well i cannot feel my ancient glee in listening to the dinner bell but you you gamble like a boy your figure is so spare and light the dinner bell's a note of joy to such a healthy appetite said peter i'm well aware mine is a state of happiness and yet how gladly could i spare some of the comforts i possess what you call healthy appetite i feel as hunger's savage tooth and when no dinner is in sight the dinner bell's a sound of ruth no scarecrow would accept this coat such boots as these you seldom see ah paul a single five-pound note would make another man of me said paul it fills me with surprise to hear you talk in such a tone i fear you scarcely realize the blessings that are all your own you're safe from being overfed you're sweetly picturesque in rags you never know the aching head that comes along with money-bags and you have time to cultivate that best of qualities content 
for which you'll find your present state remarkably convenient said peter though i cannot sound the depths of such a man as you yet in your character i found an inconsistency or two you seem to have long years to spare when there's a promise to fulfil and yet how punctual you were in calling with that little bill one can't be too deliberate said paul in parting with one's pelf with bills as you correctly state i'm punctuality itself a man may surely claim his dues but when there's money to be lent a man must be allowed to choose such times as are convenient it chanced one day as peter sat gnawing a crust his usual meal paul bustled in to have a chat and grasped his hand with friendly zeal i knew said he your frugal ways so that i might not wound your pride by bringing strangers into gaze i left my legal friend outside you well remember i'm sure when first your wealth began to go and people sneered at one so poor i never used my peter so and when you'd lost your little all and found yourself a thing despised i need not ask you to recall how tenderly i sympathized then the advice i've poured on you so full of wisdom and of wit all given gratis though it is true i might have fairly charged for it but i refrain from mentioning full many a deed i might relate for boasting is a kind of thing that i particularly hate how vast the total sum appears of all the kindnesses i've done from childhood's half-forgotten years down to that loan of april one that fifty pounds you little guessed how deep it drained my slender store but there's a heart within this breast and i will lend you fifty more not so was peter's mild reply his cheeks all wet with grateful tears no man recalls so well as i your services in bygone years and this new offer i admit is very kindly meant still to avail myself of it would not be quite convenient you'll see in a moment what the difference is between convenient and inconvenient you quite understand it now don't you he added looking kindly at bruno who was sitting at sylvie's side on the floor yes said bruno very quietly such a short speech was very unusual for him but just then he seemed i fancied a little exhausted in fact he climbed up into sylvie's lap as he spoke and rested his head against her shoulder what a many verses it was he whispered End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of Sylvie and Bruno Amusical Gardener。The other professor regarded him with some anxiety. The smaller animal ought to go to bed at once, he said with an air of authority. Why at once? said the professor. Because he can't go it twice, said the other professor. The professor gently clapped his hands. Isn't he wonderful? he said to Sylvie. Nobody else could have thought of the reason so quick. Why? Of course he can't go it twice. It would hurt him to be divided. This remark woke up Bruno suddenly and completely. I don't want to be divided, he said decisively. It does very well on a diagram, said the other professor. I could show it to you in a minute, only the chalk's a little blunt. Take care, 
Sylvie anxiously exclaimed as he began rather clumsily to point it. You'll cut your finger off if you hold the knife so. If you cut it off, will you give it to me, please? Bruno thoughtfully added. It's like this, said the other professor, hastily drawing a long line upon the blackboard and marking the letters A, B at the two ends and C in the middle. Let me explain it to you. If A, B were to be divided into two parts at C. It would be drowned, Bruno pronounced confidently. The other professor gasped. What would be drowned? Why, the bumblebee, of course, said Bruno. And the two bits would sink down into the sea. Here the professor interfered as the other professor was evidently too much puzzled to go on with his diagram. When I said it would hurt him, I was merely referring to the action of the nurse. The other professor brightened up in a moment. The action of nerves, he began eagerly, is curiously slow in some people. I had a friend once that, if you burnt him with a red-hot poker, it would take years and years before he felt it. And if you pinched him? queried Sylvie. Then it would take ever so much longer, of course. In fact, I doubt if the man himself would ever feel it at all. His grandchildren might. I wouldn't like to be the grandchild of a pinched grandfather, would you, Mr. Sir? Bruno whispered. He might just come when he wanted to be happy. That would be awkward, I admitted, taking it quite as a matter of course that he had so suddenly caught sight of me. But don't you always want to be happy, Bruno? Not always, Bruno said thoughtfully. Sometimes, when I's too happy, I wants to be a little miserable. Then I just tell Sylvie about it, you know, and Sylvie sets me some lessons. Then it's all right. I'm sorry you don't like lessons, I said. You should copy Sylvie. She's always as busy as the day is long. Well, so am I, said Bruno. No, no, Sylvie corrected him. You're as busy as the day is short. Well, what's the difference? Bruno asked. Mr. Sir, isn't the day as short as it's long? I mean, isn't it the same length? Never having considered the question in this light, I suggested they had better ask the professor, and they ran off in a moment to appeal to their old friend. The professor left off polishing his spectacles to consider. My dears, he said after a minute, the day is the same length as anything that is the same length as it. And he resumed his never-ending task of polishing. The children returned slowly and thoughtfully to report his answer. Isn't he wise? Sylvie asked in an awestruck whisper. If I was as wise as that, I should have a headache all day long. I know I should. You appear to be talking to somebody that isn't here, the professor said, turning round to the children. Who is it? Bruno looked puzzled. I never talks to anybody when he isn't here, he replied. It isn't good manners. You should always wait till he comes, before you talks to him. The professor looked anxiously in my direction, and seemed to look through and through me without seeing me. Then who are you talking to? He said. There isn't anybody here, you know, except the other professor, and he isn't here. He added wildly, turning round and round like a teetotum. Children, help to look for him. He got, he's got lost again. The children were on their feet in a moment. Where shall we look? said Sylvie. Anywhere, shouted the excited professor. Only be quick about it. And he began trotting round and round the room, lifting up the chairs and shaking them. Bruno took a very small book out of the bookcase, opened it, and shook it in imitation of the professor. He is in here, he said. He can't be there, Bruno, Sylvie said indignantly. Of course he can't, said Bruno. I should have shook him out if he'd been in there. Has he ever been lost before? Sylvie inquired, turning up a corner of the hearth rug and peeping under it. Once before said the professor. He once lost himself in a wood. And couldn't he find himself again? said Bruno. Why didn't he shout? He'd be sure to hear himself. 
because he couldn't be far off, you know. Let's try shouting, said the professor. What shall we shout? said Sylvie. On second thoughts, don't shout, the professor replied. The vice warden might hear you. He's getting awfully strict. This reminded the poor children of all the trouble about which they had come to their old friend. Bruno sat down on the floor and began crying. He is so cruel, he sobbed. I, I, and he lets her go take away all my toys and such horrid meals. What did you have for dinner today? said the professor. A little piece of a dead crow, was Bruno's mournful reply. He means rock pie. Sylvie explained. It were dead crow. Bruno persisted. And there were apple pudding and ate it all. And I got nothing but a crust. And I asked for an orange and, and I didn't get it. And the poor little fellow buried his face in Sylvie's lap, who kept gently stroking his hair as she went on. It's all true, Professor dear. They do treat my darling Bruno very badly. And they're not kind to me either. She added in a lower tone, as if that were a thing of much less importance. The professor got out a large red silk handkerchief and wiped his eyes. I wish I could help you, dear children, he said. But what can I do? We know the way to Fairyland, where father's gone, quite well, said Sylvie. If only the gardener would let us out. Won't he open the door for you? said the professor. Not for us said Sylvie. But I'm sure he would for you. Do come and ask him, Professor dear. I'll come this minute, said the Professor. Bruno sat up and dried his eyes. Is he kind, Mr. Sir? He is indeed, said I. But the Professor took no notice of my remark. He had put on a beautiful cap with a long tassel and was selecting one of the other Professor's walking sticks from a stand in the corner of the room. A thick stick in one's hand makes people respectful, he was saying to himself. Come along, dear children. And we all went out into the garden together. I shall address him first of all, the professor explained as we went along, with a few playful remarks on the weather. I shall then question him about the other professor. This will have a double advantage. First it will open a conversation. You can't even drink a bottle of wine without opening it first. And secondly, if he's seen the other professor, we shall find him that way. And if he hasn't, we shan't. On our way, we passed the target which Ugug had been made to shoot during the ambassador's visit. See? said the professor, pointing out a hole in the middle of the bull's eye. His imperial fatness had only one shot at it, and he went in just here. Bruno carefully examined the hole. Couldn't go in there. He whispered to me. He are too fat. We had no sort of difficulty in finding the gardener. Though he was hidden from us by some trees, that harsh voice of his served to direct us, and as we drew nearer, the words of his song became more and more plainly audible. He thought he saw an albatross that fluttered round the lamp. He looked again and found it was a penny postage stamp. You must be getting home, he said. The nights are very damp. Would it be afraid of catching cold? said Bruno. If it got very damp, Sylvie suggested. It might stick to something, you know. And that something would have to go by the post, whatever it was. Bruno eagerly exclaimed. Suppose it was a cow. Wouldn't it be dreadful for the other things? And all these things happen to him, said the professor. That's what makes the song so interesting. He must have had a very curious knife, said Sylvie. <laughs> you may say that, the professor heartily rejoined. Of course she may, cried Bruno. By this time we had come up to the gardener, who was standing on one leg as usual, and busily employed in watering a bed of flowers with an empty watering can. It hasn't got no water in it, Bruno explained to him, pulling his sleeve to attract his attention. It's lighter to hold, said the gardener. A lot of water in it makes one's arms ache. And he went on with his work, singing softly to himself. 
the nights are very damp. In digging things out of the ground, which you probably do now and then, the professor began in a loud voice, in making things into heaps, which no doubt you often do, and in kicking things about with one heel, which you seem never to leave off doing, have you ever happened to notice another professor, something like me, but different? Never! shouted the gardener so loudly and violently that we all drew back in alarm. There ain't such a thing. We will try a less exciting topic, the professor mildly remarked to the children. You were asking? We asked him to let us through the garden door, said Sylvie. But he wouldn't, but perhaps he would for you. The professor put in the request very humbly and courteously. I wouldn't mind letting you out, said the gardener. But I mustn't open the door for children. Do you think I'd disobey the rules? Not for one and sixpence. The professor cautiously produced a couple of shillings. That'll do it, the gardener shouted as he hurled the watering can across the flower bed and produced a handful of keys, one large one and a number of small ones. But look here, Professor dear, whispered Sylvie. He needn't open the door for us at all. We can go out with you. To dear child, the professor thankfully replied as he replaced the coins in his pocket. That saves two shillings. And he took the children's hands that they might all go out together when the door was opened. This, however, did not seem a very likely event, though the gardener patiently tried all the small keys over and over again. At last, the professor ventured on a gentle suggestion. Why not try the large one? I have often observed that the door unlocks much more nicely with its own key. The very first trial of the large key proved a success. The gardener opened the door and held out his hand for the money. The professor shook his head. You are acting by rule. He explained. In opening the door for me, and now it's open, we are going out by rule. The rule of three. The gardener looked puzzled and let us go out, but as he locked the door behind us, we heard him singing thoughtfully to himself. He thought he saw a garden door that opened with the key. He looked again and found it was a double rule of three. And all its mystery, he said, is clear as day to me. I shall now return, said the professor, when we had walked a few yards. You see, it's impossible to read here, for all my books are in the house. But the children still kept fast hold of his hands. Do come with us, Sylvie entreated with tears in her eyes. Well, well, said the good-natured old man. Perhaps I'll come after you some day soon, but I must go back now. You see, I left off at a comma, and it's so awkward not knowing how the sentence finishes. Besides, you've got to go through Dogland first, and I'm always a little nervous about dogs but it'll be quite easy to come as soon as I've completed my new invention, for carrying oneself, you know. It wants just a little more working out. Won't that be very tiring to carry yourself? Sylvie inquired. Well, no, my child. You see, whatever fatigue one incurs by carrying, one saves by being carried. Goodbye, dears. Goodbye, sir. He added to my intense surprise, giving my hand an affectionate squeeze. "'Good-bye, Professor,' I replied, but my voice sounded strange and far away, and the children took not the slightest notice of our farewell. Evidently they neither saw me nor heard me, as with their arms lovingly twined round each other, they marched boldly on. End of chapter 12《ハッピーバースデー》の Bruno by Lewis Carroll。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 13 A Visit to Dogland。There's a house away there to the left, said Sylvie, after we had walked what seemed to me about fifty miles. Let's go and ask for a night's lodging. It looks a very comfortable home, 
Bruno said, as we turned into the road leading up to it. I do hope the dogs will be kind to us, or you're so tired and hungry. A mastiff, dressed in a scarlet collar and carrying a musket, was pacing up and down like a sentinel in front of the entrance. He started on catching sight of the children, and came forwards to meet them, keeping his musket pointed straight at Bruno, who stood quite still, though he turned pale and kept tight hold of Sylvie's hand, while the sentinel walked solemnly round and round them, and looked at them from all points of view. He growled at last. He asked Bruno severely. Of course, Bruno understood all this easily enough. All fairies understand doggy, that is, dog language, but as you may find it a little difficult just at first, I had better put it into English for you. Humans, I verily believe. A couple of stray humans. What dog do you belong to? What do you want? We don't belong to a dog, Bruno began in doggy. People never belong to dogs, he whispered to Sylvie. But Sylvie hastily checked him for fear of hurting the Mastiff's feelings. Please, we want a little food and a night's lodging, if there's room in the house, she added timidly. Sylvie spoke doggy very prettily, but I think it's almost better for you to give the conversation in English. The house indeed, growled the sentinel. Have you never seen a palace in your life? Come along with me. His Majesty must settle what's to be done with you. They followed him through the entrance hall, down a long passage, and into a magnificent saloon, around which were grouped dogs of all sorts and sizes. Two splendid bloodhounds were solemnly sitting up, one on each side of the crown-bearer. Two or three bulldogs, whom I guessed to be the bodyguard of the king, were waiting in grim silence. In fact, the only voices at all plainly audible were those of two little dogs, who had mounted a settee and were holding a lively discussion that looked very like a quarrel. Lords and ladies in waiting, and various court officials, our guide gruffly remarked as he led us in. Of me, the courtiers took no notice whatever, but Sylvie and Bruno were the subject of many inquisitive looks, and many whispered remarks, of which I only distinctly caught one, made by a sly-looking dachshund to his friend. She's not such a bad-looking human, is she? Leaving the new arrivals in the centre of the saloon, the sentinel advanced to a door, at the further end of it which bore an inscription painted on it in doggy, Royal Kennel Scratch and Yell. Before doing this, the sentinel turned to the children and said, Give me your names. We'd rather not, Bruno exclaimed, pulling Sylvie away from the door. We want them ourselves. Come back, Sylvie, come quick. Nonsense, said Sylvie very decidedly, and gave their names in doggy. Then the sentinel scratched violently at the door and gave a yell that made Bruno shiver from head to foot. Oh, yeah, what? said a deep voice inside. That's doggy for come in. It's the king himself, the mastiff whispered in an awestruck tone. Take off your wigs and lay them humbly at his paws. What we should call at his feet. Sylvie was just going to explain very politely that really they couldn't perform that ceremony, because their wigs wouldn't come off, when the door of the royal kennel opened, and an enormous Newfoundland dog put his head out. Bow, wow, was his first question. When his majesty speaks to you, the sentinel hastily whispered to Bruno, you should prick up your ears. Bruno looked doubtfully at Sylvie. I'd rather not, please, he said. It would hurt. It doesn't hurt a bit, the sentinel said with some indignation. Look, it's like this. And he pricked up his ears like two railway signals. Sylvie gently explained matters. I'm afraid we can't manage it, she said in a low voice. I'm very sorry, but our ears haven't got the right... 
She wanted to say machinery in doggy, but she had forgotten the word and could only think of steam engine. The sentinel repeated Sylvie's explanation to the king. Can't pick up their ears without a steam engine, his majesty exclaimed. They must be curious creatures. I must have a look at them. And he came out of his kennel and walked solemnly up to the children. What was the amazement, nor to say the horror of the whole assembly, when Sylvie actually patted his majesty on the head, while Bruno seized his long ears and pretended to tie them together under his chin? The sentinel groaned aloud. A beautiful greyhound, who appeared to be one of the ladies-in-waiting, fainted away, and all the other courtiers hastily drew back and left plenty of room for the huge Newfoundland to spring upon the audacious strangers and tear them limb from limb. Only he didn't. On the contrary, his majesty actually smiled, so far as a dog can smile, and the other dogs couldn't believe their eyes, but it was true all the same. His majesty wagged his tail. Yeah. Ho, ha, ho. That is, well, I never, was the universal cry. His Majesty looked round him severely and gave a slight growl which produced instant silence. Mm. Conduct my friends to the banqueting hall, he said, laying such an emphasis on my friends that several of the dogs rolled over helplessly on their backs and began to lick Bruno's feet. A procession was formed, but I only ventured to follow as far as the door of the banqueting hall, so furious was the uproar of barking dogs within. So I sat down by the king, who seemed to have gone to sleep, and waited till the children returned to say good night, when his majesty got up and shook himself. "'Time for bed.' He said with a sleepy yawn. "'The attendants will show you to your room,' he added aside to Sylvie and Bruno. "'Bring lights.' And with a dignified air he held out his paw for them to kiss. But the children were evidently not well practised in court manners. Sylvie simply stroked the great paw, Bruno hugged it. The master of the ceremonies looked shocked. All this time, dog-waiters in splendid livery were running up with lighted candles, but as fast as they put them upon the table, other waiters ran away with them, so that there never seemed to be one for me, though the master kept nudging me with his elbow and repeating, "'I can't let you sleep here. You're not in bed, you know.' I made a great effort, and just succeeded in getting out the words, "'I know I'm not.' I'm in an armchair. Well, forty winks will do you no harm, the master said, and left me. I could scarcely hear his words, and no wonder, he was leaning over the side of a ship that was miles away from the pier on which I stood. The ship passed over the horizon, and I sank back into the armchair. The next thing I remember is that it was morning, breakfast was just over, Sylvie was lifting Bruno down from a high chair and saying to a spaniel, who was regarding them with a most benevolent smile, "'Yes, thank you. We've had a very nice breakfast. Haven't we, Bruno?' "'There was too many bones in the... Bruno began, but Sylvie frowned at him and laid her finger on her lips, for at this moment the travellers were waited on by a very dignified officer, the head growler, whose duty it was first to conduct them to the king— to bid him farewell, and then to escort them to the boundary of Dogland. The great Newfoundland received them most affably, but instead of saying good-bye, he startled the head growler into giving three savage growls by announcing that he would escort them himself. "'It is a most unusual proceeding, your majesty,' the head growler exclaimed, almost choking with vexation at being set aside, for he had put on his best court suit, made entirely of cat skins, for the occasion. "'I shall escort them myself,' his majesty repeated, gently but firmly, laying aside the royal robes and changing his crown for a small cornet. 
and you may stay at home. I am glad, Bruno whispered to Sylvie when they had got well out of hearing. He was so welly cross. And he not only patted their royal escort, but even hugged him round the neck in the exuberance of his delight. His majesty calmly wagged the royal tail. It's quite a relief, he said. Getting away from that palace now and then, royal dogs have a dull life of it, I can tell you. Uh, would you mind? This to Sylvie in a low voice and looking a little shy and embarrassed. Would you mind the trouble of just throwing that stick for me to fetch? Sylvie was too much astonished to do anything for a moment. It sounded such a monstrous impossibility that a king should wish to run after a stick. But Bruno was equal to the occasion, and with a glad shout of, Hi then, fetch it, good doggy," he hurled it over a clump of bushes. The next moment the monarch of Dogland had bounded over the bushes and picked up the stick, and came galloping back to the children with it in his mouth. Bruno took it from him with great decision. "'Beg for it?' he insisted, and his majesty begged. "'Paw!' commanded Sylvie, and his majesty gave his paw. In short, the solemn ceremony of escorting the travellers to the boundary of Dogland became one long uproarious game of play. "'But business is business,' the Dog King said at last. "'And I must go back to mine. I couldn't come any further,' he added, consulting a dog watch which hung on a chain round his neck. "'Not even if there were a cat in sight.' They took an affectionate farewell of his majesty and trudged on. "'That were a dear dog!' Bruno exclaimed. "'As we to go for, Sylvie, I's tired.' "'Not much farther, darling,' Sylvie gently replied. "'Do you see that shining? Just beyond those trees? I'm almost sure it's the gate of Fairyland. I know it's all golden. Father told me so, and so bright, so bright!' She went on dreamily. "'It dazzles,' said Bruno, shading his eyes with one little hand, while the other clung tightly to Sylvie's hand, as if he were half alarmed at her strange manner. For the child moved on as if walking in her sleep, her large eyes gazing into the far distance, and her breath coming and going in quick pantings of eager delight. I knew by some mysterious mental light that a great change was taking place in my sweet little friend, for such I loved to think her, and that she was passing from the condition of a mere outland sprite into the true fairy nature. Upon Bruno the change came later, but it was completed in both before they reached the golden gate, through which I knew it would be impossible for me to follow. I could but stand outside and take a last look at the two sweet children ere they disappeared within, and the golden gate closed with a bang. And with such a bang! It will never shut like any other cupboard door, Arthur explained. There's something wrong with the hinge. However, here's the cake and wine, and you've had your forty winks, so you really must get off to bed, old man. You're fit for nothing else. Witness my hand, Arthur Forrester, M.D. By this time I was wide awake again. Not quite yet, I pleaded. Really, I'm not sleepy now, and it isn't midnight yet. Well, I did want to say another word to you. Arthur replied in a relenting tone as he supplied me with the supper he had prescribed. Only I thought you were too sleepy for it tonight. We took our midnight meal almost in silence for an unusual nervousness seemed to have seized on my old friend. "'What kind of night is it?' he asked, rising and undrawing the window curtains, apparently to change the subject for a minute. I followed him to the window, and we stood together looking out in silence. "'When I first spoke to you about—' Arthur began, after a long and embarrassing silence. "'That is, when we first talked about her—' "'for I think it was you that introduced the subject. 
My own position in life forbade me to do more than worship her from a distance, and I was turning over plans for leaving this place finally and settling somewhere out of all chance of meeting her again. That seemed to be my only chance of usefulness in life. Would that have been wise, I said, to leave yourself no hope at all? There was no hope to leave. Arthur firmly replied, though his eyes glittered with tears as he gazed upwards into the midnight sky, from which one solitary star, the glorious Vega, blazed out in fitful splendour through the driving clouds. She was like that star to me, bright, beautiful and pure, but out of reach, out of reach. He drew the curtains again, and we returned to our places by the fireside. What I wanted to tell you was this. He resumed. I heard this evening from my solicitor. I can't go into the details of the business, but the upshot is that my worldly wealth is much more than I thought. I am, or soon shall be, in a position to offer marriage, without imprudence, to any lady, even if she brought nothing. I doubt if there would be anything on her side. The Earl is poor, I believe, but I should have enough for both, even if health failed. I wish you all happiness in your married life, I cried. Shall you speak to the Earl tomorrow? Not yet a while, said Arthur. He is very friendly, but I dare not think he means more than that as yet. And as for, as for Lady Muriel, try as I may, I cannot read her feelings towards me. If there is love, she is hiding it. No, I must wait. I must wait. I did not like to press any further advice on my friend, whose judgment I felt was so much more sober and thoughtful than my own, and we parted without more words on the subject that had now absorbed his thoughts, nay, his very life. The next morning a letter from my solicitor arrived, summoning me to town on important business. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. • Chapter Fourteen Fairy Sylvie. For a full month, the business for which I had returned to London detained me there, and even then it was only the urgent advice of my physician that induced me to leave it unfinished and pay another visit to Elveston. Arthur had written once or twice during the month, but in none of his letters was there any mention of Lady Muriel. Still, I did not augur ill from his silence. To me it looked like the natural action of a lover who, even while his heart was singing, She is mine, would fear to paint his happiness in the cold phrases of a written letter, but would wait to tell it by word of mouth. Yes, I thought, I am to hear his song of triumph from his own lips. The night I arrived we had much to say on other matters, and tired with the journey I went to bed early, leaving the happy secret still untold. Next day, however, as we chatted on over the remains of luncheon, I ventured to put the momentous question. "'Well, old friend, you have told me nothing of Lady Muriel, nor when the happy day is to be.' "'The happy day,' Arthur said, looking unexpectedly grave, "'is yet in the dim future.' We need to know, or rather, she needs to know me better. I know her sweet nature thoroughly by this time, but I dare not speak till I am sure that my love is returned. Don't wait too long, I said gaily. Faint heart never won, fair lady. It is faint heart, perhaps, but really I dare not speak just yet. But meanwhile, I pleaded, you are running a risk that perhaps you have not thought of. Some other man— no, said Arthur firmly. She is heart whole, I am sure of that. Yet if she loves another better than me, so be it. I will not spoil her happiness. The secret shall die with me, but she is my first and my only love. That is all very beautiful sentiment, I said, but it is not practical. It is not like you. He either fears his fate too much or his desert is small who dares not put it to the touch, to win or lose it all? I dare not ask the question whether there is another, he said passionately. It would break my heart to know it. Yet is it wise to leave it unasked? You must not waste your life upon an if. 
I tell you, I dare not. May I find it out for you? I asked with the freedom of an old friend. No, no. He replied with a pained look. I entreat you to say nothing. Let it wait. As you please, I said, and judged it best to say no more just then. But this evening, I thought, I will call on the earl. I may be able to see how the land lies without so much as saying a word. It was a very hot afternoon, too hot to go for a walk or do anything, or else it wouldn't have happened, I believe. In the first place, I want to know, dear child who reads this, why fairies should always be teaching us to do our duty and lecturing us when we go wrong, and we should never teach them anything. You can't mean to say that fairies are never greedy or selfish or cross or deceitful, because that would be nonsense, you know. Well, then, don't you think they might be all the better for a little lecturing and punishing now and then? I really don't see why it shouldn't be tried, and I'm almost sure that if you could only catch a fairy and put it in the corner and give it nothing but bread and water for a day or two, you'd find it quite an improved character. It would take down its conceit a little, at all events. The next question is, what is the best time for seeing fairies? I believe I can tell you all about that. The first rule is that it must be a very hot day. That we may consider as settled. And you must be just a little sleepy, but not too sleepy to keep your eyes open, mind. Well, and you ought to feel a little what one may call fairyish. The Scotch call it eerie, and perhaps that's a prettier word. If you don't know what it means, I'm afraid I can hardly explain it. You must wait till you meet a fairy, and then you'll know. And the last rule is that the crickets should not be chirping. I can't stop to explain that. You must take it on trust for the present. So if all these things happen together, you have a good chance of seeing a fairy, or at least a much better chance than if they didn't. The first thing I noticed as I went lazily along through an open place in the wood was a large beetle lying struggling on its back, and I went down upon one knee to help the poor thing to its feet again. In some things, you know, you can't be quite sure what an insect would like. For instance, I never could quite settle, supposing I were a moth, whether I would rather be kept out of the candle, or be allowed to fly straight in and get burnt, or, again, supposing I were a spider, I am not sure if I should be quite pleased to have my web torn down and the fly let loose, but I feel quite certain that if I were a beetle and had rolled over on my back, I should always be glad to be helped up again. So, as I was saying, I had gone down upon one knee, and was just reaching out a little stick to turn the beetle over, when I saw a sight that made me draw back hastily and hold my breath, for fear of making any noise and frightening the little creature away. Not that she looked as if she would be easily frightened. She seemed so good and gentle that I'm sure she would never expect that anyone could wish to hurt her. She was only a few inches high and was dressed in green, so that you really would hardly have noticed her among the long grass. And she was so delicate and graceful that she quite seemed to belong to the place, almost as if she were one of the flowers. I may tell you, besides, that she had no wings. I don't believe in fairies with wings. And that she had quantities of long brown hair and large earnest brown eyes. And then I shall have done all I can to give you an idea of her. Sylvie. I found out her name afterwards, had knelt down, just as I was doing, to help the beetle, but it needed more than a little stick for her to get it on its legs again. It was as much as she could do with both arms to roll the heavy thing over, and all the while she was talking to it, half scolding and half comforting, as a nurse might do with a child that had fallen down. "'There, there, you needn't cry so much about it. You're not killed yet.' though if you were you couldn't cry you know and so it's a general rule against crying my dear and how did you come to tumble over but i can see well enough how it was i needn't ask you that walking over sandpits with your chin in the air as usual of course if you go among sandpits like that you must expect to tumble you should look the beetle murmured something that sounded like i did look and sylvie went on again but i know you didn't you never do you always walk with your chin up you're so dreadfully conceited well, let's see how many legs are broken this time. Why, none of them, I declare. And what's the good of having six legs, my dear, if you can only kick them all about in the air when you tumble? Legs are meant to walk with, you know. Now don't begin putting out your wings yet. I've more to say. Go to the frog that lives behind that buttercup. 
Give him my compliments. Sylvie's compliments. Can you say compliments? The beetle tried, and I suppose succeeded. Yes, that's right. And tell him he's to give you some of that salve I left with him yesterday, and you'd better get him to rub it in for you. He's got rather cold hands, but you mustn't mind that. I think the beetle must have shuddered at this idea, for Sylvie went on in a graver tone. Now you needn't pretend to be so particular as all that, as if you were too grand to be rubbed by a frog. The fact is, you ought to be very much obliged to him. Suppose you could get nobody but a toad to do it. How would you like that? There was a little pause, and then Sylvie added, Now you may go. Be a good beetle, and don't keep your chin in the air. And then began one of those performances of humming and whizzing and restless banging about, such as a beetle indulges in when it has decided on flying, but hasn't quite made up its mind which way to go. At last, in one of its awkward zigzags, it managed to fly right into my face, and by the time I had recovered from the shock, the little fairy was gone. I looked about in all directions for the little creature, but there was no trace of her, and my eerie feeling was quite gone off, and the crickets were chirping again merrily, so I knew she was really gone. And now I've got time to tell you the rule about the crickets. They always leave off chirping when a fairy goes by, because a fairy is a kind of queen over them. I suppose, at all events, it's a much grander thing than a cricket, so whenever you're walking out and the crickets suddenly leave off chirping, you may be sure that they see a fairy. I walked on sadly enough, you may be sure. However, I comforted myself with thinking, it's been a very wonderful afternoon so far. I'll just go quietly on and look about me, and I shouldn't wonder if I were to come across another fairy somewhere. Peering about in this way, I happened to notice a plant with rounded leaves and with queer little holes cut in the middle of several of them. "'Ah, the leaf-cutter bee,' I carelessly remarked. "'You know I am very learned in natural history. For instance, I can always tell kittens from chickens at one glance.' And I was passing on when a sudden thought made me stoop down and examine the leaves. Then a little thrill of delight ran through me, for I noticed that the holes were all arranged so as to form letters. There were three leaves side by side, with B, R, and U marked on them, and after some search I found two more which contained an N and an O. And then, all in a moment, a flash of inner light seemed to illuminate a part of my life that had all but faded into oblivion, the strange visions I had experienced during my journey to Elveston, and with a thrill of delight I thought, those visions are destined to be linked with my waking life. By this time the eerie feeling had come back again, and I suddenly observed that no crickets were chirping, so I felt quite sure that Bruno was somewhere very near. And so indeed he was, so near that I had very nearly walked over him without seeing him, which would have been dreadful, always supposing that fairies can be walked over. My own belief is that they are something of the nature of will-o'-the-wisps, and there's no walking over them. Think of any pretty little boy you know, with rosy cheeks, large dark eyes, and tangled brown hair, and then fancy him made small enough to go comfortably into a coffee-cup, and you'll have a very fair idea of him. "'What's your name, little one?' I began, in as soft a voice as I could manage. And, by the way, why is it we always begin by asking little children their names? Is it because we fancy a name will help to make them a little bigger? You never thought of asking a really large man his name, now did you? But, however that may be, I felt it quite necessary to know his name. So, as he didn't answer my question, I asked it again a little louder. "'What's your name, my little man?' "'What's yours?' he said, without looking up. I told him my name, quite gently, for he was much too small to be angry with. "'Duke of anything?' he asked, just looking at me for a moment, and then going on with his work. "'Not Duke at all,' I said, a little ashamed of having to confess it. "'Or big enough to be two dukes,' said the little creature. "'I suppose or so something, then?' "'No,' I said, feeling more and more ashamed. I haven't got any title. The fairy seemed to think that in that case I really wasn't worth the trouble of talking to, for he quietly went on digging and tearing the flowers to pieces. After a few minutes I tried again. Please tell me what your name is. 
Reno, the little fellow answered very readily. Why didn't you say please before? That's something like what we used to be taught in the nursery, I thought to myself, looking back through the long years, about a hundred of them since you asked the question, to the time when I was a little child, and here an idea came into my head, and I asked him, Aren't you one of the fairies that teach children to be good? Well, we have to do that sometimes, said Bruno. And a dreadful bother it is. As he said this, he savagely tore a heartsease in two and trampled on the pieces. What are you doing there, Bruno? I said. Spoiling Sylvie's garden, was all the answer Bruno would give at first, but as he went on tearing up the flowers, he muttered to himself, The nasty cross thing wouldn't let me go and play this morning. Said I must finish my lessons first. Lessons indeed. I'll vex her finally, though. Oh, Bruno, you shouldn't do that. I cried. Don't you know that's revenge? And revenge is a wicked, cruel, dangerous thing. River Edge? said Bruno. What a funny word. I suppose oo would call it cruel and dangerous, cause if oo went a too far and tumbled in, oo'd get drowned. No, not River Edge, I explained. Revenge, saying the word very slowly, but I couldn't help thinking that Bruno's explanation did very well for either word. Oh, said Bruno, opening his eyes very wide, but without trying to repeat the word. Come, try and pronounce it, Bruno, I said cheerfully. Revenge, revenge. But Bruno only tossed his little head and said he couldn't, that his mouth wasn't the right shape for words of that kind, and the more I laughed, the more sulky the little fellow got about it. "'Well, never mind, my little man,' I said. "'Shall I help you with that job?' "'Yes, please,' Bruno said, quite pacified. "'Only I wish I could think of something to vex her more than this. "'You don't know how hard it is to make her angry.' "'Now listen to me, Bruno, and I'll teach you quite a splendid kind of revenge.' "'Something that'll vex her finely?' he asked with gleaming eyes. Something that will vex her finely. First, we'll get up all the weeds in her garden. See, there are a good many at this end, quite hiding the flowers. But that won't vex her, said Bruno. After that, I said without noticing the remark, we'll water this highest bed up here. You see, it's getting quite dry and dusty. Bruno looked at me inquisitively, but he said nothing this time. Then, after that, I went on, the walks want sweeping a bit, and I think you might cut down that tall nettle. It's so close to the garden that it's quite in the way. What is you talking about? Bruno impatiently interrupted me. All that won't vex her a bit. Won't it? I said innocently. Then, after that, suppose we put in some of these colored pebbles, just to mark the divisions between the different kinds of flowers, you know. That'll have a very pretty effect. Bruno turned round and had another good stare at me. At last there came an odd little twinkle into his eyes, and he said, with quite a new meaning in his voice, That'll do nicely. Let's put them in rows. All the red together, and all the blue together. That'll do capitally, I said. And then... What kind of flowers does Sylvie like best? Bruno had to put his thumb in his mouth and consider a little before he could answer. Violets, he said at last. There's a beautiful bed of violets down by the brook. Oh, let's fetch em, cried Bruno, giving a little skip into the air. Here, catch hold of my hand and I'll help you along. The grass is rather thick down that way. I couldn't help laughing at his having so entirely forgotten what a big creature he was talking to. No, not yet, Bruno, I said. We must consider what's the right thing to do first. You see, we've got quite a business before us. Yes, let's consider, said Bruno, putting his thumb into his mouth again and sitting down upon a dead mouse. What do you keep the mouse for, I said. You should either bury it or else throw it into the brook. Why, it's to measure with, cried Bruno. How ever would oo do a garden without one? We make each bed three mouses and a half long and two mouses wide. 
I stopped him as he was dragging it off by the tail to show me how it was used, for I was half afraid the eerie feeling might go off before we had finished the garden, and in that case I should see no more of him or Sylvie. I think the best way will be for you to weed the beds while I sort out these pebbles ready to mark the walks with. That's it, cried Bruno. And I'll tell you about the caterpillars while we work. Ah, let's hear about the caterpillars, I said, as I drew the pebbles together into a heap and began dividing them into colors. And Bruno went on in a low, rapid tone, more as if he were talking to himself. Yesterday I saw two little caterpillars when I was sitting by the brook, just where you go into the wood. They were quite green, and they had yellow eyes, and they didn't see me. And one of them had got a moth's wing to carry. A great brown moth's wing, you know, all dry with feathers. So he couldn't want it to eat, I should think. Perhaps he meant to make a cloak for the winter? Perhaps, I said, for Bruno had twisted up the last word into a sort of question, and was looking at me for an answer. One word was quite enough for the little fellow, and he went on merrily. Well, and so he didn't want the other caterpillar to see the moss wing, you know. So what must he do but try to carry it with all his left legs? And he tried to walk on the other set. Of course he toppled over after that. After what? I said, catching at the last word, for to tell the truth, I hadn't been attending much. He toppled over. Bruno repeated very gravely. And if you ever saw a caterpillar topple over... You'd know it's a really serious thing, and not sit grinning like that. And I shan't tell you no more. Indeed, and indeed, Bruno, I didn't mean to grin. See, I'm quite grave again now. But Bruno only folded his arms and said, Don't tell me. I see a little twinkle in one of your eyes, just like the moon. Why do you think I'm like the moon, Bruno? I asked. Your face is large and round like the moon. Bruno answered, looking at me thoughtfully. It doesn't shine quite so bright, but it's more cleaner. I couldn't help smiling at this. You know, I sometimes wash my face, Bruno. The moon never does that. Oh, doesn't she, though? cried Bruno, and he leant forwards and added in a solemn whisper. The moon's face gets dirty and dirtier every night, till it's black all across, and then when it's dirty all over, so... He passed his hand across his own rosy cheeks as he spoke. Then she washes it. Then it's all clean again, isn't it? Not all in a moment, said Bruno. What a deal of teaching you once. She washes it little by little. Only she begins at the other edge, you know. By this time he was sitting quietly on the dead mouse with his arms folded and the weeding wasn't getting on a bit, so I had to say... Work first, pleasure afterwards. No more talking till that bed's finished. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15. Bruno's Revenge After that we had a few minutes of silence while I sorted out the pebbles and amused myself with watching Bruno's plan of gardening. It was quite a new plan to me. He always measured each bed before he weeded it, as if he was afraid the weeding would make it shrink, and once, when it came out longer than he wished, he set to work to thump the mouse with his little fists, crying out, there now, it's all gone wrong again. Why don't you keep your tail straight when I tell you? I'll tell you what I'll do, Bruno said in a half whisper as we worked. You like fairies, don't you? Yes, I said, of course I do, or I shouldn't have come here. I should have gone to some place where there are no fairies. Bruno laughed contemptuously. Why, you might as well say, who go to some place where there wasn't any air, supposing you didn't like air. This was a rather difficult idea to grasp. I tried a change of subject. You're nearly the first fairy I ever saw. Have you ever seen any people besides me? Plenty, said Bruno. We see him when we walk in the road. 
But they can't see you. How is it they never tread on you? Can't tread on us, said Bruno, looking amused at my ignorance. Why, suppose you're walking here, so... Making little marks on the ground. And suppose there's a fairy, that's me, walking here. Well then, who put one foot here and one foot here, so who doesn't tread on the fairy? This was all very well as an explanation, but it didn't convince me. Why shouldn't I put one foot on the fairy? I asked. I don't know why, the little fellow said in a thoughtful tone. But I know he wouldn't. Nobody never walked on top of the fairy. Now, I'll tell you what I'll do, as you are so fond of fairies. I'll get you an invitation to the fairy king's dinner party. I know one of the head waiters. I couldn't help laughing at this idea. Do the waiters invite the guests? I asked. Oh, not to sit down, Bruno said. But to wait at table. Who'd like that, wouldn't you? To hand out plates and so on. Well, but that's not so nice as sitting at the table, is it? Of course it isn't, Bruno said in a tone as if he rather pitied my ignorance. But if you're not even sir anything, you can't expect to be allowed to sit at a table, you know. I said as meekly as I could that I didn't expect it, but it was the only way of going to a dinner party that I really enjoyed. And Bruno tossed his head and said in a rather offended tone that I might do as I pleased. There were many he knew that would give their ears to go. Have you ever been yourself, Bruno? They invited me once last week, Bruno said very gravely. It was to wash up the soup plates. No, the cheese plates, I mean. That was grand enough. And I waited at a table. And I didn't hardly make only one mistake. What was it? I said. You needn't mind telling me. Only bringing scissors to cut the beef with, Bruno said carelessly. But the grandest thing of all was I fetched the king a glass of cider. That was grand, I said, biting my lip to keep myself from laughing. Was it? it? said Bruno very earnestly. You know, it isn't everyone that's had such an honour as that. This set me thinking of the various queer things we call an honour in this world, but which, after all, haven't a bit more honour in them than what Bruno enjoyed when he took the king a glass of cider. I don't know how long I might not have dreamed on in this way if Bruno hadn't suddenly roused me. Oh, come here quick! He cried in a state of the wildest excitement. Catch hold of this other horn. I can't hold him more than a minute. He was struggling desperately with a great snail clinging to one of its horns and nearly breaking his poor little back in his efforts to drag it over a blade of grass. I saw we should have no more of gardening if I let this sort of thing go on, so I quietly took the snail away and put it on a bank where he couldn't reach it. We'll hunt it afterwards, Bruno, I said, if you really want to catch it. But what's the use of it when you've got it? What's the use of a fox when you've got it? said Bruno. I know you big things aren't foxes. I tried to think of some good reason why big things should hunt foxes and he should not hunt snails, but none came into my head, so I said at last, Well, I suppose one's as good as the other. I'll go snail hunting myself some day. I should think you wouldn't be so silly, said Bruno. As to go snail hunting by yourself, why, you'd never get the snail along if you hadn't somebody to hold on to his other horn. Of course I shan't go alone, I said quite gravely. By the way, is that the best kind to hunt, or do you recommend the ones without shells? Oh no, we never hunt the ones without the shells, Bruno said with a little shudder at the thought of it. They're always so cross about it, and then if you tumbles over them, they're ever so sticky. By this time we had nearly finished the garden. I had fetched some violets, and Bruno was just helping me to put in the last when he suddenly stopped and said, I'm tired. Rest then, I said. I can go on without you quite well. Bruno needed no second invitation. He at once began arranging the dead mouse as a kind of sofa. Oh, and I'll sing you a little song, 
he said, as he rolled it about. Do, said I. I like songs very much. Which song will you choose? Bruno said as he dragged the mouse into a place where he could get a good view of me. Ting, ting, ting is the nicest. There was no resisting such a strong hint as this. However, I pretended to think about it for a moment, and then said, Well, I like ting, ting, ting best of all. That shows a good judge of music, Bruno said with a pleased look. Uh, how many air bells would you like? And he put his thumb into his mouth to help me to consider. As there was only one cluster of harebells within easy reach, I said very gravely that I thought one would do this time, and I picked it and gave it to him. Bruno ran his hand once or twice up and down the flowers like a musician trying an instrument, producing a most delicious, delicate tinkling as he did so. I had never heard flower music before. I don't think one can unless one's in the eerie state. And I don't know quite how to give you an idea of what it was like except by saying that it sounded like a peal of bells a thousand miles off. When he had satisfied himself that the flowers were in tune, he seated himself on the dead mouse, he never seemed really comfortable anywhere else, and looking up at me with a merry twinkle in his eyes, he began. By the way, the tune was rather a curious one, and you might like to try it for yourself, so here are the notes. Rise, arise, the daylight dies, the owls are hooting, ting, ting, ting. Wake, awake, beside the lake, the elves are fluting, ting, ting, ting. Welcoming our fairy king, we sing, sing, sing. He sang the first four lines briskly and merrily, making the harebells chime in time with the music but the last two he sang quite slowly and gently, and merely waved the flowers backward and forwards. Then he left off to explain. The fairy king is Oberon, and he lives across the lake, and sometimes he comes in a little boat, and we go and meet him, and then we sing this song, you know. And then you go and dine with him, I said mischievously. You shouldn't talk like that, Bruno hastily said. It interrupts the song so. I said I wouldn't do it again. I never talk myself when I'm singing, he went on very gravely. So who shouldn't either? Then he tuned the harebells once more and sang. Ero here from far and near, the music stealing ting, ting, ting. Fairy belts are down the dells and merrily pealing ting, ting, ting. Welcoming our fairy king, we ring, ring, ring. See, oh, see on every tree, what lambs are shining, ting, ting, ting. There are eyes of fiery flies to light our dining, ting, ting, ting. Welcoming our fairy king, we swing, swing, swing. Haste, oh, haste, to taste and taste the dainty's waiting, ting, ting, ting. Honey, do is stood. Hush, Bruno, I interrupted in a warning whisper. She's coming. Bruno checked his song, and as she slowly made her way through the long grass, he suddenly rushed out headlong at her like a little bull, shouting. Look the other way, look the other way. Which way? Sylvie asked in rather a frightened tone as she looked round in all directions to see where the danger could be. That way said Bruno, carefully turning her round with her face to the wood. Now walk backwards, walk gently, don't be frightened, you shan't trip. But Sylvie did trip notwithstanding. In fact, he led her, in his hurry, across so many little sticks and stones that it was really a wonder the poor child could keep on her feet at all. But he was far too much excited to think of what he was doing. I silently pointed out to Bruno the best place to lead her to so as to get a view of the whole garden at once. It was a little rising ground about the height of a potato, and when they had mounted it, I drew back into the shade that Sylvie mightn't see me. I heard Bruno cry out triumphantly, Now we may look! And then followed a clapping of hands, but it was all done by Bruno himself. Sylvie was silent. She only stood and gazed with her hands clasped together, and I was half afraid she didn't like it after all. 
Bruno, too, was watching her anxiously, and when she jumped down off the mound and began wandering up and down the little walks, he cautiously followed her about, evidently anxious that she should form her own opinion of it all, without any hint from him. And when at last she drew a long breath and gave her verdict, in a hurried whisper and without the slightest regard to grammar, "'It's the loveliest thing as I never saw in all my life before!' The little fellow looked as well pleased as if it had been given by all the judges and juries in England put together. "'And did you really do it all by yourself, Bruno?' said Sylvie. "'And all for me?' "'I was helped a bit,' Bruno began with a merry little laugh at her surprise. "'We've been at it all afternoon. I thought you'd like—' And here the poor little fellow's lip began to quiver, and all in a moment he burst out crying— and running up to Sylvie, he flung his arms passionately round her neck and hid his face on her shoulder. There was a little quiver in Sylvie's voice, too, as she whispered, "'Why, what's the matter, darling?' and tried to lift up his head and kiss him. But Bruno only clung to her sobbing and wouldn't be comforted till he had confessed. "'I, I tried to spoil you, Garden, first, but I'll never, never—' <laughs> And then came another burst of tears which drowned the rest of the sentence. At last he got out the words, I, I liked putting in the flowers. For who, oh, Sylvie? And never was I so happy before. And the rosy little face came up at last to be kissed, all wet with tears as it was. Sylvie was crying too by this time, and she said nothing but, Bruno, dear. And, I never was so happy before though why these two children who had never been so happy before should both be crying was a mystery to me i felt very happy too but of course i didn't cry big things never do you know we leave all that to the fairies only i think it must have been raining a little just then for i found a drop or two on my cheeks after that they went through the whole garden again flower by flower as if it were a long sentence they were spelling out with kisses for commas and a great hug by way of a full stop when they got to the end. "'Does you know? That was my river edge, Sylvie,' Bruno solemnly began. Sylvie laughed merrily. "'What do you mean?' she said, and she pushed back her heavy brown hair with both hands, and looked at him with dancing eyes in which the big teardrops were still glittering. Bruno drew in a long breath and made up his mouth for a great effort. "'I, I mean revenge.' he said. Now you understand. And he looked so happy and proud at having said the word right at last, that I quite envied him. I rather think Sylvie didn't undertand at all, but she gave him a little kiss on each cheek, which seemed to do just as well. So they wandered off lovingly together, in among the buttercups, each with an arm twined round the other, whispering and laughing as they went, and never so much as once looked back at poor me. Yes, once, just before I quite lost sight of them, Bruno half turned his head and nodded me a saucy little good-bye over one shoulder. And that was all the thanks I got for my trouble. The very last thing I saw of them was this. Sylvie was stooping down with her arms round Bruno's neck and saying coaxingly in his ear, Do you know, Bruno, I've quite forgotten that hard word. Do say it once more. Come, only this once, dear. But Bruno wouldn't try it again. End of chapter 15《Chapter 16 of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 16 A Changed Crocodile. The Marvelous the mysterious had quite passed out of my life for the moment, and the commonplace reigned supreme. I turned in the direction of the earl's house, as it was now the witching hour of five, and I knew I should find them ready for a cup of tea and a quiet chat. Lady Muriel and her father gave me a delightfully warm welcome. They were not of the folk we meet in fashionable drawing-rooms who conceal all such feelings as they may chance to possess— beneath the impenetrable mask of a conventional placidity the man with the iron mask was no doubt a rarity and a marvel in his own age 
In modern London no one would turn his head to give him a second look. No, these were real people. When they looked pleased, it meant that they were pleased, and when Lady Muriel said with a bright smile, "'I'm very glad to see you again,' I knew that it was true. Still, I did not venture to disobey the injunctions, crazy as I felt them to be, of the lovesick young doctor, by so much as alluding to his existence, and it was only after they had given me full details of a projected picnic to which they invited me that Lady Muriel exclaimed, almost as an afterthought, "'And do, if you can, bring Dr. Forrester with you. I'm sure a day in the country would do him good. I'm afraid he studies too much.' It was on the tip of my tongue, to quote the words, his only books are woman's looks, but I checked myself just in time, with something of the feeling of one who has crossed a street, and has been all but run over by a passing hansom. And I think he has too lonely a life. She went on, with a gentle earnestness that left no room whatever to suspect a double meaning. Do get him to come, and don't forget the day, Tuesday week. We can drive you over. It would be a pity to go by rail. There is so much pretty scenery on the road, and our open carriage just holds four. Oh, I'll persuade him to come, I said with confidence, thinking. It would take all my powers of persuasion to keep him away. The picnic was to take place in ten days, and though Arthur readily accepted the invitation I brought him, nothing that I could say would induce him to call, either with me or without me, on the earl and his daughter in the meanwhile. No, he feared to wear out his welcome, he said. They had seen enough of him for one while, and, when at last the day for the expedition arrived, he was so childishly nervous and uneasy that I thought it best so to arrange our plans that we should go separately to the house, my intention being to arrive some time after him, so as to give him time to get over a meeting. With this object, I purposely made a considerable circuit on my way to the hall, as we called the earl's house, and if I could only manage to lose my way a bit, I thought to myself, that would suit me capitally. In this I succeeded, better and sooner than I had ventured to hope for. The path through the wood had been made familiar to me by many a solitary stroll in my former visit to Elveston, and how I could have so suddenly and so entirely lost it, even though I was so engrossed in thinking of Arthur and his lady-love, that I heeded little else, was a mystery to me. And this open place, I said to myself, seems to have some memory about it that I cannot distinctly recall. Surely it is the very spot where I saw those fairy children. But I hope there are no snakes about, I mused aloud, taking my seat on a fallen tree. I certainly do not like snakes, and I don't suppose Bruno likes them either. No, he doesn't like them said a demure little voice at my side. He's not afraid of them, you know, but he doesn't like them. He says they're too waggly. Words fail me to describe the beauty of the little group, couched on a patch of moss on the trunk of the fallen tree that met my eager gaze, Sylvie reclining with her elbow buried in the moss and her rosy cheek resting in the palm of her hand, and Bruno stretched at her feet with his head in her lap. Too waggly? was all I could say in so sudden an emergency. I'm not particular, Bruno said carelessly. But I do like stray animals best. But you like a dog when it wags its tail, Sylvie interrupted. You know you do, Bruno. But there's more of a dog, isn't there, Mr. Sir? Bruno appealed to me. Who would like to have a dog if it hadn't got a nothing but a head and a tail? I admitted that a dog of that kind would be uninteresting. There isn't such a dog as that, Sylvie thoughtfully remarked. But there would be, cried Bruno, if the professor shortened it up for us. Shortened it up, I said. That's something new. How does he do it? He's got a curious machine, Sylvie was beginning to explain. A welly curious machine. Bruno broke in, not at all willing to have the story thus taken out of his mouth. And if he puts in something of it at the end, you know, and he turns the handle, and it comes out at the other end, oh, ever so short. As short as short, Sylvie echoed. 
And one day, when he was in Outland, you know, before we came to Fairyland, me and Sylvie took him a big crocodile, and he shortened it up for us. And it did look so funny, and it kept looking round and saying, Wherever is the rest of me got to? And then its eyes looked unhappy. Not both its eyes, Sylvie interrupted. Course not, said the little fellow. Only the eye that couldn't see wherever the rest of it had got to. But the eye that could see wherever. How short was the crocodile? I asked, as the story was getting a little complicated. Half as short again, as when we caught it. So long, said Bruno, stretching out his arms to their full stretch. I tried to calculate what this would come to, but it was too hard for me. Please make it out for me, dear child, who reads this. But you didn't leave the poor thing so short as that, did you? Well, no. Sylvie and me took it back again, and we got it stretched to... To how much was it, Sylvie? Two times and a half, and a little bit more, said Sylvie. It wouldn't like that better than the other way, I'm afraid. Oh, but it did, though. Bruno put in eagerly. It was so proud of its new tail. Oh, never saw a crocodile so proud. Why, it would go round and walk on the top of its tail and along its back all the way to its head. Not quite all the way, said Sylvie. It couldn't, you know. Ah, oh, but it did once, Bruno cried triumphantly. It weren't looking, but I watched it, and it walked on tippy-toe so as it wouldn't wake itself, cause it thought it were asleep, and it got both its paws on its tail, and it walked and it walked all the way along the back, and it walked and it walked on its forehead, and it walked a tiny little way down its nose. There now. This was a good deal worse than the last puzzle. Please, dear child, help again. I don't believe no crocodile never walked along its own forehead. Sylvie cried, too much excited by the controversy to limit the number of her negatives. You don't know the reason why it did it, Bruno scornfully retorted. It had a welly good reason. I heard it say, why shouldn't I walk on my own forehead? So of course it did, you know. If that's a good reason, Bruno, I said, why shouldn't you get up that tree? Shall we in a minute, said Bruno. Sooner we've done talking, only two peoples can't talk comfortably together when one's getting up a tree and the other isn't. It appeared to me that a conversation would scarcely be comfortable while trees were being climbed, even if both the peoples were doing it. But it was evidently dangerous to oppose any theory of Bruno's, so I thought it best to let the question drop and to ask for an account of the machine that made things longer. This time Bruno was at a loss and left it to Sylvie. It's like a mangle, she said. If things are put in, they get squoze. Squeezled, Bruno interrupted. Yes. Sylvie accepted the correction, but did not attempt to pronounce the word, which was evidently new to her. They get like that, and they come out oh ever so long. Once, Bruno began again. Sylvie and me righted. Wrote, Sylvie whispered. Well, we wrote it a nursery song, and the professor mangled it longer for us. And it were, there was a little man, and he had a little gun, and the bullets. I know the rest, I interrupted. But would you say it long? I mean the way that it came out of the mangle? We'll get the professor to sing it for you, said Sylvie. It would spoil it to say it. I would like to meet the professor, I said, and I would like to take you all with me to see some friends of mine that live near here. Would you like to come? I don't think the professor would like to come, said Sylvie. He's very shy, but we like it very much, only we'd better not come this size, you know. The difficulty had occurred to me already, and I had felt that perhaps there would be a slight awkwardness in introducing two such tiny friends into society. "'What size will you be?' I inquired. "'We better come as common children,' Sylvie thoughtfully replied. "'That's the easiest size to manage.' "'Could you come today?' I said, thinking, "'then we could have you at the picnic.' 
Sylvie considered a little. Not today, she replied. We haven't got the things ready. We'll come on Tuesday next, if you like. And now, really, Bruno, you must come and do your lessons. I wish you wouldn't say really, Bruno, the little fellow pleaded, with pouting lips that made him look prettier than ever. It always shows there's something horrid coming, and I won't kiss you if you're so unkind. Ah, but you have kissed me, Sylvie exclaimed in merry triumph. Well, then I'll unkiss you. And he threw his arms round her neck for this novel, but apparently not very painful operation. It's very like kissing, Sylvie remarked, as soon as her lips were again free for speech. You don't know nothing about it. It were just the conquery. Bruno replied with much severity as he marched away. Sylvie turned her laughing face to me. Shall we come on Tuesday? She said. Very well, I said. Let it be Tuesday next. But where is the professor? Did he come with you to Fairyland? No, said Sylvie. But he promised he'd come and see us some day. He's getting his lecture ready, so he has to stay at home. At home, I said dreamily, not feeling quite sure what she had said. Yes, sir. His lordship and Lady Muriel are at home. Please to walk this way. End of chapter sixteen. Chapter Seventeen of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Seventeen: The Three Badgers. Still more dreamily, I found myself following this imperious voice into a room where the Earl, his daughter, and Arthur were seated. So you're come at last said lady muriel in a tone of playful reproach i was delayed i stammered though what it was that had delayed me i should have been puzzled to explain luckily no questions were asked the carriage was ordered round the hamper containing our contribution to the picnic was duly stowed away and we set forth there was no need for me to maintain the conversation lady muriel and arthur were evidently on those most delightful of terms where one has no need to check thought after thought as it rises to the lips with the fear this will not be appreciated this will give offence this will sound too serious this will sound flippant like very old friends in fullest sympathy their talk rippled on why shouldn't we desert the picnic and go in some other direction she suddenly suggested a party of four is surely self-sufficing and as for food our hamper why shouldn't we? What a genuine lady's argument! laughed Arthur. A lady never knows on which side the onus probandi, the burden of proving, lies. Do men always know? she asked with a pretty assumption of meek docility. With one exception, the only one I can think of, Dr. Watts, who has asked the senseless question, Why should I deprive my neighbour of his goods against his will? Fancy that as an argument for honesty. His position seems to be, I'm only honest because I see no reason to steal. And the thief's answer is, of course, complete and crushing. I deprive my neighbour of his goods because I want them myself, and I do it against his will because there's no chance of getting him to consent to it. I can give you one other exception, I said. An argument I heard only today, and not by a lady. Why shouldn't I walk on my own forehead? What a curious subject for speculation, said Lady Muriel, turning to me with eyes brimming over with laughter. May we know who propounded the question? And did he walk on his own forehead? I can't remember who it was that said it, I faltered, nor where I heard it. Whoever it was, I hope we shall meet him at the picnic, said Lady Muriel. It's a far more interesting question, then. Isn't this a picturesque ruin? Aren't those autumn tints lovely? I shall have to answer those two questions ten times at least this afternoon. That's one of the miseries of society, said Arthur. Why can't people let one enjoy the beauties of nature without having to say so every minute? Why should life be one long catechism? 
it's just as bad as at a picture gallery the earl remarked i went to the r a last may with a conceited young artist and he did torment me i wouldn't have minded his criticising the pictures himself but i had to agree with him or else to argue the point which would have been worse it was depreciatory criticism of course said arthur i don't see the of course at all why did you ever know a conceited man dare to praise a picture the one thing he dreads next to not being noticed is to be proved fallible if you once praise a picture your character for infallibility hangs by a thread suppose it's a figure picture and you venture to say draws well somebody measures it and finds one of the proportions an eighth of an inch wrong you are disposed of as a critic did you say he draws well your friends inquire sarcastically while you hang your head and blush no the only safe course if anyone says draws well is to shrug your shoulders draws well you repeat thoughtfully draws well hmm that's the way to become a great critic thus airily chatting after a pleasant drive through a few miles of beautiful scenery we reached the rendezvous a ruined castle where the rest of the picnic party were already assembled we spent an hour or two in sauntering about the ruins gathering at last by common consent into a few random groups seated on the side of a mound which commanded a good view of the old castle and its surroundings the momentary silence that ensued was promptly taken possession of or more correctly taken into custody by a voice a voice so smooth so monotonous so sonorous that one felt with a shudder that any other conversation was precluded and that unless some desperate remedy were adopted we were fated to listen to a lecture of which no man could foresee the end the speaker was a broadly built man whose large flat pale face was bounded on the north by a fringe of hair on the east and west by a fringe of whisker and on the south by a fringe of beard the whole constituting a uniform halo of stubbly whitey brown bristles his features were so entirely destitute of expression that i could not help saying to myself helplessly as if in the clutches of a nightmare they are only pencilled in no final touches as yet and he had a way of ending every sentence with a sudden smile which spread like a ripple over that vast blank surface and was gone in a moment leaving behind it such absolute solemnity that i felt impelled to murmur it was not he it was somebody else that smiled do you observe such was the phrase with which the wretch began each sentence do you observe the way in which that broken arch at the very top of the ruin stands out against the clear sky it is placed exactly right and there is exactly enough of it a little more or a little less and all would be utterly spoilt oh gifted architect murmured arthur inaudibly to all but lady muriel and myself foreseeing the exact effect his work would have when in ruins centuries after his death and do you observe where those trees slip down the hill indicating them with a sweep of the hand and with all the patronizing air of the man who has himself arranged the landscape how the mists rising from the river fill up exactly those intervals where we need indistinctness for artistic effect here in the foreground a few clear touches are not amiss but a background without miss you know it is simply barbarous yes we need indistinctness the orator looked so pointedly at me as he uttered these words that i felt bound to reply by murmuring something to the effect that i hardly felt the need myself and that i enjoyed looking at a thing better when i could see it quite so the great man sharply took me up from your point of view that is correctly put but for any one who has a soul for art such a view is preposterous nature is one thing art is another nature shows us the world as it is 
but art as a latin author tells us art you know the words have escaped my memory ars est salari naturam arthur interposed with a delightful promptitude quite so the orator replied with an air of relief i thank you ars est salari naturam but that isn't it and for a few peaceful moments the orator brooded frowningly over the quotation the welcome opportunity was seized and another voice struck into the silence what a lovely old ruin it is cried a young lady in spectacles the very embodiment of the march of mind looking at lady muriel as the proper recipient of all really original remarks and don't you admire those autumn tints on the trees i do intensely lady muriel shot a meaning glance at me but replied with admirable gravity oh yes indeed indeed so true and isn't strange said the young lady passing with startling suddenness from sentiment to science that the mere impact of certain coloured rays upon the retina should give us such exquisite pleasure you have studied physiology then a certain young doctor courteously inquired oh yes isn't it the sweet science arthur slightly smiled it seems a paradox does it not he went on that the image formed on the retina should be inverted it is puzzling she candidly admitted why is it we do not see things upside down you have never heard the theory then that the brain also is inverted no indeed what a beautiful fact but how is it proved thus replied arthur with all the gravity of ten professors rolled into one what we call the vertex of the brain is really its base and what we call its base is really its vertex it is simply a question of nomenclature this last polysyllable settled the matter how truly delightful the fair scientist exclaimed with enthusiasm i shall ask our physiological lecturer why he never gave us that exquisite theory i'd give something to be present when the question is asked arthur whispered to me as at a signal from lady muriel we moved on to where the hampers had been collected and devoted ourselves to the more substantial business of the day we waited on ourselves as the modern barbarism containing two good things in such a way as to secure the discomforts of both and the advantages of neither of having a picnic with servants to wait upon you had not yet reached this out-of-the-way region and of course the gentlemen did not even take their places until the ladies had been duly provided with all imaginable creature comforts then i supplied myself with a plate of something solid and a glass of something fluid and found a place next to lady muriel it had been left vacant apparently for arthur as a distinguished stranger but he had turned shy and had placed himself next to the young lady in spectacles whose high rasping voice had already cast loose upon society such an ominous phrase as man is a bundle of qualities the objective is only attainable through the subjective arthur was bearing it bravely but several faces wore a look of alarm and i thought it high time to start some less metaphysical topic in my nursery days i began when the weather didn't suit for an out-of-doors picnic we were allowed to have a peculiar kind that we enjoyed hugely the tablecloth was laid under the table instead of upon it we sat round it on the floor and i believe we really enjoyed that extremely uncomfortable kind of dinner more than we ever did the orthodox arrangement i've no doubt of it lady muriel replied there's nothing a well-regulated child hates so much as regularity i believe a really healthy boy would thoroughly enjoy greek grammar if only he might stand on his head to learn it and your carpet dinner certainly spared you one feature of a picnic which to me is its chief drawback the chance of a shower i suggested no the chance or rather the certainty of live things occurring in combination with one's food spiders are my bugbear now my father has no sympathy with that sentiment have you dear for the earl had caught the word and turned to listen to each his sufferings all are men 
he replied in the sweet, sad tones that seemed natural to him. Each has his pet aversion. But you'll never guess his, Lady Muriel said with that delicate, silvery laugh that was music to my ears. I declined to attempt the impossible. He doesn't like snakes, she said in a stage whisper. Now, isn't that an unreasonable aversion? Fancy not liking such a dear, coaxingly, clingingly affectionate creature as a snake. Not like snakes, I exclaimed. Is such a thing possible? No, he doesn't like them, she repeated with a pretty mock gravity. He's not afraid of them, you know, but he doesn't like them. He says they're too waggly. I was more startled than I liked to show. There was something so uncanny in this echo of the very words I had so lately heard from that little forest sprite, that it was only by a great effort I succeeded in saying carelessly, Let us banish so unpleasant a topic. Won't you sing us something, Lady Muriel? I know you do sing without music. The only songs I know, without music, are desperately sentimental, I'm afraid. Are your tears all ready? Quite ready, quite ready came from all sides, and Lady Muriel, not being one of those lady singers who think it de rigueur to decline to sing until they have been petitioned three or four times, and have pleaded failure of memory, loss of voice, and other conclusive reasons for silence, began at once. There be three badgers on a mossy stone beside a dark and covered way. Each dreams himself a monarch on his throne, and so they stay and stay. Though their whole father languishes alone, they stay and stay and stay. There be three herrings loitering around, longing to share that mossy seat. Each herring tries to sing what she has found that makes life seem so sweet. Thus with a greeting and uncertain sound they bleat and bleat and bleat. The mother herring on the salt sea waves sought vainly for her absent ones. The father badger writhing in a cave shrieked out, return my sons. You shall have buns, he shrieked, if you'll behave, ye buns and buns and buns. I fear, said she, her sons have gone astray. My daughter's left me while I slept. Yes, the badger said, is as you say, they should be better kept. Thus the poor parents took the time away and wept and wept and wept. Here Bruno broke off suddenly. The herring song wants another tune, Sylvie, he said. And I can't sing it not without who plays it for me. Instantly, Sylvie seated herself upon a tiny mushroom that happened to grow in front of a daisy, as if it were the most ordinary musical instrument in the world, and played on the petals as if they were the notes of an organ. And such delicious tiny music it was, such teeny tiny music. Bruno held his head on one side and listened very gravely for a few moments until he had caught the melody. Then the sweet childish voice rang out once more. Oh dear, beyond our dearest dreams, fair as in all that fairest seems, to be so rosy as a way, to revel in a round a lay. How blessed would it be, a life so free! If we're just pudding to consume, and drink the sight tall as a goom. And if in other days and hours, mid other fluffs and other flowers, the choice were given me how to dine, name what thou wilt, if this shall mine. Oh, then I see the life for me, it were just pudding to consume. And drink the subtle as a goom. You may leave off playing now, Sylvie. I can do the other tune much better without a compliment. He means without accompaniment. Sylvie whispered, smiling at my puzzled look, and she pretended to shut up the stops of the organ. The badgers did not care to talk to the fish. 
They did not dote on herring songs. They never had experience a dish to which that name belongs. And ooh, to pinch their tails, this was their wish. With tongs, yea, tongs and tongs. I ought to mention that he marked the parentheses in the air with his finger. It seemed to me a very good plan. You know there's no sound to represent it, any more than there is for a question. Suppose you have said to your friend, you are better today, and that you want him to understand that you are asking him a question. What can be simpler than just to make a question mark in the air with your finger? He would understand you in a moment. And are these not the fish the eldest sight, whose mother dwells beneath the foam? They are the fish, the second one replied, and they have left their home. O oh, wicked fish, the youngest badger cried, to roam, yea, roam and roam. Gently the badgers trotted to the shore, the sandy shore that fringed the bay. Each in his mouth a living herring ball, those aged ones waxed gay. Clearing their voices through the ocean's roar, hooray, hooray, hooray. So they all got safe home again, Bruno said, after waiting a minute to see if I had anything to say. He evidently felt that some remark ought to be made, and I couldn't help wishing there were some such rule in society at the conclusion of a song that the singer herself should say the right thing and not leave it to the audience. Suppose a young lady has just been warbling, with a grating and uncertain sound, Shelley's exquisite lyric, I arise from dreams of thee, how much nicer it would be, instead of your having to say, oh, thank you, thank you, for the young lady herself to remark as she draws on her gloves, while the impassioned words, oh, press it to thine own, or it will break at last, are still ringing in your ears. But she wouldn't do it, you know, so it did break at last. And I knew it would, she added quietly as I started at the sudden crash of broken glass. You've been holding it sideways for the last minute and letting all the champagne run out. Were you asleep, I wonder? I'm so sorry my singing has such a narcotic effect. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 18. Queer Street, Number 40. Lady Muriel was the speaker, and for the moment that was the only fact I could clearly realize. But how she came to be there, and how I came to be there, and how the glass of champagne came to be there. All these were questions which I felt it better to think out in silence and not commit myself to any statement till I understood things a little more clearly. First accumulate a mass of facts, and then construct a theory. That, I believe, is the true scientific method. I sat up, rubbed my eyes, and began to accumulate facts. A smooth grassy slope, bounded at the upper end by venerable ruins half buried in ivy, at the lower by a stream seen through arching trees. A dozen gaily dressed people seated in little groups here and there, some open hampers, the debris of a picnic, such were the facts accumulated by the scientific researcher. And now what deep far-reaching theory was he to construct from them? The researcher found himself at fault. Yet stay. One fact had escaped his notice. While all the rest were grouped in twos and in threes, Arthur was alone. While all tongues were talking, his was silent. While all faces were gay, his was gloomy and despondent. Here was a fact indeed. The researcher felt that a theory must be constructed without delay. Lady Muriel had just risen and left the party. Could that be the cause of his despondency? The theory hardly rose to the dignity of a working hypothesis. Clearly more facts were needed. The researcher looked round him once more, and now the facts accumulated in such bewildering profusion that the theory was lost among them. For Lady Muriel had gone to meet a strange gentleman just visible in the distance, 
and now she was returning with him, both of them talking eagerly and joyfully like old friends who have been long parted, and now she was moving from group to group, introducing the new hero of the hour, and he, young, tall, and handsome, moved gracefully at her side with the erect bearing and the firm tread of a soldier. Verily, the theory looked gloomy for Arthur. His eye caught mine, and he crossed to me. He is very handsome, I said. Abominably handsome, muttered Arthur, then smiled at his own bitter words. Lucky no one heard me but you. Dr. Forrester, said Lady Muriel, who had just joined us. Let me introduce you to my cousin Eric Linden. Captain Linden, I should say. Arthur shook off his ill-temper instantly and completely as he rose and gave the young soldier his hand. I have heard of you he said. I am very glad to make the acquaintance of Lady Muriel's cousin. Yes, that's all I'm distinguished for as yet, said Eric, so we soon got to call him, with a winning smile. And I doubt, glancing at Lady Muriel, if it even amounts to a good conduct batch, but it's something to begin with. You must come to my father, Eric, said Lady Muriel. I think he's wandering among the ruins. And the pair moved on. The gloomy look returned to Arthur's face, and I could see it was only to distract his thoughts that he took his place at the side of the metaphysical young lady and resumed their interrupted discussion. Talking of Herbert Spencer, he began, Do you really find no logical difficulty in regarding nature as a process of involution? passing from definite coherent homogeneity to indefinite incoherent heterogeneity. Amused as I was at the ingenious jumble he had made of Spencer's words, I kept as grave a face as I could. No physical difficulty, she confidently replied. But I haven't studied logic much. Would you state the difficulty? Well, said Arthur, do you accept it as self-evident? Is it as obvious, for instance, as that things that are greater than the same are greater than one another? To my mind, she modestly replied, it seems quite as obvious. I grasp both truths by intuition, but other minds may need some logical... I forget the technical terms. For a complete logical argument, Arthur began with admirable solemnity, we need two prim misses. Of course, she interrupted. I remember that word now, and they produce... A delusion, said Arthur. Yes, she said dubiously. I don't seem to remember that so well. But what is the whole argument called? A syllogism? Ah, uh, yes, I remember now. But I don't need a syllogism, you know, to prove that mathematical axiom you mentioned. Nor to prove that all angles are equal, I suppose? Why, of course not. One takes such a simple truth as that for granted. Here I ventured to interpose and to offer her a plate of strawberries and cream. I felt really uneasy at the thought that she might detect the trick, and I contrived, unperceived by her, to shake my head reprovingly at the pseudo-philosopher. Equally unperceived by her, Arthur slightly raised his shoulders and spread his hands abroad, as who should say, what else can I say to her, and moved away, leaving her to discuss her strawberries by involution, or any other way she preferred. By this time, the carriages that were to convey the revellers to their respective homes had begun to assemble outside the castle grounds, and it became evident, now that Lady Muriel's cousin had joined our party, that the problem, how to convey five people to Elveston with a carriage that would only hold four, must somehow be solved. The Honourable Eric Linden, who was at this moment walking up and down with Lady Muriel, might have solved it at once, no doubt, by announcing his intention of returning on foot. Of this solution there did not seem to be the very smallest probability. The next best solution, it seemed to me, was that I should walk home, and this I at once proposed. You're sure you don't mind? said the Earl. I'm afraid the carriage won't take us all, and I don't like to suggest to Eric to desert his cousin so soon, 
So far from minding it, I said, I should prefer it. It will give me time to sketch this beautiful old ruin. I'll keep you company, Arthur suddenly said, and in answer to what I suppose was a look of surprise on my face, he said in a low voice, I really would rather. I shall be quite de trop in the carriage. I think I'll walk too, said the earl. You'll have to be content with Eric as your escort. He added to Lady Muriel, who had joined us while he was speaking. You must be as entertaining as Cerberus. Three gentlemen rolled into one. Lady Muriel said to her companion. It will be a grand military exploit. A sort of fallen hope, the captain modestly suggested. You do pay pretty compliments, laughed his fair cousin. Good day to you, gentlemen three. Or rather, deserters three. And the two young folk entered the carriage and were driven away. How long will your sketch take? said Arthur. Well, I said, I should like an hour for it. Don't you think you had better go without me? I'll return by train. I know there's one in about an hour's time. Perhaps that would be best, said the Earl. The station is quite close. So I was left to my own devices, and soon found a comfortable seat at the foot of a tree from which I had a good view of the ruins. It is a very drowsy day, I said to myself, idly turning over the leaves of the sketchbook to find a blank page. Why, I thought you were a mile off by this time, for to my surprise the two walkers were back again. I came back to remind you, Arthur said, that the trains go every ten minutes. Nonsense, I said. It isn't the Metropolitan Railway. It is the Metropolitan Railway, the Earl insisted. This is a part of Kensington. Why do you talk with your eyes shut? said Arthur. Wake up! I think it's the heat makes me so drowsy, I said, hoping but not feeling quite sure that I was talking sense. Am I awake now? I think not the earl judiciously pronounced. What do you think, doctor? He's only got one eye open. And he's snoring like anything, cried Bruno. Do wake up, you dear old thing. And he and Sylvie set to work rolling the heavy head from side to side, as if its connection with the shoulders was a matter of no sort of importance. And at last the professor opened his eyes and sat up blinking at us with eyes of utter bewilderment. "'Would you have the kindness to mention?' he said, addressing me with his usual old-fashioned courtesy. "'Whereabouts we are just now, and who we are, beginning with me?' I thought it best to begin with the children. "'This is Sylvie, sir, and this is Bruno.' "'Ah, yes, I know them well enough,' the old man murmured. "'It's myself I'm most anxious about, and perhaps you'll be good enough to mention at the same time how I got here.' A harder problem occurs to me, I ventured to say, and that is how you're to get back again. True, true, the professor replied. That's the problem, no doubt. Viewed as a problem outside of oneself, it's a most interesting one. Viewed as a portion of one's own biography, it is, I must admit, very distressing. He groaned, but instantly added with a chuckle. As to myself... I think you mentioned that I am... Ooh, the professor! Bruno shouted in his ear. Didn't you know that? Ooh, come from Outland. And it's ever so far away from here. The professor leapt to his feet with the agility of a boy. Then there's no time to lose. He exclaimed anxiously. I'll just ask this guileless peasant with his brace of buckets that contain apparently water... If he'll be so kind as to direct us. Guileless peasant, he proceeded in a louder voice. Would you tell us the way to Outland? The guileless peasant turned with a sheepish grin. Eh? Was all he said. The way to Outland, the professor repeated. The guileless peasant set down his buckets and considered. I don't know. I ought to mention... The professor hastily put in, That whatever you say will be used in evidence against you. The guileless peasant instantly resumed his buckets. 
Then I says note. He answered briskly and walked away at a great pace. The children gazed sadly at the rapidly vanishing figure. He goes very quick, the professor said with a sigh. But I know that was the right thing to say. I've studied your English laws. However, let's ask this next man that's coming. He's not guileless and he is not a peasant, but I don't know that either point is of vital importance. It was, in fact, the Honourable Eric Linden who had apparently fulfilled his task of escorting Lady Muriel home, and was now strolling leisurely up and down the road outside the house, enjoying a solitary cigar. Might I trouble you, sir, to tell us the nearest way to Outlands? Oddity as he was in outward appearance, the professor was, in that essential nature which no outward disguise could conceal, a thorough gentleman and as such Eric Linden accepted him instantly. He took the cigar from his mouth and delicately shook off the ash while he considered. The name sounds strange to me, he said. I doubt if I can help you. It's not very far from Fairyland, the professor suggested. Eric Linden's eyebrows were slightly raised at these words, and an amused smile, which he courteously tried to repress, flitted across his handsome face. A trifle cracked, he muttered to himself. But what a jolly old patriarch it is! Then he turned to the children. And can't you help him, little folk? He said with a gentleness of tone that seemed to win their hearts at once. Surely you know all about it. How many miles to Babylon? Three score miles and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes. And back again. To my surprise, Bruno ran forwards to him as if he were some old friend of theirs, seized the disengaged hand, and hung on to it with both of his own. And there stood this tall, dignified officer in the middle of the road, gravely swinging a little boy to and fro, while Sylvie stood ready to push him, exactly as if a real swing had suddenly been provided for their pastime. We don't want to get to Babylon, you know, Bruno explained as he swung. And it isn't candlelight, it's daylight. Sylvie added, giving the swing a push of extra vigour, which nearly took the whole machine off its balance. By this time it was clear to me that Eric Linden was quite unconscious of my presence. Even the professor and the children seemed to have lost sight of me, and I stood in the midst of the group as unconcernedly as a ghost, seeing but unseen. How perfectly I soak her this. The professor exclaimed with enthusiasm. He had his watch in his hand and was carefully counting Bruno's oscillations. He measures time quite as accurately as a pendulum. Yet even pendulums, the good-natured young soldier observed as he carefully released his hand from Bruno's grasp, are not a joy for ever. Come, that's enough for one bout, little man. Next time we meet, you shall have another. Meanwhile, you'd better take this old gentleman to Queer Street. Number... We'll find it, cried Bruno eagerly as they dragged the professor away. We are mostly indebted to you, the professor said, looking over his shoulder. Don't mention it, replied the officer, raising his hat as a parting salute. What number did you say? The professor called from the distance. The officer made a trumpet of his two hands. Forty! He shouted in stentorian tones. In that piano, by any means, he added to himself. It's a mad world, my master, it's a mad world. He lit another cigar and strolled on towards his hotel. What a lovely evening, I said, joining him as he passed me. Lovely indeed, he said. Where did you come from? Draft from the clouds. I'm strolling your way, I said, and no further explanation seemed necessary. Have a cigar? Thanks, I'm not a smoker. Is your lunatic asylum near here? Not that I know of. Though there might be. Met a lunatic just now, queer old fish as ever I saw. And so, in friendly chat, we took our homeward ways and wished each other good night at the door of his hotel. Left to myself, I felt the eerie feeling rush over me again, and saw, standing at the door of number forty, three figures I knew so well. Then it's the wrong house, Bruno was saying. 
No, no, it's the right house, the professor cheerfully replied. But it's the wrong street. That's where we've made our mistake. Our best plan now will be to... It was over, the street was empty, commonplace life was around me, and the eerie feeling had fled. End of chapter 18《Chapter Nineteen of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Nineteen: How to Make a Fliz. The week passed without any further communication with the hall, as Arthur was evidently fearful that we might wear out our welcome. But when, on Sunday morning, we were setting out for church, I gladly agreed to his proposal to go round and inquire after the earl, who was said to be unwell. Eric, who was strolling in the garden, gave us a good report of the invalid, who was still in bed, with Lady Muriel in attendance. "'Are you coming with us to church?' I inquired. "'Thanks. No,' he courteously replied. "'It's not exactly in my line, you know.' It's an excellent institution for the poor. When I'm with my own folk, I go just to set them an example. But I'm not known here, so I think I'll excuse myself sitting out a sermon. Country preachers are always so dull. Arthur was silent till we were out of hearing. Then he said to himself, almost inaudibly, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Yes, I assented. No doubt that is the principle on which church-going rests. And when he does go... He continued. Our thoughts ran so much together that our conversation was often slightly elliptical. I suppose he repeats the words, I believe in the communion of saints. But by this time we had reached the little church, into which a goodly stream of worshippers, consisting mainly of fishermen and their families, was flowing. The service would have been pronounced by any modern aesthetic religionist, or religious aesthete, which is it, to be crude and cold. To me, coming fresh from the ever-advancing developments of a London church, under a soir distant Catholic rector, it was unspeakably refreshing. There was no theatrical procession of demure little choristers, trying their best not to simper under the admiring gaze of the congregation. The people's share in the service was taken by the people themselves, unaided, except that a few good voices, judiciously posted here and there among them, kept the singing from going too far astray. There was no murdering of the noble music contained in the Bible and the liturgy by its recital in a dead monotone, with no more expression than a mechanical talking doll. No, the prayers were prayed, the lessons were read, and best of all, the sermon was talked and I found myself repeating, as we left the church, the words of Jacob, when he awakened out of his sleep. Surely the Lord is in this place. There is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Yes, said Arthur, apparently in answer to my thoughts. Those high services are fast becoming pure formalism. More and more, the people are beginning to regard them as performances in which they only assist in the French sense, and it is specially bad for the little boys. They'd be much less self-conscious as pantomime fairies, with all that dressing up and stagey entrances and exits and being always on ovidance. No wonder if they're eaten up with vanity, the blatant little coxcombs. When we passed the hall on our return, we found the Earl and Lady Muriel sitting out in the garden. Eric had gone for a stroll. We joined them, and the conversation soon turned on the sermon we had just heard, the subject of which was selfishness. What a change has come over our pulpits, Arthur remarked. Since the time when Paley gave that utterly selfish definition of virtue, the doing good to mankind in obedience to the will of God and for the sake of everlasting happiness. Lady Muriel looked at him inquiringly, but she seemed to have learned by intuition what years of experience had taught me, that the way to elicit Arthur's deepest thoughts was neither to assent nor dissent, but simply to listen. At that time, he went on, 
A great tidal wave of selfishness was sweeping over human thought. Right and wrong had somehow been transformed into gain and loss, and religion had become a sort of commercial transaction. We may be thankful that our preachers are beginning to take a nobler view of life. But is it not taught again and again in the Bible? I ventured to ask. Not in the Bible as a whole, said Arthur. In the Old Testament, no doubt, rewards and punishments are constantly appealed to as motives for action. That teaching is best for children, and the Israelites seem to have been mentally utter children. We guide our children thus at first, but we appeal, as soon as possible, to their innate sense of right and wrong. And when that stage is safely passed, we appeal to the highest motive of all, the desire for likeness to, and union with, the supreme good. I think you will find that to be the teaching of the Bible as a whole, beginning with, that thy days may be long in the land, and ending with, be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. We were silent for a while, and then Arthur went off on another tack. Look at the literature of hymns now. How cankered it is, through and through with selfishness. There are few human compositions more utterly degraded than some modern hymns. I quoted a stanza. Whatever, Lord, we tend to thee, repaid a thousandfold shall be, then gladly will we give to thee, giver of all. Yes, he said grimly. That is the typical stanza and the very last charity sermon I heard was infected with it. After giving many good reasons for charity, the preacher wound up with, And for all you give you will be repaid a thousandfold. Oh, the utter meanness of such a motive, to be put before men who do know what self-sacrifice is, who can appreciate generosity and heroism. Talk of original sin. He went on with increasing bitterness. Can you have a stronger proof of the original goodness that there must be in this nation than the fact that religion has been preached to us as a commercial speculation for a century and that we still believe in a god? It couldn't have gone on so long, Lady Muriel musingly remarked. If the opposition hadn't been practically silenced, put under what the French call la clôture, surely in any lecture hall or in private society, such teaching would soon have been hooted down. I trust so, said Arthur. And though I don't want to see brawling in church legalized, I must say that our preachers enjoy an enormous privilege to which they ill deserve and which they misuse terribly. We put our man into a pulpit and we virtually tell him now, you may stand there and talk to us for half an hour. We won't interrupt you by so much as a word. You shall have it all your own way. And what does he give us in return? Shallow twaddle. That, if it were addressed to you over a dinner table, you would think, does the man take me for a fool? The return of Eric from his walk checked the tide of Arthur's eloquence, and after a few minutes' talk on more conventional topics, we took our leave. Lady Muriel walked with us to the gate. You have given me much to think about, she said earnestly as she gave Arthur her hand. I'm so glad you came in. And her words brought a real glow of pleasure into that pale, worn face of his. On the Tuesday, as Arthur did not seem equal to more walking, I took a long stroll by myself, having stipulated that he was not to give the whole day to his books, but was to meet me at the hall at about tea-time. On my way back I passed the station just as the afternoon train came in sight, and sauntered down the stairs to see it come in. But there was little to gratify my idle curiosity, and when the train was empty and the platform clear I found it was about time to be moving on, if I meant to reach the hall by five. As I approached the end of the platform, from which a steep irregular wooden staircase conducted to the upper world, I noticed two passengers who had evidently arrived by the train, but who, oddly enough, had entirely escaped my notice, though the arrivals had been so few. They were a young woman and a little girl. The former, so far as one could judge by appearances, was a nursemaid, or possibly a nursery governess, in attendance on the child, whose refined face, even more than her dress, distinguished her as of a higher class than her companion. The child's face was refined, but it was also a worn and sad one, and told a tale, or so I seemed to read it, 
of much illness and suffering, sweetly and patiently borne. She had a little crutch to help herself along with, and she was now standing, looking wistfully up the long staircase, and apparently waiting till she could muster courage to begin the toilsome ascent. There are some things one says in life, as well as things one does, which come automatically by reflex action, as the physiologists say, meaning no doubt action without reflection, just as lucas is said to be derived, a non lucendo. Closing one's eyelids, when something seems to be flying into the eye, is one of these actions, and saying, May I carry the little girl up the stairs? was another. It wasn't that any thought of offering help occurred to me, and that then I spoke. The first intimation I had of being likely to make that offer was the sound of my own voice, and the discovery that the offer had been made. The servant paused, doubtfully glancing from her charge to me, and then back again to the child. "'Would you like it, dear?' she asked her. But no such doubt appeared to cross the child's mind. She lifted her arms eagerly to be taken up. Please, was all she said, while a faint smile flickered on the weary little face. I took her up with scrupulous care, and her little arm was at once clasped trustfully round my neck. She was a very light weight, so light, in fact, that the ridiculous idea crossed my mind that it was rather easier going up with her in my arms than it would have been without her and when we reached the road above with its cart-ruts and loose stones, all formidable obstacles for a lame child, I found that I said, I'd better carry her over this rough place. Before I had formed any mental connection between its roughness and my gentle little burden. Indeed, it's troubling you too much, sir, the maid exclaimed. She can walk very well on the flat but the arm that was twined about my neck clung just an atom more closely at the suggestion, and decided me to say, "'She's no weight, really. I'll carry her a little further. I'm going your way.' The nurse raised no further objection, and the next speaker was a ragged little boy with bare feet and a broom over his shoulder who ran across the road and pretended to sweep the perfectly dry road in front of us. "'Give us an apne." The little urchin pleaded with a broad grin on his dirty face. "'Don't give him the apnea,' said the little lady in my arms. The words sounded harsh, but the tone was gentleness itself. "'He's an idle little boy,' and she laughed a laugh of such silvery sweetness as I had never yet heard from any lips but Sylvie's. To my astonishment the boy actually joined in the laugh, as if there were some subtle sympathy between them, as he ran away down the road and vanished through a gap in the hedge. But he was back in a few moments, having discarded his broom and provided himself, from some mysterious source, with an exquisite bouquet of flowers. "'Buy a posy, buy a posy, only an apnea,' he chanted with the melancholy drawl of a professional beggar. "'Don't buy it!' was her majesty's edict as she looked down with a lofty scorn that seemed curiously mixed with tender interest on the ragged creature at her feet but this time i turned rebel and ignored the royal commands such lovely flowers and a form so entirely new to me were not to be abandoned at the bidding of any little maid however imperious i bought the bouquet and the little boy after popping the halfpenny into his mouth turned head over heels as if to ascertain whether the human mouth is really adapted to serve as a money-box. With wonder, that increased every moment, I turned over the flowers, and examined them one by one. There was not a single one among them that I could remember having ever seen before. At last I turned to the nursemaid. "'Do these flowers grow wild about here? I never saw—' But the speech died away on my lips. The nursemaid had vanished.' "'You can put me down now, if you like,' Sylvie quietly remarked. I obeyed in silence, and could only ask myself, "'Is this a dream?' on finding Sylvie and Bruno walking one on either side of me, and clinging to my hands with the ready confidence of childhood. "'You're larger than when I saw you last,' I began. "'Really, I think we ought to be introduced again. There's so much of you that I never met before, you know.' "'Very well.' Sylvie merrily replied. This is Bruno. Doesn't take long. 
He's only got one name. There's another name to me. Bruno protested with a reproachful look at the mistress of the ceremonies. And it's Esquire. Oh, of course, I forgot, said Sylvie. Bruno Esquire. And did you come here to meet me, my children? I inquired. You know I said we'd come on Tuesday, Sylvie explained. Are we the proper size for common children? Quite the right size for children, I replied, adding mentally, though not common children by any means. But what became of the nursemaid? It had gone, Bruno solemnly replied. Then it wasn't solid like Sylvie and you? No, who couldn't touch it, you know? If who walked at it, who'd go right through? I quite expected you'd find it out once, said Sylvie. Bruno ran it against a telegraph post by accident, and it went into halves. But you were looking the other way. I felt that I had indeed missed an opportunity. To witness such an event as a nursemaid going in two halves does not occur twice in a lifetime. When did you guess it was Sylvie? Bruno inquired. I didn't guess it till it was Sylvie, I said. But how did you manage the nursemaid? Bruno managed it said Sylvie. It's called a flizz. And how do you make a flizz, Bruno? The professor teached me how, said Bruno. First, who takes a lot of air? Oh, Bruno, Sylvie interposed. The professor said you weren't to tell. But who did her voice, I asked. Indeed, it's troubling you too much, sir. She can walk very well on a flat. Bruno laughed merrily as I turned hastily from side to side, looking in all directions for the speaker. That were me, he gleefully proclaimed in his own voice. She can indeed walk very well on the flat, I said, and I think I was the flat. By this time we were near the hall. This is where my friends live, I said. Will you come in and have some tea with them? Bruno gave a little jump of joy, and Sylvie said, Yes, please. You'd like some tea, Bruno, wouldn't you? He hasn't tasted tea, she explained to me. Since we left Outland. And that weren't good tea, said Bruno. It was so welly weak. End of chapter 19、Chapter、Twenty of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 20 Light Come, Light Go. Lady Muriel's smile of welcome could not quite conceal the look of surprise with which she regarded my new companions. I presented them in due form. This is Sylvie, Lady Muriel, and this is Bruno. Any surname? she inquired, her eyes twinkling with fun. No, I said gravely, no surname. She laughed, evidently thinking I said it in fun, and stooped to kiss the children a salute to which Bruno submitted with reluctance. Sylvie returned it with interest. While she and Arthur, who had arrived before me, supplied the children with tea and cake, I tried to engage the earl in conversation. But he was restless and astray, and we made little progress. At last, by a sudden question, he betrayed the cause of his disquiet. Would you let me look at those flowers you have in your hand? Willingly, I said, handing him the bouquet. Botany was, I knew, a favourite study of his, and these flowers were to me so entirely new and mysterious that I was really curious to see what a botanist would say of them. They did not diminish his disquiet. On the contrary, he became every moment more excited as he turned them over. These are all from central India, he said, laying aside part of the bouquet. They are rare, even there, and I have never seen them in any other part of the world. These two are Mexican. This one? He rose hastily and carried it to the window to examine it in a better light, the flush of excitement mounting to his very forehead. Is, I'm nearly sure, but I have a book of Indian botany here. He took a volume from the bookshelves and turned the leaves with trembling fingers. 
yes compare it with this picture it is the exact duplicate this is the flower of the ubas tree which usually grows only in the depths of forests and the flower fades so quickly after being plucked that it is scarcely possible to keep its form or colour even so far as the outskirts of the forest yet this is in full bloom where did you get these flowers she added with breathless eagerness i glanced at sylvie who gravely and silently laid her finger on her lips then beckoned to bruno to follow her and ran out into the garden and i found myself in the position of a defendant whose two most important witnesses have been suddenly taken away let me give you the flowers i stammered out at last quite at my wit's end as to how to get out of the difficulty you know much more about them than i do i accept them most gratefully but you have not yet told me the earl was beginning when we were interrupted to my great relief by the arrival of eric linden to arthur however the newcomer was i saw clearly anything but welcome his face clouded over he drew a little back from the circle and took no further part in the conversation which was wholly maintained for some minutes by lady muriel and her lively cousin who were discussing some new music that had just arrived from london do just try this one he pleaded the music looks easy to sing at sight and the song's quite appropriate to the occasion then i suppose it's five o'clock tea ever to thee faithful i'll be five o'clock tea laughed lady muriel as she sat down to the piano and lightly struck a few random chords not quite and yet it is a kind of ever to thee faithful i'll be it's a pair of hapless lovers he crosses the briny tea and she's left lamenting oh, that is indeed appropriate she replied mockingly as he placed the song before her and am i to do the lamenting and who for if you please she played the air once or twice through first in quick and finally in slow time and then gave us the whole song with as much graceful ease as if she had been familiar with it all her life he stepped so lightly to the land all in his manly pride he kissed her cheek he pressed her hand yet still she glanced aside to gay he seems she darkly dreams to gallant and to gay to think of me poor simple me when he is far away i bring my love this goodly pearl across the seas he said a gem to deck the dearest girl that ever sailor wit she clasped it tight her eyes are bright her throbbing heart would say he thought of me he thought of me when he was far away the ship has sailed into the west her ocean bird is flown a dull dead pain is in her breast and she is weak and alone yet there's a smile upon her face a smile that seems to say he'll think of me he'll think of me when he is far away the waters wide between us glide our lives are warm and near no distance parts to faithful hearts to hearts that love so dear and i will trust my sailor lad forever and a day to think of me to think of me to think of me when he is far away the look of displeasure which had begun to come over arthur's face when the young captain spoke of love so lightly faded away as the song proceeded and he listened with evident delight but his face darkened again when eric demurely remarked don't you think my soldier lad would have fitted the tune just as well why so it would lady muriel gaily retorted soldiers sailors tinkers tailors what a lot of words would fit in i think my tinker lad sounds best don't you to spare my friend further pain i rose to go just as the earl was beginning to repeat his particularly embarrassing question about the flowers 
You have not yet. Yes, I've had some tea, thank you. I hastily interrupted him. And now we really must be going. Good evening, Lady Muriel. And we made our adieus and escaped, while the Earl was still absorbed in examining the mysterious bouquet. Lady Muriel accompanied us to the door. You couldn't have given my father a more acceptable present, she said warmly. He is so passionately fond of botany. I'm afraid I know nothing of the theory of it. But I keep his hortus sissus in order. I must get some sheets of blotting paper and dry these new treasures for him before they fade. That won't be no good at all, said Bruno, who was waiting for us in the garden. Why won't it? said I. You know I had to give the flowers to stop questions. Yes, it can't be how, said Sylvie. For they will be sorry when they find them gone. But how will they go? Well, I don't know how. But they will go. The nosegay was only a fliz, you know. Bruno made it up. These last words were in a whisper, as she evidently did not wish Arthur to hear. But of this there seemed to be little risk. He hardly seemed to notice the children, but paced on, silent and abstracted. And when, at the entrance to the wood, they bid us a hasty farewell and ran off, he seemed to wake out of a daydream. The bouquet vanished, as Sylvie had predicted, and when, a day or two afterwards, Arthur and I once more visited the hall, we found the Earl and his daughter, with the old housekeeper, out in the garden, examining the fastenings of the drawing-room window. "'We are holding an inquest,' Lady Muriel said, advancing to meet us. "'And we admit you as accessories before the fact, to tell us all you know about those flowers.' The accessories before the fact declined to answer any questions, I gravely replied, and they reserved their defense. Well then, turn Queen's evidence, please. The flowers have disappeared in the night, she went on, turning to Arthur. And we are quite sure no one in the house has meddled with them. Somebody must have entered by the window. But the fastenings have not been tampered with, said the Earl. It must have been why you were tiny, my lady said the housekeeper that was it said the earl the thief must have seen you bring the flowers turning to me and have noticed that you did not take them away and he must have known their great value they are simply priceless and you never told us how you got them said lady muriel some day i stammered i may be free to tell you just now would you excuse me the earl looked disappointed but kindly said very well we will ask no questions. But we consider you a very bad queen's evidence, Lady Muriel added playfully as we entered the arbor. We pronounce you to be an accomplice, and we sentence you to solitary confinement and to be fed on bread and butter. Do you take sugar? It is disquieting, certainly, she resumed when all creature comforts had been duly supplied, to find that the house has been entered by a thief in this out-of-the-way place, if only the flowers had been eatables, one might have suspected a thief of quite another shape. You mean that universal explanation for all mysterious disappearances, the cat did it? said Arthur. Yes, she replied. What a convenient thing it would be if all the thieves had the same shape. It's so confusing to have some of them quadrupeds and others bipeds. It has occurred to me, said Arthur, as a curious problem in teleology, the science of final causes, he added, in answer to an inquiring look from Lady Muriel. And a final clause is? Well, suppose we say the last of a series of connected events, each of the series being the cause of the next, for whose sake the first event takes place. But the last event is practically an effect of the first, isn't it? And yet you call it a cause of it? Arthur pondered a moment. The words are rather confusing, I grant you. He said. Will this do? Um, the, the last event is an effect of the first, but the necessity for that event is the cause of the necessity for the first. That seems clear enough, said Lady Muriel. Now let us have the problem. It is merely this. What object can we imagine in the arrangement by which each different size, roughly speaking, of living creatures has its special shape? For instance, the human race has one kind of shape, bipeds. Another set, ranging from the lion to the mouse, are quadrupeds. Go down a step or two further, and you come to insects with six legs. Hexapods, a beautiful name, is it not? But beauty, in our sense of the word, seems to diminish as we go down. The creature becomes more 
I won't say ugly of any of God's creatures, more uncouth. And when we take the microscope and go a few steps lower still, we come upon animalculi, terribly uncouth, and with a terrible number of legs. The other alternative, said the Earl, would be a diminuendo series of repetitions of the same type. Never mind the monotony of it. Let's see how it would work in other ways. Begin with the race of men and the creatures they require. Let us say horses, cattle, sheep, and dogs. We don't exactly require frogs and spiders, do we, Muriel? Lady Muriel shuddered perceptibly. It was evidently a painful subject. We can dispense with them, she said gravely. Well, then, we'll have a second race of men, half a yard high. Who would have one source of exquisite enjoyment not possessed by ordinary men. Arthur interrupted. What source? said the Earl. Why, the grandeur of scenery. Surely the grandeur of a mountain to me depends on its size relative to me. Double the height of the mountain, and of course it's twice as grand. Halve my height, and you produce the same effect. Happy, happy, happy small, Lady Muriel murmured rapturously. None but the short, none but the short, none but the short enjoy the tall. But let me go on, said the Earl. We'll have a third race of men, five inches high, a fourth race, an inch high. They couldn't eat common beef and mutton, I'm sure, Lady Muriel interrupted. True, my child, I was forgetting. Each set must have its own cattle and sheep. And its own vegetation, I added. What could a cow an inch high do with grass that waved far above its head? That is true. We must have a pasture within a pasture, so to speak. The common grass would serve our inch-high cows as a green forest of palms, while round the root of each tall stem would stretch a tiny carpet of microscopic grass. Yes, I think our scheme will work fairly well, and it would be very interesting coming into contact with the races below us. What sweet little things the inch-high bulldogs would be! I doubt if even Muriel would run away from one of them. Don't you think we ought to have a crescendo series as well? said Lady Muriel. Only fancy being a hundred yards high. One could use an elephant as a paperweight and a crocodile as a pair of scissors. And would you have races of different sizes communicate with one another? I inquired. Would they make war on one another, for instance, or enter into treaties? War we must exclude, I think. When you could crush a whole nation with one blow of your fist, you couldn't conduct war on equal terms. But anything involving a collision of minds only would be possible in our ideal world, for, of course, we must allow mental powers to all, irrespective of size. Perhaps the fairest rule would be that the smaller the race, the greater should be its intellectual development. Do you mean to say, said Lady Muriel, that these mannequins of an inch high are to argue with me? Surely, surely, said the Earl. An argument doesn't depend for its logical force on the size of the creature that utters it. She tossed her head indignantly. I would not argue with any man less than six inches high, she cried. I'd make him work. What at? said Arthur, listening to all this nonsense with an amused smile. Embroidery she readily replied what lovely embroidery they would do yet if they did it wrong i said you couldn't argue the question i don't know why but i agree that it couldn't be done the reason is said lady muriel one couldn't sacrifice one's dignity so far of course one couldn't echoed arthur any more than one could argue with a potato that would be altogether excuse the ancient pun in for a dig I doubt it, said I. Even a pun doesn't quite convince me. Well, if that is not the reason, said Lady Muriel, what reason would you give? I tried hard to understand the meaning of this question, but the persistent humming of the bees confused me, and there was a drowsiness in the air that made every thought stop and go to sleep before it had got well thought out. So all I could say was, that must depend on the weight of the potato. I felt the remark was not so sensible as I should have liked it to be, but Lady Muriel seemed to take it as quite a matter of course. In that case, she began, but suddenly started and turned away to listen. Don't you hear him? she said. He 
He's crying. We must go to him, somehow. And I said to myself, that's very strange. I quite thought it was Lady Muriel talking to me. Why, it's Sylvie all the while. And I made another great effort to say something that should have some meaning in it. Is it about the potato? End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty One Through the Ivory Door. I don't know, said Sylvie. Hush, I must think. I could go to him by myself, well enough. But I want you to come too. Let me go with you, I pleaded. I can walk as fast as you can, I'm sure. Sylvie laughed merrily. What nonsense! She cried. Why, you can't walk a bit. You're lying quite flat on your back. You don't understand these things. I can walk as well as you can, I repeated. And I tried my best to walk a few steps, but the ground slipped away backwards quite as fast as I could walk, so that I made no progress at all. Sylvie laughed again. There, I told you so. You've no idea how funny you look. Moving your feet about in the air as if you were walking. Wait a bit. I'll ask the professor what we'd better do. And she knocked at his study door. The door opened and the professor looked out. What's that crying I heard just now? He asked. Is it a human animal? It's a boy, Sylvie said. I'm afraid you've been teasing him. No, indeed, I haven't, Sylvie said very earnestly. I never tease him. Well, I must ask the other professor about it. He went back into the study, and we heard him whispering. Small human animal. Says she hasn't been teasing him. The kind that's called boy. Ask her which boy, said a new voice. The professor came out again. Which boy is it that you haven't been teasing? Sylvie looked at me with twinkling eyes. You dear old thing, she exclaimed, standing on tiptoe to kiss him while he gravely stooped to receive the salute. How you do puzzle me. Why, there are several boys I haven't been teasing. The professor returned to his friend, and this time the voice said, Tell her to bring them here, all of them. I can't, and I won't, Sylvie exclaimed the moment he reappeared. It's Bruno that's crying, and he's my brother. And please, we both want to go. He can't walk, you know. He's, he's dreaming, you know. This in a whisper for fear of hurting my feelings. Do let's go through the ivory door. I'll ask him, said the professor, disappearing again. He returned directly. He says you may follow me and walk on tiptoe. The difficulty with me would have been just then not to walk on tiptoe. It seemed very hard to reach down far enough to just touch the floor as Sylvie led me through the study. The professor went before us to unlock the ivory door. I had just time to glance at the other professor who was sitting reading with his back to us before the professor showed us out through the door and locked it behind us. Bruno was standing with his hands over his face, crying bitterly. What's the matter, darling? said Sylvie with her arms round his neck. Erting myself so welly much, sobbed the poor little fellow. I'm so sorry, darling. However did you manage to hurt yourself so? Course I managed it, said Bruno, laughing through his tears. Does he think nobody else but you can't manage things? Matters were looking distinctly brighter now Bruno had begun to argue. Come, let's hear all about it, I said. My foot took it into its head to slip, Bruno began. A foot hasn't got a head, Sylvie put in, but all in vain. I slipped it down the bank, and I tripped it over a stone. And the stone hurted my foot, and I trod on a bee, and the bee stinged my finger. Poor Bruno sobbed again. The complete list of woes was too much for his feelings. And it knowed I didn't mean to trod on it, he added as the climax. That bee should be ashamed of itself, I said severely, and Sylvie hugged and kissed the wounded hero till all tears were dried. My finger's quite unstung now, said Bruno. Why do there be stones, Mr. Sir? Does you know? They're good for something, I said, even if we don't know what. What's the good of dandelions now? Dindledums, said Bruno. Oh, they're ever so pretty, and stones aren't pretty one bit. 
Would you like some dindledums, Mr. Sir? Bruno, Sylvie murmured reproachfully. You mustn't say Mr. and Sir both at once. Remember what I told you. You told me I were to say Mr. when I spoke about him, and I were to say Sir when I spoke to him. Well, you're not doing both, you know. Ah, oh, but I is doing both, Miss Particular, Bruno exclaimed triumphantly. I wish you to speak about the gimplum, and I wish you to speak to the gimplum. So, of course, I said, Mr. Sir. That's all right, Bruno, I said. Of course it's all right, said Bruno. Sylvie just knows nothing at all. There never was an impertinent a boy, said Sylvie, frowning till her bright eyes were nearly invisible. And there were never an ignorant girl, retorted Bruno. Come along and pick some dindledums. That's all she's fit for, he added in a very loud whisper to me. But why do you say dindledums, Bruno? Dandelions is the right word. It's because he jumps about so, Sylvie said, laughing. Yeah, that's it, Bruno assented. Sylvie tells me the words, and then when I jump about, they get shooken up in my head, till they're all froth. I expressed myself as perfectly satisfied with this explanation. But aren't you going to pick me any dindledums after all? Course we will, cried Bruno. Come along, Sylvie. And the happy children raced away, bounding over the turf with the fleetness and grace of young antelopes. Then you didn't find your way back to Outland, I said to the professor. Oh, yes, I did, he replied. We never got to Queer Street, but I found another way. I've been backwards and forwards several times since then. I had to be present at the election, you know, as the author of the new money act. The emperor was so kind as to wish that I should have the credit of it. Let come what come may, I remember the very words of the imperial speech, if it should turn out that the warden is alive, you will bear witness that the change in the coinage is the professor's doing, not mine. I never was so glorified in my life before. Tears trickled down his cheeks at the recollection, which apparently was not wholly a pleasant one. Is the warden supposed to be dead? Well, it's supposed so, but, mind you, I don't believe it. The evidence is very weak. Mere hearsay. A wandering jester with a dancing bear, they found their way into the palace one day, has been telling people he comes from fairyland and that the warden died there. I wanted the vice-warden to question him, but, most unluckily, he and my lady were always out walking when the jester came round. Yes, the warden's supposed to be dead. And more tears trickled down the old man's cheeks. But what is the new money act? The professor brightened up again. The emperor started the thing, he said. He wanted to make everybody in Outland twice as rich as he was before just to make the new government popular. Only there wasn't nearly enough money in the treasure to do it, so I suggested that he might do it by doubling the value of every coin and banknote in Outland. It's the simplest thing possible. I wonder nobody ever thought of it before, and you never saw such universal joy. The shops are full from morning to night. Everybody's buying everything. And how was the glorifying done? A sudden gloom overcast the professor's jolly face. They did it when I went home after the election, he mournfully replied. It was kindly meant, but I didn't like it. They waved flags all round me till I was nearly blind, and they rang bells till I was nearly deaf, and they strewed at the road so thick with flowers that I lost my way. And the poor old man sighed deeply. How far is it to Outland? I asked to change the subject. About five days' march, but one must go back occasionally. You see, as court professor, I have to be always in attendance on Prince Ergok. The Empress would be very angry if I left him even for an hour. But surely every time you come here you are absent ten days at least. Oh, more than that, the professor exclaimed. A fortnight sometimes, but of course I keep a memorandum of the exact time when I started, so that I can put the court time back to the very moment. Excuse me, I said, I don't understand. Silently, the professor drew from his pocket a square gold watch, with six or eight hands, and held it out for my inspection. This, he began, is an outlandish watch. So I should have thought. 
which has the peculiar property that, instead of its going with the time, the time goes with it. I trust you understand me now. Hardly, I said. Permit me to explain. So long as it is let alone, it takes its own course. Time has no effect upon it. I have known such watches, I remarked. It goes, of course, at the usual rate. Only the time has to go with it. Hence, if I move the hands, I change the time. To move them forwards in advance of the true time is impossible, but I can move them as much as a month backwards. That is the limit. And then you have the events all over again with any alterations experience may suggest. What a blessing such a watch would be, I thought, in real life, to be able to unsay some heedless word, to undo some reckless deed. Might I see the thing done? With pleasure, said the good-natured professor. When I move this head back to here, pointing out the place, history goes back fifteen minutes. Trembling with excitement, I watched him push the hand round as he described, hurting myself welly much. Shrilly and suddenly the words rang in my ears, and more startled than I cared to show, I turned to look for the speaker. Yes, there was Bruno, standing with the tears running down his cheeks, just as I had seen him a quarter of an hour ago, and there was Sylvie with her arms round his neck. I had not the heart to make the dear little fellow go through his troubles a second time, so hastily begged the professor to push the hands round into their former position. In a moment Sylvie and Bruno were gone again, and I could just see them in the far distance, picking dindledums. Wonderful indeed, I exclaimed. It has another property, yet more wonderful, said the professor. You see this little peg? That is called a reversal peg. If you push it in, the events of the next hour happen in the reverse order. Do not try it now. I will lend you the watch for a few days, and you may amuse yourself with experiments. Thank you very much, I said, as he gave me the watch. I'll take the greatest care of it. Why, here are the children again. We could only find but six dindledums, said Bruno, putting them into my hands. Because Sylvie said it were time to go back, and he has a big blackberry for himself. We couldn't only find but two. Thank you. It's very nice, I said. And I suppose you ate the other, Bruno? No, I didn't, Bruno said carelessly. Aren't they pretty dindledums, Mr. Sir? Yes, very. But what makes you limp so, my child? Mine foot's come hurt it again, Bruno mournfully replied, and he sat down on the ground and began nursing it. The professor held his head between his hands, an attitude that I knew indicated distraction of mind. Better rest a minute, he said. It may be better then, or it may be worse. If only I had some of my medicines here. I'm court physician, you know. He added aside to me. Shall I go and get you some blackberries, darling? Sylvie whispered with her arm round his neck, and she kissed away a tear that was trickling down his cheek. Bruno brightened up in a moment. That are a good plan, he exclaimed. I think my foot would come quite unhurted if I eat a blackberry or two. Two or three blackberries. Six or seven blackberries. Sylvie got up hastily. I better go she said aside to me, before he gets into the double figures. Let me come and help you, I said. I can reach higher up than you can. Yes, please, said Sylvie, putting her hand into mine, and we walked off together. Bruno loves blackberries, she said, as we paced slowly along by a tall hedge. That looked a promising place for them, and it was so sweet of him to make me eat the only one. Oh, it was you that ate it then. Bruno didn't seem to like to tell me about it. No, I saw that, said Sylvie. He's always afraid of being praised. But he made me eat it, really. I would much rather he... Oh, what's that? And she clung to my hand, half frightened as we came in sight of a hare, lying on its side with legs stretched out just in the entrance to the wood. It's a hare, my child. Perhaps it's asleep. No, it isn't asleep, Sylvie said, timidly going nearer to look at it. Its eyes are open. Is it? Is it? Her voice dropped to an awe-struck whisper. Is it dead, do you think? Yes, it's quite dead, I said, after stooping to examine it. Poor thing, I think it's been hunted to death. I know the harriers were out yesterday, but they haven't touched it. Perhaps they caught sight of another and 
left it to die of fright and exhaustion. Hunted to death, Sylvie repeated to herself, very slowly and sadly. I thought hunting was a thing they played at like a game. Bruno and I hunt snails, but we never hurt them when we catch them. Sweet angel, I thought. How am I to get the idea of sport into your innocent mind? And as we stood hand in hand looking down at the dead hare, I tried to put the thing into such words as she could understand. You know what fierce wild beasts, lions, and tigers are? Sylvie nodded. Well, in some countries men have to kill them to save their own lives, you know. Yes, said Sylvie. If one tried to kill me, Bruno would kill it if he could. Well, and so the men, the hunters, get to enjoy it, you know. The running and the fighting and the shouting and the danger. Yes, said Sylvie. Bruno likes danger. Well, but in this country there aren't any lions and tigers loose, so they hunt other creatures, you see. I hoped, but in vain, that this would satisfy her, and that she would ask no more questions. They hunt foxes, Sylvie said thoughtfully. And I think they kill them too. Foxes are very fierce. I dare say men don't love them. Are hares fierce? No, I said. A hare is a sweet, gentle, timid animal, almost as gentle as a lamb. But if men love hares, why, why— her voice quivered, and her sweet eyes were brimming over with tears. I'm afraid they don't love them, dear child. All children love them, Sylvie said. All ladies love them. I'm afraid even ladies go to hunt them sometimes. Sylvie shuddered. Oh, no, not ladies, she earnestly pleaded. Not Lady Muriel? No, she never does, I am sure. But this is too sad a sight for you, dear. Let's try and find some. But Sylvie was not satisfied yet. In a hushed, solemn tone, with bowed head and clasped hands, she put her final question. Does God love hares? Yes, I said. I'm sure he does. He loves every living thing, even sinful men. How much more the animals that cannot sin? I don't know what sin means, said Sylvie, and I didn't try to explain it. Come, my child, I said, trying to lead her away. Wish good-bye to the poor hare, and come and look for blackberries. Good-bye, poor hare, Sylvie obediently repeated, looking over her shoulder at it as we turned away. And then, all in a moment, her self-command gave way. Pulling her hand out of mine, she ran back to where the dead hare was lying, and flung herself down at its side in such an agony of grief as I could hardly have believed possible in so young a child. Oh, my darling, my darling, she moaned over and over again. And God meant your life to be so beautiful. Sometimes, but always keeping her face hidden on the ground, she would reach out one little hand to stroke the poor dead thing, and then once more bury her face in her hands and sob as if her heart would break. I was afraid she would really make herself ill. Still, I thought it best to let her weep away the first sharp agony of grief, and after a few minutes the sobbing gradually ceased, and Sylvie rose to her feet and looked calmly at me, though tears were still streaming down her cheeks. I did not dare to speak again just yet, but simply held out my hand to her that we might quit the melancholy spot. Yes, I'll come now, she said. Very reverently she kneeled down and kissed the dead hair, then rose and gave me her hand, and we moved on in silence. A child's sorrow is violent but short, and it was almost in her usual voice that she said after a minute, Oh, stop! Stop! Here are some lovely blackberries. We filled our hands with fruit and returned in all haste to where the professor and Bruno were seated on a bank, awaiting our return. Just before we came within hearing distance, Sylvie checked me. Please don't tell Bruno about the hair, she said. Very well, my child. But why not? Tears again glittered in those sweet eyes, and she turned her head away so that I could scarcely hear her reply. He's, he's very fond of gentle creatures, you know, and he'd, he'd be so sorry. I don't want him to be made sorry. And your agony of sorrow is to count for nothing, then, sweet unselfish child. I thought to myself, 
but no more was said till we had reached our friends and bruno was far too much engrossed in the feast we had brought him to take any notice of sylvie's unusually grave manner i'm afraid it's getting rather late professor i said yes indeed said the professor i must take you all through the ivory door again you stayed your full time mightn't we stay a little longer pleaded sylvie just one more minute added bruno but the professor was unyielding it's a great privilege coming through at all he said we must go now and we followed him obediently to the ivy door which he threw open and signed me to go through first you're coming too aren't you i said to sylvie yes she said but you won't see us after you've gone through but suppose i wait for you outside i asked as i stepped through the doorway in that case said sylvie i think the potato would be quite justified in asking your weight i can quite imagine a really superior kidney potato declining to argue with any one under fifteen stone with a great effort i recovered the thread of my thoughts we lapse very quickly into nonsense i said End of chapter twenty one Chapter twenty two of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty two Crossing the Line. Let us lapse back again, said Lady Muriel. Take another cup of tea. I hope that's sound common sense. And all that strange adventure, I thought has occupied the space of a single comma in Lady Muriel's speech. A single comma, for which grammarians tell us to count one. I felt no doubt that the professor had kindly put back the time for me to the exact point at which I had gone to sleep. When, a few minutes afterwards, we left the house, Arthur's first remark was certainly a strange one. "'We've been there just twenty minutes,' he said and I've done nothing but listen to you and Lady Muriel talking, and yet somehow I feel exactly as if I had been talking with her for an hour, at least. And so he had been, I felt no doubt. Only, as the time had been put back to the beginning of the tete-a-tete he referred to, the whole of it had passed into oblivion, if not into nothingness. But I valued my own reputation for sanity too highly to venture on explaining to him what had happened. For some cause, which I could not at the moment divine, Arthur was unusually grave and silent during our walk home. It could not be connected with Eric Linden, I thought, as he had for some days been away in London, so that, having Lady Muriel almost all to himself, for I was only too glad to hear those two conversing, to have any wish to intrude any remarks of my own, he ought, theoretically, to have been specially radiant and contented with life. Can he have heard any bad news? I said to myself. And, almost as if he had read my thoughts, he spoke. He will be here by the last train, he said, in the tone of one who is continuing a conversation rather than beginning one. Captain Linden, do you mean? Yes. "'Captain Linden,' said Arthur, "'I said he because I fancied we were talking about him. "'The Earl told me he comes to-night, "'though to-morrow is the day when he will know about the commission that he's hoping for. "'I wonder he doesn't stay another day to hear the result, "'if he's really so anxious about it as the Earl believes he is.' "'He can have a telegram sent after him,' I said. "'But it's not very soldier-like, running away from possible bad news.' "'He's a very good fellow,' said Arthur. "'But I confess it would be good news for me "'if he got his commission and his marching orders all at once. "'I wish him all happiness, with one exception. <laughs> "'Good night.' "'We'd reached home by this time.' "'I'm not good company tonight. "'Better be alone.' "'It was much the same next day. "'Arthur declared he wasn't fit for society.' and I had to set forth alone for an afternoon stroll. I took the road to the station, and, at the point where the road from the hall joined it, I paused, seeing my friends in the distance, seemingly bound for the same goal. "'Will you join us?' the Earl said, after I had exchanged greetings with him and Lady Muriel and Captain Linden. 
this restless young man is expecting a telegram and we are going to the station to meet it there is also a restless young woman in the case lady muriel added that goes without saying my child said her father women are always restless for generous appreciation of all one's best qualities his daughter impressively remarked there's nothing to compare with a father is there eric cousins are not in it said eric and then somehow the conversation lapsed into two duologues the younger folk taking the lead and the two old men following with less eager steps and when are we to see your little friends again said the earl they are singularly attractive children i shall be delighted to bring them when i can i said but i don't know myself when i am likely to see them again i am not going to question you said the earl but there is no harm in mentioning that muriel is simply tormented with curiosity we know most of the people about here and she has been vainly trying to guess what house they can possibly be staying at some day i may be able to enlighten her but just at present thanks she must bear it as best she can i tell her it's a grand opportunity for practising patience but she hardly sees it from that point of view why there are the children so indeed they were waiting for us apparently at a stile which they could not have climbed over more than a few moments as lady muriel and her cousin had passed it without seeing them on catching sight of us bruno ran to meet us and to exhibit to us with much pride the handle of a clasp knife the blade having been broken off which he had picked up in the road and what shall you use it for bruno i said don't know bruno carelessly replied must think a child's first view of life the earl remarked with that sweet sad smile of his is that it is a period to be spent in accumulating portable property that view gets modified as the years glide away and he held out his hand to Sylvie, who had placed herself by me, looking a little shy of him. But the gentle old man was not one with whom any child, human or fairy, could be shy for long, and she had very soon deserted my hand for his, Bruno alone remaining faithful to his first friend. We overtook the other couple just as they reached the station, and both Lady Muriel and Eric greeted the children as old friends, the latter with the words, so you got to babylon by candlelight after all yes and back again cried bruno lady muriel looked from one to the other in blank astonishment what you know them eric she exclaimed this mystery grows deeper every day then we must be somewhere in the third act said eric you don't expect the mystery to be cleared up till the fifth act do you but it's such a long drama was the plaintive reply we must have got to the fifth act by this time third act i assure you said the young soldier mercilessly scene a railway platform lights down enter prince in disguise of course and faithful attendant this is the prince taking bruno's hand and here stands his humble servant what is your royal highness next command and he made a most courtier like low bow to his puzzled little friend who are not a servant bruno scornfully exclaimed who are a gentleman servant i assure your royal highness eric respectfully insisted allow me to mention to your royal highness my various situations past present and future what did i begin with bruno asked beginning to enter into the jest was there a shoe black lower than that your royal highness years ago i offered myself as a slave as a confidential slave i think it's called he asked turning to lady muriel but lady muriel heard him not something had gone wrong with her glove which entirely engrossed her attention did you get the place said bruno sad to say your royal highness i did not so i had to take a situation as as waiter which i have now held for some years haven't i he again glanced at lady muriel sylvie dear do help me to button this glove lady muriel whispered hastily stooping down and failing to hear the question and what will it be next said bruno my next place will i hope be that of groom and after that don't puzzle the child so lady muriel interrupted 
What nonsense you talk. After that, Eric persisted, I hope to obtain the situation of housekeeper, which... Fourth act, he proclaimed with a sudden change of tone. Lights turned up. Red lights, green lights. Distant rumble heard. Enter a passenger train. And in another minute, the train drew up alongside of the platform, and a stream of passengers began to flow out from the booking office and waiting rooms. Did you ever make real life into a drama? said the Earl. Now, just try. I've often amused myself that way. Consider this platform as our stage. Good entrances and exits on both sides, you see. Capital background scene. Real engine moving up and down. All this bustle and people passing to and fro must have been most carefully rehearsed. How naturally they do it, with never a glance at the audience. And every grouping is quite fresh, you see. No repetition. It really was admirable, as soon as I began to enter into it from this point of view. Even a porter passing with a barrow piled with luggage seemed so realistic that one was tempted to applaud. He was followed by an angry mother with hot red face, dragging along two screaming children, and calling to someone behind, John, come on. Enter John, very meek, very silent, and loaded with parcels. And he was followed, in his turn, by a frightened little nursemaid, carrying a fat baby, also screaming. All the children screamed. Capital by-play, said the old man aside. Did you notice the nursemaid's look of terror? It was simply perfect. You have struck quite a new vein, I said. To most of us, life and its pleasures seem like a mine that is nearly worked out. Worked out? exclaimed the Earl. For anyone with true dramatic instincts, it is only the overture that is ended. The real treat has yet to begin. You go to a theatre and pay your ten shillings for a stall, and what do you get for your money? Perhaps it's a dialogue between a couple of farmers, unnatural in their overdone caricature of farmers' dress, more unnatural in their constrained attitudes and gestures, most unnatural in their attempts at ease and geniality in their talk. Go instead and take a seat in a third-class railway carriage, and you'll get the same dialogue done to the life. Front seats, no orchestra to block the view, and nothing to pay. Which reminds me, said Eric, there is nothing to pay on receiving a telegram. Shall we inquire for one? And he and Lady Muriel strolled off in the direction of the telegraph office. I wonder if Shakespeare had that thought in his mind, I said, when he wrote All the World's a Stage. The old man sighed. And so it is, he said. Look at it as you will. Life is indeed a drama, a drama with but few encores and no bouquets, he added dreamily. We spend one half of it in regretting the things we did in the other half. And the secret of enjoying it, he continued, resuming his cheerful tone, is intensity. But not in the modern aesthetic sense, I presume, like the young lady in Punch who begins a conversation with, Are you intense? By no means, replied the Earl. What I mean is intensity of thought, a concentrated attention. We lose half the pleasure we might have in life by not really attending. Take any instance you like. It doesn't matter how trivial the pleasure may be. The principle is the same. Suppose A and B are reading the same second-rate circulating library novel. A never troubles himself to master the relationships of the characters on which perhaps all the interest of the story depends. He skips over all the descriptions of scenery, and every passage that looks rather dull. He doesn't half attend to the passages he does read. He goes on reading merely from want of resolution to find another occupation, for hours after he ought to have put the book aside, and reaches the finis in a state of utter weariness and depression. B puts his whole soul into the thing, on the principle that whatever is worth doing is worth doing well. He masters the genealogies, he calls up pictures before his mind's eye as he reads about the scenery. Best of all, he resolutely shuts the book at the end of some chapter while his interest is yet at its keenest, 
and turns to other subjects, so that when next he allows himself an hour at it, it is like a hungry man sitting down to dinner, and when the book is finished, he returns to the work of his daily life like a giant refreshed. But suppose the book were really rubbish, nothing to repay attention. Well, suppose it, said the Earl. My theory meets that case, I assure you. A never finds out that it is rubbish, but maunders on to the end, trying to believe he's enjoying himself. B quietly shuts the book when he's read a dozen pages, walks off to the library, and changes it for a better. I have yet another theory for adding to the enjoyment of life. That is, if I have not exhausted your patience, I'm afraid you find me a very garrulous old man. No, indeed, I exclaimed earnestly. And indeed, I felt as if one could not easily tire of the sweet sadness of that gentle voice. It is that we should learn to take our pleasures quickly and our pains slowly. But why? I should have put it the other way myself. By taking artificial pain, which can be as trivial as you please, slowly, the result is that when real pain comes, however severe, all you need do is to let it go at its ordinary pace, and it's over in a moment. Very true, I said. But how about the pleasure? Why, by taking it quick, you can get so much more into life. It takes you three hours and a half to hear and enjoy an opera. Suppose I can take it in and enjoy it in half an hour. Why, I can enjoy seven operas while you are listening to one. Always supposing you have an orchestra capable of playing them, I said. And that orchestra has yet to be found. The old man smiled. I have heard an air played he said, and by no means a short one, played right through, variations and all, in three seconds. When and how? I asked eagerly, with a half notion that I was dreaming again. It was done by a little musical box, he quietly replied. After it had been wound up, the regulator or something broke, and it ran down, as I said, in about three seconds. But it must have played all the notes, you know. Did you enjoy it? I asked, with all the severity of a cross-examining barrister. No, I didn't, he candidly confessed. But then, you know, I hadn't been trained to that kind of music. I should much like to try your plan, I said, and as Sylvia and Bruno happened to run up to us at the moment, I left them to keep the Earl company and strolled along the platform, making each person and event play its part in an extempore drama for my especial benefit. "'What, is the Earl tired of you already?' I said, as the children ran past me. "'No,' Sylvie replied with great emphasis. "'He wants the evening paper, so Bruno's going to be a little newsboy.' "'Mind you charge a good price for it,' I called after them. Returning up the platform, I came upon Sylvie alone. "'Well, child,' I said, "'where's your little newsboy? Couldn't he get you an evening paper?' He went to get one at the bookstall at the other side, said Sylvie. And he's coming across the line with it. Oh, Bruno, you ought to cross by the bridge. For the distant thud, thud of the express was already audible. Suddenly a look of horror came over her face. Oh, he's fallen down on the rails, she cried, and darted past me at a speed that quite defied the hasty effort I made to stop her but the wheezy old station-master happened to be close behind me. He wasn't good for much, poor old man, but he was good for this, and before I could turn round he had the child clasped in his arms, saved from the certain death she was rushing to. So intent was I in watching this scene that I hardly saw a flying figure in a light grey suit who shot across from the back of the platform and was on the line in another second. So far as one could take note of time in such a moment of horror, he had about ten clear seconds before the express would be upon him, in which to cross the rails and to pick up Bruno. Whether he did so or not, it was quite impossible to guess. The next thing one knew was that the express had passed, and that, whether for life or death, all was over. When the cloud of dust had cleared away, and the line was once more visible, we saw with thankful hearts that the child and his deliverer were safe. All right, 
Eric called to us cheerfully as he recrossed the line. He's more frightened than hurt. He lifted the little fellow up into Lady Muriel's arms and mounted the platform as gaily as if nothing had happened. But he was as pale as death and leaned heavily on the arm I hastily offered him, fearing he was about to faint. I'll just sit down a moment, he said dreamily. Where's Sylvie? Sylvie ran to him and flung her arms round his neck, sobbing as if her heart would break. Don't do that, my darling, Eric murmured with a strange look in his eyes. Nothing to cry about now, you know, but you very nearly got yourself killed for nothing. For Bruno, the little maiden sobbed. And he would have done it for me, wouldn't you, Bruno? Course I would, Bruno said, looking round with a bewildered air. Lady Muriel kissed him in silence as she put him down out of her arms. Then she beckoned Sylvie to come and take his hand, and signed to the children to go back to where the Earl was seated. Tell him, she whispered with quivering lips, tell him all is well. Then she turned to the hero of the day. I thought it was death, she said. Thank God you are safe. Did you see how near it was? I saw there was just time. Eric said lightly. A soldier must learn to carry his life in his hand, you know. I'm all right now. Shall we go to the telegraph office again? I dare say it's come by this time. I went to join the Earl and the children, and we waited, almost in silence, for no one seemed inclined to talk, and Bruno was half asleep on Sylvie's lap, till the others joined us. No telegram had come. I'll take a stroll with the children, I said feeling that we were a little de trop, and I'll look in, in the course of the evening. We must go back into the wood now, Sylvie said, as soon as we were out of hearing. We can't stay this size any longer. Then you will be quite tiny fairies again next time we meet? Yes, said Sylvie. But we'll be children again some day, if you'll let us. Bruno's very anxious to see Lady Muriel again. She a welly nice, said Bruno. I shall be very glad to take you to see her again, I said. Hadn't I better give you back the professor's watch? It'll be too large for you to carry when you're fairies, you know. Bruno laughed merrily. I was glad to see it quite recovered from the terrible scene he'd gone through. Oh, uh, now it won't, he said. When we go small, it'll go small. And then it'll go straight to the professor, Sylvie added. And you won't be able to use it any more. So you better use it all you can now. We must go small when the sun sets. Goodbye. Goodbye, cried Bruno. But their voices sounded very far away, and when I looked round, both children had disappeared. And it wants only two hours to sunset, I said as I strolled on. I must make the best of my time. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty Three An Outlandish Watch. As I entered the little town, I came upon two of the fishermen's wives interchanging that last word, which never was the last and it occurred to me as an experiment with the magic watch to wait until the little scene was over and then to encore it well good night to ye and you winna forget to send us word when your martha writes nay i winna forget and if she isn't suited she can but come back good night to ye a casual observer might have thought and there ends the dialogue that casual observer would have been mistaken Ah, she'll like em. I warn ye. They'll not treat her bad. You may depend. They're very canny folk. Good night. Aye, they are that. Good night. And at last they parted. I waited till they were some twenty yards apart, and then put the watch a minute back. The instantaneous change was startling. The two figures seemed to flash back into their former places. Isn't suited. She can but come back. Good night to ye. One of them was saying, and so the whole dialogue was repeated. 
and when they had parted for the second time i let them go their several ways and strolled on through the town but the real usefulness of this magic power i thought would be to undo some harm some painful event some accident i had not long to wait for an opportunity of testing this property also of the magic watch for even as the thought passed through my mind the accident i was imagining occurred a light cart was standing at the door of the great millinery depot of elveston laden with cardboard packing cases which the driver was carrying into the shop one by one one of the cases had fallen into the street but it scarcely seemed worth while to step forward and pick it up as the man would be back again in a moment yet in that moment a young man riding a bicycle came sharp round the corner of the street and in trying to avoid running over the box upset his machine and was thrown headlong against the wheel of the spring cart the driver ran out to his assistance and he and i together raised the unfortunate cyclist and carried him into the shop his head was cut and bleeding and one knee seemed to be badly injured and it was speedily settled that he had better be conveyed at once to the only surgery in the place i helped them in emptying the cart and placing in it some pillows for the wounded man to rest on and it was only when the driver had mounted to his place and was starting for the surgery that i bethought me of the strange power i possessed of undoing all this harm now is my time i said to myself as i moved back the hand of the watch and saw almost without surprise this time all things restored to the places they had occupied at the critical moment when i had first noticed the fallen packing-case instantly i stepped out into the street picked up the box and replaced it in the cart in the next moment the bicycle had spun round the corner passed the cart without let or hindrance and soon vanished in the distance in a cloud of dust delightful power of magic i thought how much of human suffering i have not only relieved but actually annihilated and in a glow of conscious virtue i stood watching the unloading of the cart still holding the magic watch open in my hand as i was curious to see what would happen when we again reached the exact time at which i had put back the hand the result was one that if only i had considered the thing carefully i might have foreseen as the hand of the watch touched the mark the spring cart which had driven off and was by this time halfway down the street was back again at the door and in the act of starting while oh woe for the golden dream of world-wide benevolence that had dazzled my dreaming fancy the wounded youth was once more reclining on the heap of pillows his pale face set rigidly in the hard lines that told of pain resolutely endured oh mocking magic watch i said to myself as i passed out of the little town and took the seaward road that led to my lodgings the good i fancied i could do is vanished like a dream the evil of this troublesome world is the only abiding reality and now i must record an experience so strange that i think it only fair before beginning to relate it to release my much enduring reader from any obligation he may feel to believe this part of my story i would not have believed it i freely confess if i had not seen it with my own eyes then why should i expect it of my reader who quite possibly has never seen anything of the sort i was passing a pretty little villa which stood rather back from the road in its own grounds with bright flower-beds in front creepers wandering over the walls and hanging in festoons about the bow windows an easy-chair forgotten on the lawn with a newspaper lying near it a small pug-dog couchant before it resolved to guard the treasure even at the sacrifice of life and a front door standing invitingly half open here is my chance i thought for testing the reverse action of the magic watch i pressed the reversal peg and walked in in another house the entrance of a stranger might cause surprise perhaps anger even going so far as to expel the said stranger with violence but here i knew nothing of the sort could happen the ordinary course of events first to think nothing about me then hearing my footsteps to look up and see me and then wonder what business i had there would be reversed by the action of my watch they would first wonder who i was then see me then look down and think no more about me and as to being expelled with violence that event would necessarily come first in this case 
So, if I can once get in, I said to myself, all risk of expulsion would be over. The pug-dog sat up as a precautionary measure as I passed, but as I took no notice of the treasure he was guarding, he let me go by without even one remonstrant bark. He that takes my life, he seemed to be saying wheezily to himself, takes trash, but he that takes the daily telegraph. But this awful contingency I did not face. The party in the drawing-room, I had walked straight in, you understand, without ringing the bell or giving any notice of my approach, consisted of four laughing rosy children, of ages from about fourteen down to ten, who were apparently all coming towards the door. I found they were really walking backwards, while their mother, seated by the fire with some needlework on her lap, was saying, just as I entered the room, Now, girls, you may get your things on for a walk. To my utter astonishment, for I was not yet accustomed to the action of the watch, all smiles ceased, as Browning says, on the four pretty faces, and they all got out pieces of needlework and sat down. No one noticed me in the least, as I quietly took a chair and sat down to watch them. When the needlework had been unfolded, and they were all ready to begin, their mother said, "'Come, that's done at last. You may fold up your work, girls.' But the children took no notice whatever of the remark. On the contrary, they set to work at once sewing. If that is the proper word to describe an operation such as I had never before witnessed. Each of them threaded her needle with a short end of thread attached to the work, which was instantly pulled by an invisible force through the stuff dragging the needle after it. The nimble fingers of the little seamstresses caught it at the other side, but only to loose it again the next moment. And so the work went on, steadily undoing itself, and the neatly stitched little dresses, or whatever they were, steadily falling to pieces. Now and then one of the children would pause, as the recovered thread became inconveniently long, wind it on a bobbin, and start again with another short end. At last all the work was picked to pieces and put away, and the lady led the way into the next room, walking backwards and making the insane remark, Not yet, dear. We must get to sewing done first after which I was not surprised to see the children skipping backwards after her, exclaiming, "'Oh, mother, it is such a lovely day for a walk!' In the dining-room the table had only dirty plates and empty dishes on it. However, the party, with the addition of a gentleman as good-natured and as rosy as the children, seated themselves at it very contentedly. You have seen people eating cherry tart, and every now and then cautiously conveying a cherry-stone from their lips to their plates— well, something like that went on all through this ghastly, or shall we say ghostly, banquet. An empty fork is raised to the lips. There it receives a neatly cut piece of mutton and swiftly conveys it to the plate, where it instantly attaches itself to the mutton already there. Soon one of the plates, furnished with a complete slice of mutton and two potatoes, was handed up to the presiding gentleman, who quietly replaced the slice on the joint and the potatoes in the dish. Their conversation was, if possible, more bewildering than their mode of dining. It began by the youngest girl suddenly, and without provocation, addressing her elder sister. "'Oh, you wicked storyteller!' she said. I expected a sharp reply from the sister, but instead of this she turned laughingly to her father and said in a very loud stage whisper, "'To be a bride!' The father, in order to do his part in a conversation that seemed only fit for lunatics, replied, "'Whisper it to me, dear.' But she didn't whisper. These children never did anything they were told. She said quite loud, "'Of course not. Everybody knows what Dotty wants.' And little Dotty shrugged her shoulders and said with a pretty pettishness, "'Now, father, you're not to tease. You know I don't want to be bridesmaid to anybody.' "'And Dolly's to be the fourth. was her father's idiotic reply. Here, number three put in her oar. "'Oh, it is settled, mother dear, really and truly.' Mary told us all about it. It's to be next Tuesday, four weeks, and three of her cousins are coming to be bridesmaid, and she doesn't forget it, Minnie. The mother laughingly replied, I do wish they get it settled. I don't like long engagements. And Minnie wound up the conversation, if so chaotic a series of remarks deserves the name, with, Only think, we passed the cedars this morning just exactly as mary davenant was standing at the gate wishing good-bye to mr uh, i forgot his name of course we looked at the other way 
By this time I was so hopelessly confused that I gave up listening and followed the dinner down into the kitchen. But to you, O oh hypercritical reader, resolute to believe no item of this weird adventure, what need to tell how the mutton was placed on the spit and slowly unroasted, how the potatoes were wrapped in their skins and handed over to the gardener to be buried, how, when the mutton had at length attained to rawness, the fire which had gradually changed from red heat to a mere blaze died down so suddenly that the cook had only just time to catch its last flicker on the end of a match, or how the maid, having taken the mutton off the spit, carried it, backwards, of course, out of the house to meet the butcher who was coming, also backwards, down the road. The longer I thought over this strange adventure, the more hopelessly tangled the mystery became, and it was a real relief to meet Arthur in the road and to get him to go with me up to the hall to learn what news the telegraph had brought. I told him as we went along what had happened at the station, but as to my further adventures I thought it best for the present to say nothing. The Earl was sitting alone when we entered. "'I am glad you are coming to keep me company,' he said. "'Muriel is gone to bed. The excitement of that terrible scene was too much for her.' and eric has gone to the hotel to pack his things to start for london by the early train then the telegram has come i said did you not hear oh i had forgotten it came in after you left the station yes it's all right eric has got his commission and now that he has arranged matters with muriel he has business in town that must be seen to at once what arrangement do you mean i asked with a sinking heart as the thought of Arthur's crushed hopes came to my mind. Do you mean that they are engaged? They have been engaged, in a sense, for two years. The old man gently replied. That is, he has had my promise to consent to it, so soon as he could secure a permanent and settled line in life. I could never be happy with my child married to a man without an object to live for, without even an object to die for. I hope they will be happy, a strange voice said. The speaker was evidently in the room, but I had not heard the door open, and I looked round in some astonishment. The earl seemed to share my surprise. Who spoke? he exclaimed. It was I, said Arthur, looking at us with a worn, haggard face and eyes from which the light of life seemed suddenly to have faded. And let me wish you joy also, dear friend he added, looking sadly at the earl, and speaking in the same hollow tones that had startled us so much. Thank you, the old man said simply and heartily. A silence followed. Then I rose, feeling sure that Arthur would wish to be alone, and bade our gentle host good night. Arthur took his hand, but said nothing, nor did he speak again as we went home till we were in the house and had lit our bedroom candles, then he said more to himself than to me. The heart knoweth its own bitterness. I never understood those words till now. The next few days passed wearily enough. I felt no inclination to call by myself at the hall, still less to propose that Arthur should go with me. It seemed better to wait till time, that gentle healer of our bitterest sorrows, should have helped him to recover from the first shock of the disappointment that had blighted his life. Business, however, soon demanded my presence in town, and I had to announce to Arthur that I must leave him for a while. But I hope to run down again in a month, I added. I would stay now if I could. I don't think it's good for you to be alone. No, I can't face solitude here for long, said Arthur. But don't think about me. I have made up my mind to accept a post in India that has been offered me. Out there I suppose I shall find something to live for. I can't see anything at present. This life of mine I guard as God's high gift from scathe and wrong, not greatly care to lose. Yes, I said. Your namesake bore as heavy a blow and lived through it. A far heavier one than mine, said Arthur. The woman he loved proved false. There is no such cloud as that on my memory of... of... He left the name unuttered and went on hurriedly. But you will return, will you not? Yes, I shall come back for a short time. Do, said Arthur. And you shall write and tell me of our friends. I'll send you my address when I'm settled down. End of chapter 23
Chapter Twenty Four of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty Four, The Frog's Birthday Treat. And so it came to pass that just a week after the day when my fairy friends first appeared as children, I found myself taking a farewell stroll through the wood in hope of meeting them once more. I had but to stretch myself on the smooth turf, and the eerie feeling was on me in a moment. "'Put your ear really low down,' said Bruno. "'And I'll tell you a secret. It's the frog's birthday treat, and we've lost the baby.' "'What baby?' I said, quite bewildered by this complicated piece of news. "'The Queen's baby, of course,' said Bruno. "'Titania's baby, and we's welly sorry. Sylvie, she's oh so sorry.' "'How sorry is she?' I asked mischievously. Three quarters of a yard,' Bruno replied with perfect solemnity. "'And I'm a little sorry, too,' he added, shutting his eyes so as not to see that he was smiling. And what are you doing about the baby? Well, the soldiers are all looking for it, up and down everywhere. The soldiers? I exclaimed. Yes, of course, said Bruno. When there's no fighting to be done, the soldiers do any little odd jobs, you know. I was amused at the idea of its being a little odd job to find the royal baby. But how did you come to lose it? I asked. We put it in a flower. Sylvie, who had just joined us, explained, with her eyes full of tears. Only we can't remember which. She says us put it in a flower, Bruno interrupted. Cause she doesn't want I to get punished. But it were really me what put it there. Sylvie were picking dindledums. You shouldn't say us put it in a flower, Sylvie very gravely remarked. Well, hush then, said Bruno. I can never remember those horrid H's. Let me help you look for it, I said. So Sylvie and I made a voyage of discovery among all the flowers, but there was no baby to be seen. What's become of Bruno, I said, when we had completed our tour. He's down in the ditch there, said Sylvie. Amusing a young frog. And I went down on my hands and knees to look for him, for I felt very curious to know how young frogs ought to be amused, after a minute's search, I found him sitting at the edge of the ditch by the side of the little frog and looking rather disconsolate. How are you getting on, Bruno? I said, nodding to him as he looked up. Can't amuse it no more, Bruno answered very dolefully. Cause it won't say what it would like to do next. I've showed it all the duckweeds and a live caddiswim, but it won't say nothing. What will oo like? He shouted into the ear of the frog, but the little creature sat quite still and took no notice of him. It's deaf, I think, Bruno said, turning away with a sigh. And it's time to get the theatre ready. Who are the audience to be? Only but frogs, said Bruno. But they haven't come yet. They want to be drove up like sheep. Would it save time, I suggested. If I were to walk round with Sylvie to drive up the frogs while you get the theatre ready? That are a good plan, cried Bruno. But where are Sylvie? I'm here, said Sylvie, peeping over the edge of the bank. I was just watching two frogs that were having a race. Which won it? Bruno eagerly inquired. Sylvie was puzzled. He does ask such hard questions, she confided to me. And what's to happen in the theatre, I asked. First they have their birthday feast, Sylvie said. Then Bruno does some bits of Shakespeare, then he tells them a story. I should think the frogs like the feast best, don't they? Well, there's generally very few of them that get any. They will keep their mouths shut so tight, and it's just as well they do, she added. Because Bruno likes to cook it himself, and he cooks very queerly. Now they're all in. Would you just help me to put them with their heads the right way? We soon managed this part of the business, though the frogs kept up a most discontented croaking all the time. "'What are they saying?' I asked Sylvie. "'They're saying, Fork! Fork! It's very silly of them. You're not going to have forks,' she announced with some severity. "'Those that want any feast have just got to open their mouths, and Bruno will put some of it in.' 
at this moment bruno appeared wearing a little white apron to show that he was a cook and carrying a tureen full of very queer-looking soup i watched very carefully as he moved about among the frogs but i could not see that any of them opened their mouths to be fed except one very young one and i'm nearly sure it did it accidentally in yawning however bruno instantly put a large spoonful of soup into its mouth and the poor thing coughed violently for some time so sylvie and i had to share the soup between us and to pretend to enjoy it for it certainly was very queerly cooked i only ventured to take one spoonful of it sylvie summer soup bruno said it was and i must candidly confess that it was not at all nice and i could not feel surprised that so many of the guests had kept their mouths shut up tight what's the soup made of bruno said sylvie who had put a spoonful of it to her lips and was making a wry face over it and bruno's answer was anything but encouraging bits of things the entertainment was to conclude with bits of shakespeare as sylvie expressed it which were all to be done by bruno sylvie being fully engaged in making the frogs keep their heads toward the stage after which bruno was to appear in his real character and tell them a story of his own invention will the story have a moral to it i asked sylvie while bruno was away behind the hedge dressing for the first bit i think so sylvie replied doubtfully there generally is a moral only he puts it in too soon and will he say all the bits of shakespeare no he'll only act them said sylvie he hardly knows any of the words when i see what he's dressed like i have to tell the frogs what character it is they're always in such a hurry to guess don't you hear them all saying what what and so indeed they were it had only sounded like croaking till sylvie explained it but now i could make out the what what quite distinctly but why do they try to guess it before they see it i don't know sylvie said but they always do sometimes they begin guessing weeks and weeks before the day so now when you hear the frogs croaking in a particularly melancholy way you may be sure they're trying to guess bruno's next shakespeare bit isn't that interesting however the chorus of guessing was cut short by bruno who suddenly rushed on from behind the scenes and took a flying leap down among the frogs to rearrange them for the oldest and fattest frog who had never been properly arranged so that he could see the stage and so had no idea what was going on was getting restless and had upset several of the frogs and turned others round with their heads the wrong way and it was no good at all bruno said to do a bit of shakespeare when there was nobody to look at it you see he didn't count me as anybody so he set to work with a stick stirring them up very much as you would stir up tea in a cup till most of them had at least one great stupid eye gazing at the stage you must come and sit among them sylvie he said in despair i've put these two side by side with their noses the same way ever so many times but they do squirrel so so sylvie took her place as mistress of the ceremonies and bruno vanished again behind the scenes to dress for the first bit hamlet was suddenly proclaimed in the clear sweet tones i knew so well the croaking all ceased in a moment and i turned to the stage in some curiosity to see what bruno's ideas were as to the behaviour of shakespeare's greatest character according to this eminent interpreter of the drama hamlet wore a short black cloak which he chiefly used for muffling up his face as if he suffered a good deal from toothache and turned out his toes very much as he walked to be or not to be hamlet remarked in a cheerful tone and then turned head over heels several times his cloak dropping off in the performance i felt a little disappointed bruno's conception of the part seemed so wanting in dignity won't he say any more of the speech i whispered to sylvie i think not sylvie whispered in reply he generally turns head over heels when he doesn't know any more words bruno had meanwhile settled the question by disappearing from the stage and the frogs instantly began inquiring the name of the next character you'll know directly cried sylvie as she adjusted two or three young frogs that had struggled round with their backs to the stage macbeth she added as bruno reappeared macbeth had something twisted round him that went over one shoulder and under the other arm 
and was meant, I believe, for a Scotch plaid. He had a thorn in his hand which he held out at arm's length, as if he were a little afraid of it. "'Is this a dagger?' Macbeth inquired in a puzzled sort of tone, and instantly a chorus of thorn, thorn. arose from the frogs. I had quite learned to understand their croaking by this time. "'It's a dagger!' Sylvie proclaimed in a peremptory tone. "'Hold your tongues!' And the croaking ceased at once. Shakespeare has not told us, so far as I know, that Macbeth had any such eccentric habit as turning head over heels in private life, but Bruno evidently considered it quite an essential part of the character, and left the stage in a series of somersaults. However, he was back again in a few moments, having tucked under his chin the end of a tuft of wool, probably left on the thorn by a wandering sheep, which made a magnificent beard that reached nearly down to his feet. Shylock! Sylvie proclaimed. No, I beg your pardon. She hastily corrected herself. King Lear! I hadn't noticed the crown. Bruno had very cleverly provided one which fitted him exactly, by cutting out the centre of a dandelion to make room for his head. King Lear folded his arms, to the imminent peril of his beard, and said in a mild explanatory tone, "'Aye, every inch a king,' and then paused, as if to consider how this could best be proved, and here, with all possible deference to Bruno as a Shakespearean critic, I must express my opinion that the poet did not mean his three great tragic heroes to be so strangely alike in their personal habits, nor do I believe that he would have accepted the faculty of turning head over heels as any proof at all of royal descent. Yet it appeared that King Lear, after deep meditation, could think of no other argument by which to prove his kingship, and as this was the last of the bits of Shakespeare, We never do more than three, Sylvie explained in a whisper. Bruno gave the audience quite a long series of somersaults before he finally retired, leaving the enraptured frogs all crying out, more, more. which I suppose was their way of encoring a performance. But Bruno wouldn't appear again till the proper time came for telling the story. When he appeared at last in his real character, I noticed a remarkable change in his behavior. He tried no more somersaults. It was clearly his opinion that, however suitable the habit of turning head over heels might be to such petty individuals as Hamlet and King Lear, it would never do for Bruno to sacrifice his dignity to such an extent. But it was equally clear that he did not feel entirely at his ease, standing all alone on the stage with no costume to disguise him, and though he began several times, There were a mouse! He kept glancing up and down and on all sides, as if in search of more comfortable quarters from which to tell the story. Standing on one side of the stage, and partly overshadowing it, was a tall foxglove which seemed, as the evening breeze gently swayed it hither and thither, to offer exactly the sort of accommodation that the orator desired. Having once decided on his quarters, it needed only a second or two for him to run up the stem like a tiny squirrel, and to seat himself astride on the topmost bend, where the fairy bells clustered most closely, and from whence he could look down on his audience from such a height that all shyness vanished, and he began his story merrily. Once there were a mouse, and a crocodile, and a man, and a goat, and a lion. I had never heard the dramatis persona tumbled into a story with such profusion and in such reckless haste, and it fairly took my breath away. Even Sylvie gave a little gasp, and allowed three of the frogs, who seemed to be getting tired of the entertainment, to hop away into the ditch without attempting to stop them. And the mouse found the shoe, and it thought it were a mouse trap, so it got right in, and it stayed in ever so long. What did it stay in? said Sylvie. Her function seemed to be much the same as that of the chorus in a Greek play. She had to encourage the orator and draw him out by a series of intelligent questions. "'Cause it thought it couldn't get out again,' Bruno explained. "'It were a clever mouse. It knew it couldn't get out of traps. But why did it go in at all?' said Sylvie. "'And it jump, and it jump,' Bruno proceeded, ignoring this question. And at last it got right out again, and it looked at the mark in the shoe, and the man's name were in it, so it knew it wasn't its own shoe. Had it thought it was? said Sylvie. Why, didn't I tell you it thought it were a mousetrap? the indignant orator replied. Please, Mr. Sir, 
We'll make Sylvia attend. Sylvie was silenced, and all was attention. In fact, she and I were most of the audience now, as the frogs kept hopping away, and there were very few of them left. So the mouse gave the man his shoe, and the man were really glad because he hadn't got but one shoe, and he were hopping to get the other. Here I ventured on a question. Do you mean hopping or hoping? Both, said Bruno. And the man took the goat out of the sack. We haven't heard of the sack before, I said. Nor you won't hear of it again, said Bruno. And he said to the goat, Who will walk about here till I comes back? And he went and he tumbled into a deep hole. And the goat walked round and round. And it walked under the tree. And it wog its tail. And it looked up in the tree. And it sang a sad little song. Who never heard such a sad little song? Can you sing it, Bruno? I asked. Yes, I can, Bruno readily replied. And I said, it would make Sylvie cry. It wouldn't, Sylvie interrupted in great indignation. And I don't believe the goat sang it at all. It did, though, said Bruno. It singed it right through. I saw it singing with its long beard. It couldn't sing with its beard, I said, hoping to puzzle the little fellow. A beard isn't a voice. Well, then, who couldn't walk with Sylvie? Bruno cried triumphantly. Sylvie is in a foot. I thought I had better follow Sylvie's example and be silent for a while. Bruno was too sharp for us. And when it had singed all the song, it ran away. For to get along to look for the man, you know, and the crocodile got along after it. For to bite it, you know, and the mouse got along after the crocodile. Wasn't the crocodile running? Sylvie inquired. She appealed to me. Crocodiles do run, don't they? I suggested crawling as the proper word. He wasn't running, said Bruno. And he wasn't crawling. He went struggling along like a portmanteau, and he held his chin ever so high in the air. What did he do that for? said Sylvie. Cause he hadn't got a toothache, said Bruno. Can't you make out nothing without our explain it? Why, if he had a toothache, of course he'd have held his head down, like this. And he'd have put a lot of warm blankets round it. If he hadn't any blankets, Sylvie argued. Of course he had blankets, retorted her brother. Do you think crocodiles goes walks without blankets? And he frowned with his eyebrows, and the goat was really frightened at his eyebrows. I'd never be afraid of eyebrows, exclaimed Sylvie. I should think you would. Though, if they'd got a crocodile fastened to them, like these had, and so the man jump and he jump, and at last he got right out of the hole. Sylvie gave another little gasp. This rapid dodging about among the characters of the story had taken away her breath. And he run away for to look for the goat, you know, and he heard the lion grunting. Lions don't grunt, said Sylvie. This one did, said Bruno. And its mouth were like a large cupboard, and it had plenty of room in its mouth. And the lion run after the man for to eat him, you know, and the mouse run after the lion. But the mouse was running after the crocodile, I said. He couldn't run after both. Bruno sighed over the density of his audience, but explained very patiently. He did run after both, cause they went the same way. And first he caught the crocodile, and then he didn't catch the lion. And when he'd caught the crocodile, what do you think he did? Cause he'd got pincers in his pocket. I can't guess," said Sylvie. Nobody couldn't guess it. Bruno cried in high glee. Why he wrenched out that crocodile's tooth? Which tooth? I ventured to ask, but Bruno was not to be puzzled. The tooth he were going to bite the goat with, of course. He couldn't be sure about that. I argued. Unless he wrenched out all its teeth, Bruno laughed merrily and half sang as he swung himself backwards and forwards. He did wrench out all its teeth. Why did the crocodile wait to have them wrenched out? Said Sylvie. It had to wait. Said Bruno. I ventured on another question, but what became of the man who said, "You may wait here till I come back"? He didn't say "Who may?" Bruno explained. He said, "Who will?" Just like Sylvie says to me, "Who will do or lessons till twelve o'clock?" Oh, I wish," he added with a little sigh. "I wish Sylvie would say, 'Who may do or lessons?'" This was a dangerous subject for discussion. Sylvie seemed to think. 
She returned to the story. But what became of the man? Well, the lion springed at him, but it came so slow, it were three weeks in the air. Did the man wait for it all that time? I said. Of course he didn't, Bruno replied, gliding head first down the stem of the foxglove, for the story was evidently close to its end. He sold his house and he packed up his things while the lion were coming, and he went and he lived in another town. So the lion ate the wrong man. This was evidently the moral, so Sylvie made her final proclamation to the frogs. The story's finished, and whatever is to be learned from it, she added aside to me, I'm sure I don't know. I did not feel quite clear about it myself, so made no suggestion, but the frog seemed quite content, moral or no moral, and merely raised a husky chorus of, 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 as they hopped away. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty five Looking Eastward. It's just a week, I said three days later to Arthur, since we heard of Lady Muriel's engagement. I think I ought to call at any rate and offer my congratulations. "'Won't you come with me?' A pained expression passed over his face. "'When must you leave us?' he asked. "'By the first train on Monday.' "'Well, yes, I will come with you. It would seem strange and unfriendly if I didn't. But this is only Friday. Give me till Sunday afternoon. I shall be stronger then.' Shading his eyes with one hand, as if half ashamed of the tears that were coursing down his cheeks, he held out the other to me. It trembled as I clasped it. I tried to frame some words of sympathy, but they seemed poor and cold, and I left them unspoken. Good night, was all I said. Good night, dear friend, he replied. There was a manly vigor in his tone that convinced me he was wrestling with and triumphing over the great sorrow that had so nearly wrecked his life, and that, on the stepping-stone of his dead self, he would surely rise to higher things. There was no chance, I was glad to think, as we set out on Sunday afternoon, of meeting Eric at the hall, as he had returned to town the day after his engagement was announced. His presence might have disturbed the calm, the almost unnatural calm, with which Arthur met the woman who had won his heart, and murmured the few graceful words of sympathy that the occasion demanded. Lady Muriel was perfectly radiant with happiness— Sadness could not live in the light of such a smile, and even Arthur brightened under it, and when she remarked, "'You see, I'm watering my flowers, though it is the Sabbath day,' his voice had almost its old ring of cheerfulness, as he replied, "'Even on the Sabbath day works of mercy are allowed, but this isn't the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day has ceased to exist.' "'I know it's not Saturday,' Lady Muriel replied. "'But isn't Sunday often called the Christian Sabbath. It is so called, I think, in recognition of the spirit of the Jewish institution, that one day in seven should be a day of rest, but I hold that Christians are freed from the literal observance of the fourth commandment. Then where is our authority for Sunday observance? We have, first, the fact that the seventh day was sanctified when God rested from the work of creation. That is binding on us as theists. Secondly, we have the fact that the Lord's Day is a Christian institution. That is binding on us as Christians. And your practical rules would be? First, as theists, to keep it holy in some special way, and to make it, so far as is reasonably possible, a day of rest. Secondly, as Christians, to attend public worship. And what of amusements? I would say of them, as of all kinds of work. Whatever is innocent on a weekday is innocent on Sunday, provided it does not interfere with the duties of the day. Then you would allow children to play on Sunday? Certainly I should. Why make the day irksome to their restless natures? I have a letter somewhere, said Lady Muriel, from an old friend, describing the way in which Sunday was kept in her younger days. I will fetch it for you. I had a similar description, viva voce, years ago, Arthur said when she had left us. From a little girl. It was really touching to hear the melancholy tone in which she said, 
On Sunday I mustn't play with my doll. On Sunday I mustn't run on the sands. On Sunday I mustn't dig in the garden. Poor child. She has indeed abundant cause for hating Sunday. Here is the letter, said Lady Muriel, returning. Let me read you a piece of it. When, as a child, I first opened my eyes on a Sunday morning, a feeling of dismal anticipation, which began at least on the Friday, culminated. I knew it was before me, and my wish, if not my word, was, would God it were evening. It was no day of rest, but a day of texts, of catechisms, walks, of tracts about converted swearers, godly charwomen, and edifying deaths of sinners saved. Up with the lark, hymns and portions of scripture had to be learned by heart till eight o'clock, when there were family prayers. Then breakfast, which I was never able to enjoy. Partly from the fast already undergone, and partly from the outlook I dreaded. At nine came Sunday school, and it made me indignant to be put into the class with the village children, as well as alarmed lest, by some mistake of mine, I should be put below them. The church service was a veritable wilderness of zin. I wandered in it, pitching the tabernacle of my thoughts on the lining of the square family pew, the fidgets of my small brothers, and the horror of knowing that, on the Monday, I should have to write out, from memory, jottings of the rambling, disconnected, extempore sermon, which might have had any text but its own, and to stand or fall by the result. This was followed by a cold dinner at one. Servants to have no work. Sunday school again from two to four, and evening service at six. The intervals were perhaps the greatest trial of all, from the efforts I had to make to be less than usually sinful, by reading books and sermons as barren as the Dead Sea. There was but one rosy spot in the distance all that day, and that was bedtime, which never could come too early. Such teaching was well meant, no doubt, said Arthur but it must have driven many of its victims into deserting the church services altogether. I'm afraid I was a deserter this morning, she gravely said. I had to write to Eric. Would you, would you mind my telling you something he said about prayer? It had never struck me in that light before. In what light? said Arthur. Why, that all nature goes by fixed, regular laws. Science has proved that so that asking God to do anything, except, of course, praying for spiritual blessings, is to expect a miracle, and we've no right to do that. I've not put it as well as he did, but that was the outcome of it, and it has confused me. Please tell me what you can say in answer to it. I don't propose to discuss Captain Linden's difficulties, Arthur gravely replied, especially as he is not present, but... If it is your difficulty, his voice unconsciously took a tenderer tone, then I will speak. It is my difficulty, she said anxiously. Then I will begin by asking, why did you accept spiritual blessings? Is not your mind a part of nature? Yes, but free will comes in there. I can choose this or that, and God can influence my choice. Then you are not a fatalist? Oh, no! she earnestly exclaimed. Thank God! Arthur said to himself, but in so low a whisper that only I heard it. You grant then that I can, by an act of free choice, move this cup. Suiting the action to the word. This way or that way? Yes, I grant it. Well, let us see how far the result is produced by fixed laws. The cup moves because certain mechanical forces are impressed on it by my hand. My hand moves because certain forces, electric, magnetic, or whatever nerve force may prove to be, are impressed on it by my brain. This nerve force, stored in the brain, would probably be traceable, if science were complete, to chemical forces supplied to the brain by the blood, and ultimately derived from the food I eat and the air I breathe. But would not that be fatalism? Where would free will come in? 
In choice of nerves, replied Arthur, the nerve force in the brain may flow just as naturally down one nerve as down another. We need something more than a fixed law of nature to settle which nerve shall carry it. That something is free will. Her eyes sparkled. I see what you mean, she exclaimed. Human free will is an exception to the system of fixed law. Eric said something like that. And when I think he pointed out that God can only influence nature by influencing human wills, so that we might reasonably pray, give us this day our daily bread, because many of the causes that produce bread are under man's control. But to pray for rain or fine weather would be as unreasonable as... She checked herself as if fearful of saying something irreverent. In a hushed, low tone that trembled with emotion and with the solemnity of one in the presence of death, Arthur slowly replied, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Shall we, the swarm that in the noontide beam were born, feeling in ourselves the power to direct, this way or that, the forces of nature, of nature of which we form so trivial a part, shall we, in our boundless arrogance, in our pitiful conceit, deny that power to the Ancient of Days, saying to our Creator, Thus far and no further, Thou madest, but Thou canst not rule. Lady Muriel had covered her face in her hands, and did not look up. She only murmured, Thanks, thanks, again and again. We rose to go, Arthur said with evident effort. One word more. If you would know the power of prayer in anything and everything that man can need, try it. Ask, and it shall be given you. I have tried it. I know that God answers prayer. Our walk home was a silent one, till we had nearly reached the lodgings. Then Arthur murmured, and it was almost an echo of my own thoughts. What knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? The subject was not touched on again. We sat on, talking, while hour after hour of this our last night together glided away unnoticed. He had much to tell me about India, and the new life he was going to, and the work he hoped to do, and his great generous soul seemed so filled with noble ambition as to have no space left for any vain regret or selfish repining. Come, it is nearly morning, Arthur said at last, rising and leading the way upstairs. The sun will be rising in a few minutes, and though I have basely defrauded you of your last chance of a night's rest here, I'm sure you'll forgive me, for I couldn't really bring myself to say good night sooner. God knows whether you'll ever see me again, or hear of me. Hear of you? I am certain I shall, I warmly responded, and quoted the concluding lines of that strange poem, wearing, O oh, never a star was lost here, but it rose afar. Look east, where whole new thousands are, in Vishnu land, what avatar? Aye, look eastward. Arthur eagerly replied, pausing at the staircase window, which commanded a fine view of the sea and the eastward horizon. The West is a fitting tomb for all the sorrow and the sighing, all the errors and the follies of the past, for all its withered hopes and all its bedded loves. From the East comes new strength, new ambition, new hope, new life, new love. Look eastward. Aye, look eastward. His last words were still ringing in my ears as I entered my room and undrew the window curtains, just in time to see the sun burst in glory from his ocean prison and clothe the world in the light of a new day. So may it be for him and me and all of us, I mused, all that is evil and dead and hopeless fading with the night that is past, all that is good and living and hopeful rising with the dawn of day. Fading with the night, the chilly mists and the noxious vapours and the heavy shadows and the wailing gusts and the owl's melancholy hootings, rising with the day, the darting shafts of light and the wholesome morning breeze and the warmth of a dawning life and the mad music of the lark, look eastward. 
fading with the night the clouds of ignorance and the deadly blight of sin and the silent tears of sorrow and ever rising higher higher with the day the radiant dawn of knowledge and the sweet breath of purity and the throb of a world's ecstasy look eastward fading with the night the memory of a dead love and the withered leaves of a blighted hope and the sickly repinings and moody regrets that numb the best energies of the soul and rising broadening rolling upward like a living flood the manly resolve and the dauntless will and the heavenward gaze of faith the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen look eastward i look eastward end of chapter 25 end of sylvie and bruno by lewis carroll